You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to accident investigation, felony detail. In the early hours of the morning, a woman pedestrian is struck down by a hit-and-run driver. Your job, find him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke king-size Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So, enjoy Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles, travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, September 4th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of traffic division. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Sullivan, Commander AID. My name's Friday. It was 12.45 a.m. when I got to the second floor at 123 South Figueroa Street. Accident investigation. The record bureau. Hi, Wanda. Hi. Sergeant Romero, come back with you. I got a phone message for him. Well, he's over at George's Street. He'll be back in a couple of minutes. You got time to take a 15-7? Sure. I got some additional information on a hit-and-run felony. All right. Pretty warm up here, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Get coffee over there if you want it. No, no thanks. All right, officer's memo. Subject? Investigation of hit-run felony. DR number 467923. Mm-hmm. Location, 7th and Carondelet Streets. It's C-A-R-O-N-D-E-L-E-T. Mm-hmm. September 3rd, 11.15 p.m. Division reporting, AID. Division of occurrence? Central. Hmm? Central. Date and time occurred, September 3rd, 11.15 p.m. Location of occurrence, 7th and Carondelet. Is this going to run long, Sergeant? Oh, page, page and a half. Mm. Go faster in shorthand. I can transcribe it later. All right. Uh, this is for Captain H.W. Sullivan, commanding AID. Mm-hmm. Sir, on the above date at 11.20 p.m., the undersigned officers went to the corner of 7th and Carondelet Streets in response to an ambulance follow-up traffic. Mm-hmm. On our arrival there... You got any matches, Wanda? Yeah, here you are. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, on our arrival there, we were met by 11T... We witnessed ambulance attendants placing an unconscious woman in an ambulance. Uh, She appeared to be critically injured. The victim was removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. All right. We then interviewed a man who identified himself as Chester J. Crawford, 540 Green Oak Drive. He stated that he was acquainted with the injured woman and that her name was Sheila Gordon, Mm G-O-R-D-O-N, 7832 and a half 7th Street. Uh, 
Crawford told us that he was taking her home from a dance. And they arrived at the intersection of 7th and Carondelet Streets at approximately 11.15 p.m. 11.15. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Crawford further stated that uh, while he and Sheila Gordon attempted to cross the intersection, an automobile headed west on 7th Street went through the red traffic light. I... Did you read that last part, Mike? Uh, attempted to cross the intersection, an automobile headed west on 7th Street went through the red yeah, traffic light. Okay. Crawford told us that he jumped out of the path of the car and tried to pull Miss Gordon with him. He said that the car struck her down without slowing down, continued out 7th Street and disappeared. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. And disappeared. Okay. Uh, Crawford stated the hit-and-run car was either a Dodge or a Plymouth, that it could have been either last year's model or this year's. He described the car... Just too fast, boy? That's all right. He described the car as either light blue in color or bluish green. Said that he failed to get the entire license number, but that the last three numbers on the rear plate were either 804 or 304. 804 or 304. That's right. Okay. All right. Uh, Crawford said he made an attempt to follow the hit-run car, but that he was unable to obtain transportation. Mm-hmm. He stated he then ran to a phone at the Corsev Bar and Grill. Spell that. What? Corsev. Oh, C-O-R-S-E-V. Uh, that's at Seventh and Carondelet, mm-hmm. and called the police. And the undersigned officers then obtained Crawford's full name, address, phone number, and proceeded to question residents in the neighborhood, and right. weren't able to locate any other witnesses besides Crawford. Okay. Hi. How'd you do? Oh, so that's about all. Doctor says we won't be able to talk to her for at least a couple of days, maybe not at all. What's your chances? 50-50 if she's heavy on luck. Three broken ribs, brain concussion, internal injury. What Lee Jones have to say? Uh, is that all the report, Sergeant? Oh, yeah, Wanda. We'll have the rest for you a little later. Thank okay. you. Okay. I'll type as much up as I can. Thanks. Sure. Uh, what Lee Jones have to say? Nothing. He and Finkley went over the area for an hour. No broken glass from headlights at the P.I. No tire impressions worth anything. No physical evidence. Where does it leave us? With a half-dead girl and no suspects. What do you think, Joe? I don't know. It's a sour one. Any kickback on the teletype here? No. That guy she was with, Crawford, not too much help. Looked a little nearsighted to me. He saw well enough to get out of the way of that car. You got the notes. Uh, how much to give us? Well, let me see. I got it here in the book. Uh, the car was either a Dodge or a Plymouth, late model. Color, either light blue or blue-green. The last three numbers on the license plate were 804 or 304. It's a big field to pick from. That's the only lead we own. You can call it that, yeah. Well, I guess we better talk to DMV, get the dope on all cars fitting that description that Crawford gave us. It's going to be a hard trip. At least 3,000 cars to track down. Probably closer to four. What do we do for help? We can ask the captain in the morning. I'll get it. Okay. Record Bureau Romero. Yeah, we'll bring him right over. Yeah, bye. Lee Jones again. Yeah. Says he wants the clothes Sheila Gordon was wearing at the time of the accident. He figures when she got hit, her clothes must have left fabric marks on the front of the car. Well, it might work. There's only one trouble. What's that? You can paint off fabric marks. Uh-huh. Well, it's a long list. Let's take it from the top. Yeah. Find the car. Tuesday, September the 5th. We called Mark Benson at DMV and asked for full information on all vehicles fitting the general description of the hit-run car. We went back and talked to the only witness to the hit-and-run, the victim's boyfriend, Chester Crawford. He could add nothing to what he had already told us. There was no response to the local teletype and the all points that were sent out the night before. Garages, auto repair, and paint shops throughout the city were also alerted. Meantime, at General Hospital, the victim, Sheila Gordon, was still close to death. The search for the hit-run car went on. Two days passed. Thursday, September 7th, the information we requested from DMV was being checked out and compiled. Ben and I met with Captain Sullivan. That's the last of them, Skipper. All the cars in this area that fit the general description of the one we're after. You just get it? Yeah. How many cars did they list? 4,620. You more than you expected, eh? Yeah. No chance at all of narrowing it down? None that we can see, no. Terrific order. Well, we tried to figure it from every angle. Now, we can do it two ways. Yeah? We keep the alert on for the hit-run car around the divisions, all the garages in town, the auto repair shops. In other words, we can wait it out. Maybe we'll get the guy, maybe not. Yeah? Or we can check out every one of the cars on this list and the registered owners. Well, the first way isn't going to do the job. We know that. 4,600 cars. How much hope will you need? About 30, 40 men. How long? A couple of weeks, maybe more. All right. I think I can get them from Metro Division. 
When do you want to start? First thing tomorrow. Okay, I'll set it up. All right, Skipper. Thank you. Excuse me, Joe. There's a lady out here to see you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll check you in the morning, Skipper. All right. That's her over there. Thank you. My name's Friday, ma'am. This is Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I'm Dora Lytell, Sergeant. I'm Sheila Gordon's landlady, the girl in the accident. Yes, ma'am. Well, Mr. Crawford, he was the Sheila that night. He told me about you, and he said he thought you might be able to help. How do you mean? Well, it's a long story. You see, when Sheila Gordon first came to live at my rooming house, she was a good girl like the rest. Lately, well, I'm being sick now and all. I don't like to say it. Yeah? Well, frankly, last few months before the accident, Sheila just went bad. Went bad completely. I don't think I follow you, ma'am. Oh, you know, carousing, all kinds of men, visitors, had a different man in her apartment every night. Well, we're investigating a hit-run case, ma'am. Sheila gets out of the hospital. We could talk about her when she's sick like this, but when she's all right, I don't want her back in my rooming house. I'm afraid that's none of our business either, ma'am. But if you could talk to Sheila, persuade her to move from my house, I don't want any wrangle with the rental board again. Couldn't you talk to her? I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do, ma'am. You better talk to her yourself. It'll just be another row like the last time. Shameless woman. I don't want Sheila Gordon back in my house. I'll go to that hospital myself and tell her. She's a pretty sick girl. It's not my fault. Go right over to that hospital and tell her what I think of her. She's hurt pretty bad. So am I. She's hurt me. What's the difference? You haven't been run over by a car. Next morning, Sergeants Reed and McLennan, Ben and myself, joined the 40 men from Metropolitan Division who had started checking out the first of the 4,620 suspected cars. The detail was broken down into teams, and each team was handed a list containing the names of 100 registered car owners. It was a long job and a dull one. Dozens of people weren't at home when we called. We had to rig up a system of checkbacks for each one of these. Some cars had changed hands two and three times. That meant more checking. By the end of the second week, we'd gone through more than half of the 4,600 names on the list. By the end of the fourth week, we had less than 1,000 to go. At the general hospital, the victim, Sheila Gordon, was pronounced out of danger and recovering. We questioned her, but all she could tell us was that she thought the hit-and-run car was a dark color. The search went on. Monday, October 6th, Ben and I spent a 10-hour day checking a list of car owners south of town. It was 6.35 p.m. when we got back to the office. Hi. Hi, Reed. How'd you do today? Fair. Looks like we got one. What do you mean? The guy's name is Ralph Angelo. Yeah, let's see. Uh, 8690 Backerley Road. Checked him out early this morning. First call. What'd you get? One's a late model Plymouth, light blue. License number, there it is, uh, 17 Arthur 2804. Wasn't home, talked to his wife. Yeah? She said the car's been sitting home in the garage for the past month. Husband won't drive it. What's the story? Told her there was something wrong with it. He was going to trade it in. If Len and I tried it, car's in first class shape. What about the front end of the car? Pretty clean. One of the bars in the radiator grill slightly bent. Soft crease on the hood, another one in the right fender. Did you bring the car in? Yeah. Crown and I have been working on it since lunch down the garage. Anything else? I uh, found a gas receipt in the glove compartment dated September 3rd, night of the accident. Where's Angelo now? Santa Barbara, business trip. Due home tonight about 10. Look, Len and I'll pick him up then. See what he's got to say. That sounds good. How many possibilities does that make, Joe? Well, let me see. Out of 3,700 we've checked. About four good ones. I'll get that. Accident investigation, Friday. Hi, Joe. This is Lee Jones. Yeah, Lee. Just finished checking the Plymouth Reed and McLennan brought in. You find anything? Fabric prints on front bumper and the hood. No. Yeah. Indentation of soft object on hood and right front fender. Something else on that fender. What's that? A set of lip impressions. What's it mean? We found the car, only one job left. Yeah. Find a driver. You are listening to Dragnet. The Case History of a Police Investigation, presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of attorney R. Michael Charters, member of the New York Bar, and this is his actual signed statement. Lawyers are always working against time. Long hours mean smoking more, and that's why I prefer extra mild Fatimas. I recommend them to anyone who likes a king-size cigarette. In my opinion, it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And more and more smokers are discovering this every day. Actual figures show Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Fatima yourself. The long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. 
It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Monday, October 6th, 10 p.m. Suspect Ralph Angelo was picked up at his home by investigating officers and brought downtown to the interrogation room. Sergeants Reed and McLennan, Ben and myself questioned him for three hours. At 1.30 a.m., we took Angelo to the county jail where he was booked on suspicion of 501 vehicle code. Hit and run felony. The next morning, we obtained a warrant from the district attorney's office, and later that day, Ralph Angelo was arraigned in Municipal Court Division 7. A date was set for his preliminary hearing in Municipal Court. Sheila Gordon recovered from her injuries and was released from the general hospital. On October 10th, the preliminary hearing was held. Sheila Gordon was on the stand most of the morning. After the noon recess, I was called to testify. Raise your right hand. <coughs> Tell me, swear the testimony about the gift hanging in this case be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. I do. State your name. Joe Friday. Be seated. State your name, please. Joe Friday. Your address? 4656 Collis Avenue. Your occupation? I'm a police officer in and for the city of Los Angeles. Are uh, you one of the investigating officers assigned to this case? I am. Did you have a conversation with the defendant regarding this case? I did. Where? In the traffic division at 123 South Figueroa Street. Who's present? The defendant, Sergeants McLennan, Reed, Romero, and myself. Were the statements made by the defendant free and voluntary? They were. Were there any promise of immunity or reward or the use of force or violence to induce him to make the statement? No, there was not. You tell the court the extent of the conversation at that time. Well, first of all, I asked him if he was the registered owner of a 1948 Plymouth automobile, California license number 17 Arthur 2804. He admitted that he was. And then I asked him if he was driving that car on the night of September 3rd. He said he was, but that he did not drive anywhere near the location of the hit-and-run felony that night at 7th and Carondelet Street. Did the defendant tell you where he drove his car that night? No, sir. You asked the defendant where he drove his car that night of September 3rd? Yes, I did. And what did he answer? Well, he said, it's none of your business. Did you persist in this line of question? Yes, I did. The defendant continued to refuse to give you the information? That's right. Uh, did the defendant state where he was on the night of September 3rd, between 10 p.m. and midnight? He refused to tell us. Did you advise the defendant at that time that his car had been impounded for investigation? That's right. We did. did you advise him that several points of incriminating evidence had been found in the car? Yes, we did. And what did he say in answer? Well, he said, you can't prove a thing. I wasn't near the place. You can't prove a thing. Uh, was that the extent of the conversation between you and the defendant? It was. Thank you, that's all. Counsel for defense? No questions, Your Honor. Uh, Leland Jones, come to stand. <coughs> Raise your right hand. You saw me swear the testimony about your pending in this case be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I'll be I do. State your name. Lee Jones. Please see it. Your occupation? I'm a police officer in and for the city of Los Angeles. What particular detail are you assigned to? I'm a lieutenant in charge of the police crime laboratory. Well, uh, counsel for defense stipulate the witness as a qualified forensic chemist? So stipulated. Mr. Jones, you are the commander in charge of the police department's scientific investigation division, is that correct? Yes, yes. Jones, I will show you a photograph of an automobile. <coughs> California license number 1782804 to be marked People's Exhibit C. Have you ever seen this car before? I have. Where and when did you see it, please? I saw it at the Traffic Division Garage, 123 South Figueroa Street, Monday, October 6th this year. Did you make an examination of this car at that time? I did. What did the examination consist of? And uh, what were your findings? I made a systematic examination of the car using oblique lighting from a 500-watt photo flood lamp and a bell-type reflector. I found the following <coughs> evidence, oh, excuse me. On the um, front bumper of the car, I found fabric marks consisting of 51 threads to the inch. 
I then took a perpendicular photograph of those marks with a copy camera. Here is a photograph of that portion of the bumper containing those marks. Now, I wish this photograph be marked People's Exhibit D for identification. Let it be so You proceed, please, Mr. Jones. What else did you find in your examination of the defendant's car? I found fabric marks on the cowling of the car, extending back under the hood. These marks were made by fabric having a weave of 38 ribs to the inch. I have here a photograph of those marks. Thank you. Now, I ask this photograph to mark People's Exhibit E. So, Mark, what else did you find in your examination of the car, Mr. Jones? I also noted an indentation in the right portion of the car's hood. It had the appearance of having been made by a soft object enclosed in fabric striking the car. Would a human body struck by a car make such an indentation? Yes, it would. Here's a photograph I took of that indentation on the defendant's car. <coughs> I'll ask this photograph of Mark to speak with exhibit M. So, Mark... All right, continue, Mr. Jones. On the top of the right-hand fender of the car, I found a lip imprint in red lipstick. I lifted that print with a piece of cellophane tape, then placed the tape on a plain white card, which I have right here with me. Thank you. As to this card, the mark people exhibit G. It's all marked. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Jones, these pieces of evidence which you found on the defendant's car... Uh, <coughs> Did you compare them with other objects? I did. Will you please state what comparisons you made and your findings? Well, in the first place, I find that the uh, fabric marks in People's Exhibit C, taken from the bumper of the car, has the same count per inch as the stockings worn by the victim, Sheila Gordon. Secondly, I found the fabric marks shown in People's Exhibit D from the cowling hood of the car to be the same count per inch as the coat worn by the defendant. I further made a comparison between the lip imprint found on the right fender, as shown in People's Exhibit G, and various exemplars of the victim's lips. She made the exemplars by placing her lips against heavy, stiff white paper. I have those exemplars with me. Yes, they marked People's Exhibit H. So marked. <laughs> now, may I ask, how did the lip imprint taken from the defendant's car compare with these sample imprints made by the victim's lips? I found that there were 17 points of similarity between the two. These points of similarity consist of various uh, small lines or wrinkles which match identically, as uh, may be seen in the photographs. Hmm. Jones, do you have an opinion as uh, <clears throat> to the origin of the lip imprint on the defendant's car as shown in People's Exhibit uh, G? I do. What is that opinion? It's my opinion that the lip imprint on the defendant's car, as shown in Exhibit G, was made by the lips of the victim, Sheila Gordon. Here we go. Now, Mr. Jones, we recognize, of course, that you're a qualified forensic chemist. But are you going to set yourself up as an expert on women's lips, too? <laughs> well, I've done some research in that department, too. <laughs> Mr. Jones, isn't it possible that any number of lip imprints made by different people would look exactly alike? No, it is not possible. There are no two things in the world exactly alike. There are no two sets of lip imprints alike. Well, anyone who's been around at all would know that. <laughs> That's all, Mr. Jones. Thank you. The Peter's case, Your Honor. Counsel for the defense? We will not offer any defense at this time, Your Honor. It appears to me that a felony has been committed and reasonable cause to believe that the defendant committed it. The defendant will be held to answer in superior court. Tuesday, November 4th, suspect Ralph Angelo was arraigned in Superior Court, Department 88 and the date of his trial was set for December 1st. During the weeks preceding the set of the trial, we worked with Lee Jones in the district attorney's office preparing the case against Ralph Angelo. Two days before the trial opened, we had a visit from one of the men from the DA's office, a process server. All right, Bert. Hi. We got trouble. Yeah? Sheila Gordon's disappeared. Wednesday, December 1st, Ralph Angelo's trial opened and Sheila Gordon was called to the stand. She failed to appear. We checked her few known friends in the city. They couldn't help. She had disappeared from her new address and taken everything with her. 
A bench warrant was issued by Superior Court for Sheila Gordon. The deputy district attorney succeeded in having the court grant a delay in order to find the missing girl, in this case, the complaining witness. Meantime, we got out a local broadcast and an APB. We got missing persons detail to help out in the search. Still no sign. Ralph Angelo's lawyer asked the court for dismissal of the hit-and-run felony case because of Sheila Gordon's failure to appear. On December the 8th, the court ruled on the motion. Regarding the motion by the defense for dismissal of hit-and-run felony charges against Ralph C. Angelo, because of the prosecution's failure to produce the complaining witness to which Sheila R. Gordon... The court feels it would not serve the interests of justice to continue the case. Case is missed. The search for Sheila Gordon went on. Behind us, we had logged three solid months of police work, checking and running down more than 4,000 cars, hours of labor in the crime lab, more hours pounding the pavement, questioning people, checking, rechecking. Without a trial and a conviction, it didn't mean a thing. Three days before Christmas, we received information that the missing girl was living in a small town south of Los Angeles. Ben and I checked the address. What was the apartment number? 7A1. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Again. Yeah? Oh, you two. Come in. Come in. Sit down, make yourself at home. I'm sorry the place is such a mess. A little party earlier tonight. It's messed up. What about the trial? Why didn't she show? Come on, sit down. See, I'll tell you what. I'll freshen up a little, put on some makeup. What about the trial? I didn't have anything against the guy. He didn't mean to run me down. You, uh, you wouldn't happen to have a drink on you, would you? You know better than that. Why didn't you show up at the trial? I told you, I didn't have anything against the guy. What was it, a payoff? Look, why don't we go out and get something, then we can come back and have a party. How much did he give you? Fifty dollars. He was awful nice. You agreed not to show in court. I didn't have anything against the guy, that's all. Better get your coat. Why? That's what the court wants to know. You're taking me in. Why? Is there any law against forgiving? Yeah, when you get paid for it. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 3rd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 88, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, king-size Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima, best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Sheila Gordon was returned to Los Angeles and a new date was set for the trial of Ralph Angelo. Subsequently, he was tried and found guilty as charged. Angelo was also tried, along with Sheila Gordon, for compounding a felony. They were both convicted and received the sentence as prescribed by law. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. The Halls of Ivy is especially pleasant listening tomorrow on NBC. The 
the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Bunko Fugitive Detail. You receive information an escaped criminal is hiding out in your city. He's dangerous. He may be armed. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke king-size Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So, enjoy Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, April 27th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working a night watch out of Bunko Fugitive Detail. My partner is Ben Romero. The boss is Blaine Steed, captain of Bunko Fugitive. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from communications, and it was 6.45 p.m. when I got to room 38. Squad room. Hi. How are you? How about some dinner? Well, we got one to check out first. Here's the teletype. Skipper just brought it in. Thanks. From San Rafael, huh? Pick up and hold for this department, one Alfred Garvey. Wanted for suspicion, forgery, robbery. This man poses as a fingerprint expert from San Rafael Police Department. Here's his mug pulled from the record bureau. Mm-hmm. We're informed Garvey is registered at the Fair Deal Hotel, your city. Where's that? Over near First and Broadway. Yeah. Please advise us on his arrest, and officers will arrive with warrant signed Chief Police Frank Kelly, San Rafael, California. Shouldn't take long to pick him up. All right, we can eat later, I guess. Hi. Hi, Max. What are you doing around? I thought you took off on vacation. I am. Just came back to pick up some stuff from my locker. Off touch? Sure. Uh, listen, the wife's got the car there. Are you guys going anywhere near North Main and Daly? Yeah, but we're going to leave right now. Oh, okay, let me grab my coat. All right. You live out near Highland Park, don't you, man? Yeah. Well, I took the kids shopping in the car this afternoon. Had to get them shoes for our vacation. Kids sure scuff up the toes in a hurry. All right, you all set? Let's go. Where are you going on your vacation? Big Bear. Going to stay the whole three weeks. The in-laws own a cabin up there. They even pay the utilities for us. It's pretty nice. Only one trouble. What's that? They're coming with us. Oh. Where'd you park? In the captain's stall. All right. All right, in the back. Okay. You two still working on that Valley case? No, we washed it up Monday. What's this one? Teletype from San Rafael. I want some guy picked up. Here's a mug shot. Who's Richards going to work with while he's gone, man? I don't know. What's the crowd up ahead? No, oh, yeah. Friner's convention. I forgot they were having a parade tonight. Well, you better stay over to one side. I think we can get through all right. Watch those kids there. Yeah. There we go. That's the place up ahead, isn't it? Mm, fair deal, yeah. We got to stop by this hotel a minute, Max. You want to wait here? I'll come in. Big turnout for the parade, huh? Yeah, it's a big crowd. Fair deal hotel. Look at those rates. 35 cents a day, $2 a week. Yes, sir, can I help you? 
Police officers, would you look at this picture, please? All right. Maybe registered as Alfred Garvey. Garvey sure came in yesterday. The picture makes him look old. Is he in now? Well, let's see. Garvey, room 307. The key's gone. He must be in. Thank you. Yes, sir. Elevator's down there at the end of the hall. Okay. The elevator's in use. Let's take the stairs. I'll wait for you here. I want to see the parade. Okay, man. I've never seen it to fail. It's uh, Stairs. Every time my arch is hurt, we get a thief to check who lives upstairs. Just one more flight. Yeah. Uh, 305, 307. Uh, doors open. Let's have a look. Laws, huh? Yeah, pretty fast checkout. It came from downstairs. The lobby, come on. Yep. Come on, hurry up. Yep. Guys, stop him! Stop that guy, police! The police! It's Max. Max. Max, are you all right? He went out the door, blue suit. It was Garvey. He shot your friend. Call an ambulance. He ran out the door. He shot your friend. Come on, Ben. Call that ambulance, will you? Hey, you. Did you see a man come out of this hotel? Huh? Did you just see a man come out of this hotel? That one? I don't know. Huh? All right, Ben, you go that way. I'll check up this way. Yeah, right. What's the matter? Watch where you're going, huh? Did you see a man running up this way just now about my height, blue suit? Huh? No, I didn't see anybody. Did you see anybody? Hey! Yeah. Hey, boy! Yeah, you want a paper, mister? No, listen. Did you see a, a man running by here a minute ago in a blue suit? Oh, well, maybe. I didn't notice him. You want a paper? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, lady. Ben! Ben, over here! Yeah. Did you spot him? No, we're gonna need help. All right, come on. Help your friend, he's bleeding. I don't know what to do. Ben, get a hold of communications. Get some help out here. All right. If the guy came down in the elevator, it was Garvey, your friend, trying to stop you. Garvey shot him right in the face. All right, stop yelling, huh? He was huh? terrible. Now, look, he's bleeding. You better do something. Will you shut up? Max. Max, how is it? Yeah. Chest hurts. Yeah, all right. Easy, huh? Garvey came out of the elevator fast with a gun. All right, take it easy now. Yo, I got communications there. Blocking off the area. That's fine. Watch that front door, will you? Keep those people out of here. Yeah, yeah. Chest. I'll be here in a minute, boy. Call the wife, Eleanor. Ambulance is here. Yeah. He looks bad. Well, he's not gonna get any worse. Hmm? He's dead. The name on the personnel report said John Warren Maxwell, Sergeant, Los Angeles Police Department, badge number 10377. Nearest living relative, wife, Eleanor Jean Maxwell. Dependents, John Maxwell, Jr., six years. Deborah Lee Maxwell, two years. Death and line of duty, April 27, 7.15 p.m. John Maxwell's body was removed from Georgia Street to the county morgue. At 7.45, a special detail of men from Homicide and Bunko Fugitive were on the scene to aid in the investigation of the killing. The neighborhood where the Fairdale Hotel was located was covered for a half mile around. By 9 o'clock, the parade was over and the area was cleared. We had a single lead to work with. In checking out the different taxi cab stands in the neighborhood, we found out that three separate fares had been picked up within two blocks of the hotel four minutes after the shooting. Ben and I went to the offices of the taxi cab company. The cabs in question were called in and the waybills were checked. The times of the three different trips were listed, and so was the address of each destination. We copied down the addresses and then interviewed the drivers. We're going to give each one of you half a dozen pictures. like to see if you can identify any of them as passengers you picked up tonight near the Fair Deal Hotel. All right, here you go. There you are. Four, five, six. Check them carefully, please. Here, yours right here. Take a good look at each one of them. Huh? Yeah, okay, great. Now, fellas, take your time. Look them all over real good before you make up your mind. No, no, yeah, here's the one, Sergeant. No mistake. Let me see. Where'd you pick up this man? About a block from the hotel. I drove him to a place on 14th Street. Same address on the way, Bill. Ben. Yeah? Alfred Garvey. Ben and I, along with Ricketts and Chandler from Homicide, drove out to the 14th Street address. Another small transient hotel. The clerk on duty identified Garvey from his mugshot. 
He said the suspect had called at the hotel at about 7.45 that night and asked to see one of the guests, uh, Mrs. Lorraine Thomas. The clerk said he told Garvey Mrs. Thomas was out, that she hadn't been there for four days. Ricketts and Chandler went on stakeout in the lobby of the hotel, and Ben and I went up to the second floor to stake out Mrs. Thomas' room. Friday, 11.25 a.m. Lorraine Thomas returned to the hotel and was taken into custody. We took her to homicide and questioned her for more than an hour. She admitted that she was acquainted with Garvey, but that's all. One o'clock. We went to Clifton's cafeteria for lunch. Here, here, take this tray. Thanks. Silverware? Mm-hmm. You were the first one he ran to after the shooting. Well, Garvey doesn't have many friends in Los Angeles. Maybe that's why he looked me up. I'll have the mixed green salad, too. Kind of worked as Garvey do, do you know? He told me he was in the Merchant Marines. Coleslaw. Some of that potato salad, please. Do you know what he does in the Merchant Marine? He told me a steward. French dressing, please. Do you know any of his friends in town? No, I don't. Rye bread. Can I have an extra butter, please? Oh, French roll. What kind do you want, Ben? Now, give me some of those biscuits. Uh, thank you. Does Garvey usually stay at the Fairdeal Hotel when he's in town? I don't know. That split pea soup sure looks good, and We told you that the police up north were looking for him. Yeah, I know you did. Like I told you, I've been out with him a few times. That's all I know about him. He must have introduced you to some of his friends. I'll have the prime ribs there. Rare. That piece, too. How about it? Did you ever meet any of his friends? Yeah, one or two. No, no gravy. Meatloaf. Brown gravy. Remember any of the names of his friends? I just met him, that's all. I don't remember. Let me have a roast turkey. Go kind of heavy on that dressing, will you? Did you ever go out with any of them? No. Why do you think Garvey went to your hotel after the shooting? I don't know. Maybe he figured you'd hide him. I don't know why he should. He killed a man and headed straight for your place. Doesn't make you look too good. I can't help that. I'd like some of those string beans, please. Miss Thomas, you know it's going to go hard on you if you're holding back information on Garvey. I'm not. Why don't you take some of that summer squash, Joe? It's good for you. Well, I can't eat that much. When did you first meet Garvey? About three years ago, up in St. Helena. You might as well keep your nose clean. How do you mean? We're going to reach you, Miss Thomas. You might as well tell us all you know. <laughs> Look, if Garvey's killing people, I don't want to have any more to do with him. We do. Now, where is he? I told you, I don't know. Squash, please. You said you had a little boy, didn't you, Miss Thomas? Do we have to talk about it now? I thought we were going to have lunch. How old's your little boy? He's seven years old. Where is he now? He's in school up in San Francisco. Isn't his line going awful slow? It's lunchtime. You know that cop that Garvey killed last night? Mashed potatoes, country gravy. Did you hear what I said? Yes, I know he killed a cop. He had a little boy, too. There's nothing I can do. No potatoes, thanks. Yeah, there's something you can do, Miss Thomas. You can tell us where Garvey is. If I knew, I'd tell you. French fries, please. You're kidding us, Miss Thomas, but we're not going to kid you. You know a lot more about this than you're telling us. Maybe I do, but I'm scared. Who are you afraid of? Look, why can't you count me out of this? I don't want any part of it. You're in all the way. The only way you're going to get out is to tell us what you know. He'll kill me. Suppose something happens to me, nobody's going to worry about my kid. You don't have to worry. He's not going to find out. Uh, no, no dessert, please. They'll both kill me. Both? Who's the other one? What's the use? Trouble, no matter what you try to do, nothing but trouble. Garvey's working with somebody, is that it? His name's Jack Fleming. Yeah? They made me promise to cover for him. Give him a place to hide out whenever the heat was on. Then you know where they are. No, I don't, and that's the truth. Why do they need a place to hide out? You said Garvey killed a cop. What about Fleming? Hey, Joe, you better move along. Oh, I'm sorry. What about Fleming? We're going to pull some jobs. All right, we can skip the dessert. Come on. I'll take a check for all of them. Let's go. What kind of jobs? Where? Hold up. Tomorrow night. Three Kings Liquor Store out in Wilshire. Let's sit down. They're both the same, Garvey and Fleming. They can't hold a gun without using it. Here's the table. Oh, you dropped your tray. I'll get you some more. Don't bother. I'm not hungry anymore. You 
are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation, presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Lee Silver, general assignment reporter on one of New York's greatest newspapers. This is his actual signed statement. When you have to meet a news deadline, you work at a fast pace, smoke at a fast pace. That's why I smoke Fatima. They're extra mild. In my opinion, it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And more and more smokers are discovering this every day. Actual figures show Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Fatima yourself. The long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Saturday, April 29th. Last rites were held for Sergeant John Maxwell and he was buried at Holy Cross Cemetery. A guard of honor from the police department was present, along with most of the men Maxwell had worked with in Bunko Fugitive Detail. The chief of detectives delivered a short eulogy, and then one of the men from the department band sounded taps over the grave. We got back to the office at noon, checked in at the record bureau. A photocopy room had taken negatives of Garvey's and Fleming's coming out mugs and made duplicates that were distributed to all officers. The stakeouts continued at the Fair Deal in the 14th Street Hotel where Lorraine Thomas was staying. She was put under protective custody. Ben and I, Ricketts and Chandler, went on stakeout at the Three Kings Liquor Store on Wilshire Boulevard. It was a large, modern place, and it did a volume business, especially on Saturday night. Ricketts and Chandler covered the store from the outside. Ben and I were stationed in the supply room at the rear of the place, where we had the main counter and most of the store in full view. We set up a prearranged signal with the clerk on duty, and... If and when Garvey and Fleming showed up, the clerk was to accidentally knock an empty bottle off the counter. We waited until midnight. Nothing happened. It's the first customer in half an hour. It's kind of slow. Yeah. Wait a minute. Here comes another one. No sale. It's a woman. The yeah, clerk sure got the jitters. Well, I'll put in with him. I could go for a hamburger. What didn't you eat dinner? I wasn't very hungry then. Well, I've got an almond bar you want. Yeah, thanks. Wait a minute. Another customer. Yeah, man. Can't see his face too well with that hat on, can you? That's Fleming. Come on. Yeah. Police officers, get your hands up. Watch it, Joe. Oh. You're hitting. He's going out the front. Come on. Ricketts and Chandler stopped him. Yeah, he's down. Watch him. Get the gun. Yeah. Yeah, here, here it is. That's Fleming, all right. Ricketts, call an ambulance. What's the score? Yeah, looks like one in the shoulder and legs, too. What about Garvey? I don't know. What do you think? Fleming stopped all the slugs. Yeah. Let's ask him. The wounded suspect was treated at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and then booked into the prison ward at the General Hospital. At 11 a.m. the next day, we questioned him, but he refused to admit that he even knew Alfred Garvey. We re-questioned Fleming for the next three days with no results. The stakeouts continued. The search went on. There was no response to our APB. Garvey was still at large. As far as we were concerned, there was only one way to get directly to Garvey, and that was through Fleming. We called on Lorraine Thomas again and asked her that if she'd try to get some information on Fleming, try to get him to talk and to tell her where Garvey was. I'm not even sure if he knows where Garvey's hiding. He must have a good idea. Even if he has, he's not going to tell me. He wouldn't trust me that far. He'll go further with you and he will with us. He won't even give us his name. I'm afraid it's up to you, Miss Thomas. Why can't you let me out of this? Hey, look, figure it this way. You knew about Fleming and Garvey. You knew they were in town. You knew what they were up to. You didn't break your back to save that dead cop's life. Garvey shot him. I did You knew he was a killer. You knew he had a gun. What do you want me to do? Get close to Fleming. Visit him every day till he talks. But he doesn't trust me. I told you. Then get him to trust you, will you? Do favors for him. He wants to contact friends to raise money for a lawyer. 
Help him do that. Run errands. Do anything for him within reason. Suppose he finds out about the holdup. That I told you about it. He's got a long stretch ahead of him. He won't bother you. They'll kill me if they find out. They wouldn't wait a minute. They won't find out. All right. Won't be my fault. Al did the shooting. He killed the cop. Let him square it up. He'll square it with the court. There's only one trouble. Yeah. Maxwell's wife and kids. How does Al square it with them? On the morning of May 8th, suspect Jack Fleming was removed from his private room and wheeled down to the x-ray lab on the pretext of treatment. While he was absent, a dictaphone was placed in his room by a sound crew from the crime lab. Fleming was then returned. That afternoon, while Ben and I listened in on earphones in the next room, Lorraine Thomas paid her first visit to Fleming. We had briefed her on how to proceed in getting a suspect to talk, in particular to reveal Garvey's hideout. It was a slow process. For the next 15 days, between the hours of 2 and 4 in the afternoon, Mrs. Thomas visited Fleming while Ben and I monitored their conversation in the adjoining room. For 15 days, despite all her shows of confidence, Fleming refused to confide. He was sullen and close-mouthed. Some afternoons, he would hardly speak to her. On the 16th day, his mood seemed to be improving. Here. Let me fix that pillow for you, Jack. Is that better? Good. Thanks. I, uh, I got in touch with Dave and Johnny like you asked me to. Huh? What'd they say? Well, they said they could get you the money for the lawyer the day after tomorrow. And Dave said he might be over to see you tonight. Yeah, that's fine. Once I get a lawyer, I'll stop worrying. I stopped by Donnelly's place, too. Pop Royce wasn't there, huh? I'm going back tomorrow to see him. He ought to be able to help. You've been okay, Larry. I won't forget it. Oh, it's what friends are for. Jim, sure sorry you had to get it this way. Forget it. I can give it back where it came from. Say, I brought you some new magazines, a couple of candy bars. Well, I put them over here near the bed, will you? Yeah, sure. Let me get them for you. Jack. See, I'll put them right here on this table. I'll bring you some more tomorrow. That's fine. You're going to try and see Pop Royce again tomorrow? Yeah, they told me he'd be in around noon for sure. If I don't see him then, I'll keep trying till I do. Yeah, that's it. Oh, listen. There's something else. Sure, Jack. Come here. Hmm? I don't want to talk loud. The cops might have bunked this room. Yeah. Sorry. A little closer. Okay. Tonight... I want you to go to George's joint, the Blue Moon, down on South Flower. And yeah? And ask for George at the bar. He's usually around from 11 on. Uh-huh. Uh, tell George you've seen me. He'll know it. Then tell him to take you to Al. To take me to Al? Yeah, Al Garvey. George knows the place. Yeah. Okay, Jack. And keep your mouth shut. Don't talk to anybody but George. He knows the place. All right, Jack. We'll help you out. Well... Yeah. It's a long wait. Get paid. Let's go. 10.45 p.m. A detail of three cars followed Lorraine Thomas to the Blue Moon Tavern on South Flower Street. We parked down the block and watched her go in. At 15 minutes past 11, she came out with a small fat man in a dark blue suit. They got in a tan-colored coupe and drove south. The cruiser cars, using three-way radio, tailed the coupe alternately out through the Echo Park area and then back to the starting point at the Blue Moon Tavern. Lorraine Thomas went back into the bar with a man and 20 minutes later came out, caught a taxi and took it to her hotel on 14th Street. We drove back to the office. It was five minutes past 1 a.m. That's it. I get it. Monko Fugitive, Friday. Lorraine Thomas, Sergeant. He showed me the place George did. Where? We drove past it. 1032 Alamo, apartment three. Is Garvey there now? No. George said he's supposed to be there tomorrow in the afternoon, five o'clock. George said I'll have to go alone. Are they watching the place? I think so. Garvey's staying with another man. They got guns. You know where Garvey is now? George wouldn't tell me. We can't afford to tip our hand. How do we know Garvey will be there at five o'clock tomorrow? That's just it. We don't. <laughs> May 9th, 3 p.m. An immediate stakeout was placed at the suspected hideout. 
A detail of 20 plain clothesmen began filtering into the neighborhood in the vicinity of 1032 Alamo Street. The three-story apartment house at that address was checked thoroughly and then covered on all sides. Apartment 3 on the first floor was checked out, too. It was registered to a Thomas King, whom the manager identified as Alfred Garvey from his mugshot. To avoid pedestrian casualties, we toured the immediate vicinity between 3 and 4.30 that afternoon, advising residents and storekeepers to clear the street and stay inside. At 4.35 p.m., the men in the detail took up their assigned positions. We waited. Hold that light, will you, Jim? Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Awful lot of trouble for that punk Garvey. Be more trouble if he doesn't show. No such luck. Hmm? Can coupe coming down the street behind us. Same one we tailed last night. A girl driving. There's two guys with him. Well, Garvey's one of them. They're pulling up. Ready? Now, wait a minute. All right, let's go. Police officers, hold it right there. Al, cops! Get out. Right behind the car. Throw him in, Garvey. You haven't got a chance. Al, break for the house! All right, hold it, Ben. That's it. Both of them. Come on. Both dead. Garvey. The other guy. Mm. Rotten case. Rotten business. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 93, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, king-size Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild, because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> Jack Fleming, the only survivor of the holdup gang, was found guilty of several counts of armed robbery. Garvey's accomplices who aided him in hiding out were tried and convicted of being accessories. They are serving prison terms as prescribed by law. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. The Halls of Ivy is pleasant listening tomorrow on NBC. Here is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. For two months, a depraved criminal has been at work in your city. Men and women have been robbed, brutally attacked. Your job, 
Get them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, March 7th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way home from the office, and it was 2.25 a.m. when I got to Collis Avenue, number 4656. Yeah, Ma. Can I wake you? Well, what time is this? A little after two. Oh, you can't keep this up. You've got to have your rest. Don't worry, I'm okay. You got any cold meat in the icebox? There's some pressed ham, a few slices of bologna. Didn't you have any dinner? A couple of hamburgers and a piece of pie. I got hungry again. Well, I had some nice beef stew for dinner. There's some left in the icebox. I'll come down and warm it for you. No, no, all I want is a sandwich, Ma. You go on back to sleep. Working all hours, first thing you know, you'll be getting sick. You need your food and you need your rest. Nobody cares when you're sick. You didn't have to get up, Ma. All I want is a sandwich. I can fix it. No, you better have a bowl full of stew. Here, don't take a minute to warm it up. Nice new potatoes in it. Some of those onions you like, too. Like Bermudas. Okay, not too much now. I'll get the milk. It's half past two in the morning. What kept you so late again? Another stakeout. It's the same job. Is that the murder in Highland Park? No, Ma, the badge bandit. The one that poses as a policeman. Oh, that one. Yeah. You certainly ought to do something about him. Yeah, well, we're trying to. We can't find him. Now, there was a piece in the paper about it tonight. They say it's just terrible the way he beats up people and robs them. Yeah. Badge bandit. The way he treats women. Ought to be ashamed. They ought to put him away. Well, you got some more rye bread? Mm-hmm. Are you going to have tomorrow off, Joseph? Thanks. No. The captain says we work straight through till we get the guy. Oh. I thought you were going to have tomorrow off. Mm -hmm. well, you ought to tell the captain. You need your rest. You can't go on like this working all hours. You'll be coming down sick one of these days. Mm-hmm. Fifteen robberies, fifteen assaults, all in two months. Somebody's got to stop them. Still ready? Oh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, can't they warn the people? They wouldn't be getting robbed and beaten up if they were parked in those lonely places. Spooning, so silly. Yeah. I'm afraid we can't do anything about that, Ma. It's a public place. They got a right to park if they want. Yeah, I suppose. Well, let me have your plate. Okay, here. Oh, hold it, hold it. That's well, fine. Another spoonful. You can't work if you don't eat. Mmm. Okay. Well, it is good stew. Yeah, sure it is. But you're down at ShopRite's nice. His stewing beef's just wonderful. Mm-hmm, yeah. Ben work late with you? Yeah, his wife's sore, too. He hasn't been home much since we started on this. It's a tough one. Oh, my. Well, times certainly have changed since I was a girl. All this robbing, beating up. Crazy people. Well, any mail today? No, just a couple of bills. Well, you set the alarm. I got to check back in at 8 in the morning. 8 o'clock? Why so early? Badge bandit got two more victims tonight. They were college kids. 
Doctor says he didn't think we should talk to him tonight, so we'll have to see him tomorrow morning uh-huh. at the hospital. Were they badly injured? Well, pretty bad. The boy took a terrible beating. The girl was attacked, same as the oh, others. my. Well, it's very good, Ma. I better get to bed. Yes, well, your face looks so thin. You need all the rest you can get. I'll get it. Now, who can that be? It's almost three in the morning. Hello? This is Lorman down Homicide, Joe. Sorry to bother you. Yeah, Lorman. What is it? Captain wants you and Romero to meet him in Hollywood and Laurel right away. What's the matter now? Attack and hold up in Laurel Canyon 20 minutes ago. Yeah? Got the area blocked off. Figure they got the man trapped. The victims get a look at the guy? Same description, the badge bandit. I left the house, went over and picked up Ben. We drove out to the edge of the Santa Monica Mountains where Hollywood Boulevard ends and Laurel Canyon begins. We headed back into the canyon to the blockaded area. Captain Steed from Homicide was there waiting for us. Hi, Skip. Hi, just a minute. Taylor, call communications again. Have them tell the men out on Ventura to start moving in. Right, Captain. Sorry to call you back. Couldn't be helped. Okay. How's it shaping up? Look, wait a minute. Commander of search detail in vicinity of Laurel Canyon. Unit 62K reports that they are at Mulholland Drive and Oakstone Avenue. Nothing further to report. Okay, no what did you say, Joe? Well, so how's it shaping up? Well, here's a sketch of the area. It covers just about all the Laurel Canyon district. Really? Badge Bandit got his victims near the top of this hill here. Mm-hmm. Old man in the neighborhood heard a woman scream and phoned in. How sure are we the guy didn't get away? Well, the man who called in said the bandit had trouble starting his car. Finally, he left it and took off into the brush. He was headed west down this road here. Captain, mm-hmm. I just had a call from the communications. The crew from Leighton Prince are on the way. All right. Any report from the detail up on Canyon Road? Nothing yet. I'll stand by the radio. Okay. How much area we got to cover? Well, from the mouth of the canyon here, all the way back to Ventura Boulevard. On the west here, from Lookout Mountain Avenue over to Crestview Drive on the east. How much have we got to go on? Crowley talked to the victims for a minute before they took him to Georgia Street. Yeah. The guy's description's the same. Heavy set, blonde hair, chubby face, horn rim glasses. Mm-hmm. Well, if he's on foot, there's plenty of underbrush around here to hide him. Just a minute, I want to get this call in first. Taylor, I have communications contact 72K. Tell them to hold their line stationary. Yeah. We'll have the others close in from the west and the north. Right. You two better get up on Groveland Drive. Line's pretty thin up there, Olsen. We'll use the help. Is that the area where you've been in the car? Yeah. I want you to cover all the houses in that area. Check with everybody you can find in the neighborhood. They may be able to help. If they don't answer, find out why. Okay. I'll be making the rounds in another ten minutes. Check with you then. All right, let's go, oh, Joe. one more thing. Yes, sir? I'll tell you what I told the rest of the men. This guy's in a corner and he's got a gun. There's only one way out for him. Yeah. Make sure it's not you. 3.45 a.m. Ben and I drove up to Groveland Drive and joined the search. We started our house-to-house canvas of the neighborhood where the suspect had abandoned his car. None of the residents had any further information to give us. 4 a.m., we kept on checking. 23 hours. It's a long shift. Yeah. I could use some sleep. Wife of mine is boiling mad. She's even mad at the kid. Yeah? What's the trouble? Oh, aunt of her sent down some flower bulbs from Oregon yesterday. Gladiola bulb. Yeah. Kid was playing with a little girl next door yesterday, and they found a box of flower bulbs. They put the mess of them in a pot of water and boiled them on the stove. What'd they do that for? Who knows? There's another house up ahead. We better check it. Yeah. We ought to get some street lights up here. Yeah. That's nice work waking people up in the middle of the night. Oh, I don't like it any more than they do. Wish we could make them believe that. Hmm, nice neighborhood up here. wonder what the price is on these lots. Well, it shouldn't be too high. They say real estate's coming down. Mm. Yeah, what is it? Police officers. Sorry to disturb you. We'd like to talk to you a minute. Oh, all right. Let me get the door open. What's been going on in the neighborhood tonight? Some kind of trouble? Cars racing up and down the hill? What's the trouble? Have you noticed any strangers in the neighborhood last hour? No, I just got to bed 20 minutes ago. I work out of Paramount. We're shooting nights. What's all the commotion anyway? We're looking for a suspect. He's supposed to be around this area. Well, I haven't seen anybody. I thought I heard somebody out by the garage a few minutes ago. Went out and looked around, but I didn't see anything. Did you check to see if your car is still in the garage? No, I left it in the driveway. No, sir, there's no car in your driveway. Sure there is. Let me show you. Hey, it's gone. Can we use your phone? Yeah. Yeah, but I saw it just a few minutes ago. The the, the car was right there in the driveway. You think that guy took my car? Yes, sir. It's a pretty good bet. 
You got your license number handy there? I don't remember it. I got it on a card in my wallet. Give me communication. Can you give us a description of your car? It's a Plymouth sedan, it's black. Two doors sedan. Minute. with search detail, Laurel Canyon. I got some new information for all units in the detail. Here's the license number. Oh, thank you. Uh, will you broadcast this information to all units in the search detail? What was the make and model of your car? 46 Black Plymouth, a two-door sedan. Uh, 1946 Black Plymouth, two-door sedan, license number... Let me see. Oh, uh, 7 X-ray 2569. This car's just been stolen from 10211 Groveland Drive. Any identifying marks on the car? Well, I left my keys in it. No, no, sir. I mean, any special markings on the car. Maybe a dent in one of the fenders. Well, uh, Yeah, George, hold on. We're getting it. Uh, the right headlight went out on me last night. I haven't had it fixed yet. The right headlight on the car is out. Notify all units in the search detail that we believe suspect is now in possession of this car. Right, thank you. Let's go. It must have happened in the last 15 minutes. I heard that noise and I went out to check. The car was there then. Well, here's our card. We'll be checking with you later. Yeah, I sure hope you find it. I don't know how I can get to work tomorrow without my car. Yeah, we'll notify you. Yeah, gee, I sure hope you find it. Thanks for your help. Come on, Ben. Right headlight is out. Oh, I got it. I believe suspect is now in possession of this car. I don't think he could have gotten that car through the blockade yet, you. Mm. Better start searching the side roads, huh? Yeah. There's one. Leading off to the left, up ahead. Okay, let's try it. Wait a minute. There's a car coming down the hill toward us. Joe is making time. Joe. Only one headlight on the car. It's coming right at us. Turn around, quick. There's no room. Get over to the inside. I can't. It's too late. Then turn. Hang on. We're going over. Attention, all units. Special attention, oh. all units in search oh. detail in the vicinity of Laurel Canyon. Yeah. 80K reports theft ben? of a 1946... You all right? was called, and Ben and I were taken to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. There I received emergency treatment for multiple cuts and bruises and a sprained left shoulder. Ben didn't do so well. He had a possible concussion, two broken ribs, and a half a dozen severe cuts about the face and arms. We were then taken to the P&F ward. The next afternoon, we had a visit from Captain Steed and Chief of Detective Thad Brown. Friday, how you feeling? Oh, pretty good, Chief. I saw Romero across the hall. You came out better than he did. Yeah. That's what I hear. You resting any? Oh, much better. No danger involved. Needs rest, that's about all. How long? Oh, you'll be here two weeks, according to the doctor. What about you? A couple of days. Too bad, Joe. Badge bandit? Yeah. Well, it's like you two got banged up for nothing. Oh? Huh? After he rammed your car, he ditched the black Plymouth, and then we figure he hit with the underbrush. Yeah? Somehow, while we were hauling you and Ben out of that wreck, he slipped through the line. Any fingerprints on the car? No, none we could use. It's rotten luck. I guess it was his night, huh? We're getting more men from Metro Division to help out. Mm -hmm. And we're doubling the number of decoys around the city. Police women, huh? And we'll have each of them planted in a parked car along with an officer in every area of the badge bend that's been working. All he has to do is grab at the bait once. Yeah, if he goes for it. He'll have plenty of time to choose. We work the same setup every night till we reach him. It's a big operation. Might have to run it for weeks unless he quits. Well, there's only one way a guy like that ever quits. Yeah. When we stop him. <laughs> Saturday, March 10th, 2 p.m. I was released from the PNF ward and went home. Ben stayed on at the hospital. He had at least another 10 days to go before release. Sunday, I spent at home. Monday afternoon, I checked back in at the office, and Captain Steed put me on decoy duty for that week, along with policewoman Dorothy River. We were assigned to cover an isolated parking area near Mulholland Drive and Beverly Glen. It was a nice view, but the duty was slow. No sign of the badge band. Policewoman River and I waited it out from late evening to early morning, from Monday through Thursday. Friday night came. Same thing. We waited. How's Ben? You see him today? Yeah, he's doing fine. Be out next week. Grouchy, I guess. Oh, sure. You want a cigarette? Thank you. You can sure tell it's Friday night. Here you are. Mm, thanks. College kids are out in force. Mm-hmm. What time you got? Mm. A quarter to two. Long nights. Yeah, slow. 
You cold? No, are you? Mm, just a little. It's chilly up here in the early morning. What's that? A car full of kids just pulling out. Are the cars gone too? Yeah. We're the only ones left. Ah, stakeout's getting your nerves. So look, if you're cold, you can have my coat. It doesn't bother me. No, no, it's all right, Joe. Thanks. It's a beautiful view from up here, isn't it? All the lights. Yeah. You like to dance, Joe. What? I said, do you like to dance? Oh, once in a while, I guess. I'm not too good. Why? Well, our club's having its big annual dance two weeks from Saturday. Yeah. Might get a kick out of it. It's formal. Well, it leaves me out. I don't own a tux. Well, you could rent one. It'd be fun. No, nah, I'm afraid I don't look good in a tux. I never met a man who thought he did. Why don't you try it? I might be working. Well, I mean, if you're not working, why don't you come? You going? Well, I was planning on it. Got a date? <laughs> no, not yet. I have hopes. There's a car pulling in. Let's see. Yeah, parked over in back of us. I can only make out one person in the car. Yeah, looks like a man. I can't be sure. All right, come on over closer. We might as well look the part, huh? All right. He's getting out of the car. Is he coming this way? Walking over to the side of the road. He's got a flashlight. Looking around. Mm. He's built like the badge bandit. Short, heavy set. Yeah, he's turning around. He's got his flashlight on us. He's coming up on your side of the car. I right, take it easy. You know what to do. Come on, out of that car. Police officer. All right, hold on. Got a gun, Joe. Yeah. Come on, I said out of the car, both of you. All right. All right, drop the gun. Drop it. That's him. Yeah. Now I'll get the cuffs on him. Thanks. I didn't think I hit him that hard. You didn't, I did. Policewoman Dorothy River Knight took the suspect to Hollywood Division where he was booked on suspicion of robbery. He gave his name as Charles Leon Kirby, age 46. Monday, March 19th, Ben was released from the hospital and checked back in for work. A special show-up was held at which 10 of the 17 victims definitely identified Kirby as the badge bandit. The suspect had finally been apprehended. Now we started the slow process of formally charging the man and presenting our evidence against him to bring him to trial. 10 a.m., Ben and I went across the street to the sixth floor of the Hall of Justice to present our case against Kirby and to obtain a formal complaint against him. We met with Deputy District Attorney Broker. When would you get out of the hospital, Ben? This morning. Sure got sick of that place. Heard about your accident. That guy sure gave you enough trouble, didn't he? Yeah, he's still giving us trouble. How's that? He got in a tangle with another prisoner out in the Hollywood Division. Yeah? The other prisoner gave Kirby a pretty bad going over. Cut him up and broke his left forearm. They're moving him in an ambulance from Hollywood to the prison ward at the general hospital. When did this happen? Just this morning. I think they're moving him downtown now. Tough one. Now, how about your reports on Kirby? Are they all in order? Well, here's a summary report. It alleges ten positive identifications containing ten counts for robbery and ten counts of forcible rape. All right. And uh, here are seven other crime reports. Only partial identification on these. Okay. What have you got for corroborating evidence against him? Oh, we went through Kirby's apartment found at least a dozen pieces of property that he took from his victims, mm -hmm. mostly watches and jewelry. The victims identified every piece we found. Okay, let me get the details down here. No. Excuse me a minute. Sure. Broker speaking. Yes, a minute. You, Friday. Thank you. Friday. When? Yeah, right away. Well, that does it. What's the matter? Kirby. He just broke out of that ambulance. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Mr. Richard Watts, Jr., drama critic of one of New York's great newspapers. This is his actual signed statement. My working day starts when most people are going to bed. When the curtain closes on the last act, I've got a newspaper deadline to make. Working more means smoking more. And that's when Fatima quality really tells. I agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And so do more and more smokers every day. 
Actual figures show Extra Mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Extra Mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. As soon as word of Kirby's escape came through, the information was broadcast to all points. All available cruiser cars and men were rushed to the escape area, and a door-to-door canvas got underway. All of the men were given mug shots of Kirby together with his description. 11 a.m., Ben and I got back to the office. We found a message from Captain Steed to meet him in the chief of detectives' office. No man in that area until further notice. Check the bus depots in the Union Station. Right. What's the story, Chief? That's what I'm trying to find out. Where'd he make the break? Near 4th and Main. Couldn't have picked a better spot. The ambulance had just crossed 3rd and Main when Kirby slugged the guard. The driver was too busy dodging traffic to notice what was going on in back. That's a lousy break. Kirby jumped out of the back end of the ambulance and disappeared in the crowd. No sign of him since. Well, that's fine. It takes us almost three months to reach the guy, and he breaks away on a cheap fluke like that. Well, he doesn't have many friends in town. He's only got one we know of. Mm, yeah. A brother. Kirby stays with him pretty often from what we could gather. The brother lives in a rooming house down on Alameda. Anybody checked that yet? We've got it staked out. The brother works at a box factory in the south end of town. That's covered, too. And he's not going far with a broken arm. What have you got? Bone shop pulled up 6th Street. Happened a few minutes ago. Yeah. Here's the description of the holdup, man. Mm. Stocky bill, blonde hair, horn-rimmed glasses, chubby face. You were wrong about that broken arm. Come on. 11.20 a.m. Ben and I pulled up at the East Asia pawn shop on 6th Street. Inside, we found the proprietor, Morris Brubaker, lying propped up against one of the showcases. It was an elderly man, and his face and head showed the marks of a savage beating. His wounds were hemorrhaging badly, and ambulance attendants were giving him first aid. We showed him Charles Kirby's mugshot. That's the man. I wouldn't make a mistake. That's him. Was he alone, Mr. Brubaker? Uh, yes, by himself. He has to look at a watch, and when I turn to get it, he kicks me. I fell against the showcase and cut myself. He pulled me in the back room. I didn't even know him. He kept, he kept beating me. Easy, Mr. Brubaker. Let me get this conference on. How much did he get away with, do you know? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. A blue suit, blue overcoat, wrap around, and, and navy blue, both. He, he kept hitting All me. All right, sir, just take it easy. They'll have you out of here in a minute. He kept hitting me like a crazy man. This is antiseptic. Might sting a little. Okay. What else did he take, Mr. Brubaker? Can you remember? Uh, yes, uh, from the cash register, he, he took money. How much? Thirteen, forty dollars, I can't be sure. When he left your store, did you see which way he was going? No, no, he, he, he dragged me in the back room, he locked me in. Ready to move now, Sergeant? Okay. I don't know, I, 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 saw, I saw him going through the shelves there in the back of the counter, I, I don't know. What'd you keep there? My uh, account books and my gun, a box of shells, too. You want to take a look, Ben? Well, my head. Yes, sir, just take it easy, it's only going to be a minute now. The count books are still there. Yeah. He got the gun. 4 p.m. Kirby, alias the Badge Bandit, was still at large. As far as we were concerned, the case was almost back to where it started from 11 weeks before. The suspect was still loose. He was well armed. He was still free to rob, assault, or murder. We had two big advantages. Kirby's possible broken arm, which would need medical attention, and secondly, the lead to Kirby's brother. At 5.30 p.m., we had a report that the suspect was seen purchasing a ticket at a theater box office out on Hollywood Boulevard. We ran it down. It didn't pay off. At 6.15, a taxi driver thought he spotted Kirby boarding an outbound streetcar at Figaro and Pico. It was checked out. No results. At 7 o'clock, Ben and I got something to eat at a drive-in, and we relieved the men on stakeout at the rooming house on Alameda Street, where Kirby's brother was staying. 10 p.m., midnight. No sign of Kirby. We waited. At 3 a.m., Hanson and Cummings of Homicide relieved us, and Ben drove me home. It was 3.45 when he dropped me off at Collis Avenue, number 4656. Joseph, that you? Yeah, Ma, I didn't mean to wake you. What time is it? Almost four. You've got to get your rest, Joseph. We'll be all right, Ma. 
Got something to eat in the ice box? There's a little cold meat and some cheese in the cupboard. Just want a sandwich. You're going back to sleep. I had some nice meatballs and spaghetti for dinner. I can warm some for you. My, how Sandy's is working all hours. You just get sick, Joseph, and you'll see. Nobody cares about you when you're sick. I wish you wouldn't get up, Ma. I can fix something. Well, I'll warm up the meatballs and spaghetti. You need something substantial. I get it. 4 a.m. I hope it's not that awful cold. Hello. Lorman down homicide. Yeah, Lorman. Thought you'd like to know they just got Kirby. Where? At his brother's place about 15 minutes ago. Hanson and Cummings grabbed him. Any trouble? No. Grabbed him before he got to his gun. We just locked him up. Thought you'd like to know. Yeah. Thanks, Lorman. Good night. All right. Well, that wasn't Joseph. The office, Ma. They got Kirby, the badge bandit. Oh, did they? Well, that's nice. Maybe you'll have some time off now. Yeah. Never fails, does it? You work on a case for three months. Leave it for 30 minutes and it's all over. Well, the food's warm. Is there anything else you want? No, no, that's fine, Ma. You go on to bed. Yeah. Well, all right, Joseph. Now, don't stay up too long. All right. Good night. Good night. Hey, Ma. Yes, Joseph? Have I still got that old tuxedo around? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 27th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself, the best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> Charles Leon Kirby, alias the Badge Bandit, was tried and convicted in Superior Court on several counts of armed robbery, rape, and assault with intent to commit murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. After serving one year in the state penitentiary, he was judged insane and committed to the state mental hospital at Mendocino. After two months there, he escaped. Charles Kirby, alias the Badge Bandit, is still at large. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Juvenile Bureau. A potential killer roams the halls of one of the high schools in your city. Girl students have been brutally slashed by the criminal. Your job, stop him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, 
long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, November 4th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Bowling, Commander Juvenile Division. My name's Friday. It was 2.45 p.m. when we got to Charter High School. Main entrance. Which way, Joe? I don't know. We can ask this boy. Hey, son. Yeah? Where's the principal's office? Oh, uh, straight down the hall. Last door on the left. Thank you. What's all the noise about? Football rally. We're playing Piedmont today. Probably lose. Can't beat confidence like that. Kids are sure funny nowadays. Yeah. Check that sign. Mm-hmm. Junior prom. Dollar twenty-five for cup. Makes you feel old, doesn't it? I never did go to those high school dances. How come? Couldn't dance. Wife says I still can. Yes, sir? I'd like to see Mr. Chase? Could I have your names, please? Romero and Friday. Oh, yes, he's expecting you. You can go right in. That door there. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chase? Yes. My name's Friday. I talked to you on the phone. Oh, yes, certainly, Sergeant. Have a chair. Thank you. This is my partner, Ben Romero. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Chase? Uh, sit down, sit down. Certainly glad to see you, gentlemen. I'm at the end of my rope. Would you mind briefing us, Mr. Chase? How did all this trouble start? I don't know how it started. I don't know why. But here's the result, Sergeant. This dress, blood stains on it. Mm-hmm. What's the story? A woman stormed in here and said her daughter came home from school yesterday wearing this dress. And she told her her mother she'd been knifed here at the school. Mm-hmm. How many cases like this have you had? Twenty-one in the past three weeks. Why didn't you notify us? Believe me, Sergeant, I didn't know which way to turn. When I first learned about these knifings, I, I wanted to call in the police, but some of the girls who'd been cut, the uh, parents didn't want it reported. The publicity, the notoriety, they didn't want it. Hope you realize, Mr. Chase, that it's a pretty serious business. Believe me, I did realize. What could I do? Uh, the knifings had to be stopped. The parents didn't want them reported. I've tried everything humanly possible to find out who's responsible. What have you tried, Mr. Chase? Well, I called on some of the older students from the Boys' Council. I placed them all over the grounds of the buildings and told them to keep an eye out. No results, huh? The knifings have gone right on. This past week, they've even gotten worse. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, just a moment, please. Yes, Mr. Chase? Uh, Doris, would you get Jim Travers, please? Have him come to my office right away. Yes, Mr. Chase. Travers is head of the Boys' Council. He helped organize the system of guards. He might be able to give you some information. You said a minute ago that the situation has been worse this past week. You mean the knifings have gotten more frequent? More frequent and more serious. One girl was cut very badly this morning. She had to be sent home. Are most of these girls cut in pretty much the same manner? The school nurse treated some of them. She says it looked to her as though the girls had been slashed with a very sharp knife, probably a razor. Is there any definite time pattern to these knifings? All of them happen between periods, when the students change classes. The corridors are pretty well crowded, and... That's why it's so difficult to pin it down to any one person. I see. How about the victims themselves, Mr. Chase? Is there any set pattern there? That's what has me frightened. How do you mean? Most of the victims are rather pretty girls. Whoever's doing this seems to have a preference for them. It's frightening when you think of what kind of mind the person must have. It's a little more than frightening, Mr. Chase. Huh? A person with a knife must be a mental case, probably a dangerous one. I don't think he's going to be satisfied with just knifing the girls. Killing? Possible, if we let it go much longer. You wanted to see me, Mr. Chase? Uh, c- come in, Jim. I would have come sooner. I was tied up with a rally committee. Uh, Jim, this is Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero, police officers. Oh, right, Jim. Right, They're sir. here to investigate the knifings. I thought maybe you'd be able to help out with some information. Well, I still have the fellows on the council watching the corridors. We haven't seen anything yet. Well, do you have any time after the rally, Jim? We'd like to have you show us around. Okay, Sergeant. Is the school nurse still in her office? I'd like to talk to her, too. I think so. Jim, when does Miss Wesley go home? Uh, 3.30 on Thursday, Mr. Chase. I'll tell her to stay on a few minutes. That's fine. We'll meet you outside the office here. Huh? Okay, I'll see you later, then. Right. The 
for school out for the day? Yes, it is. Guess we'll have to wait till morning to interview the victims. The first class is at 8 o'clock. I'll have the girls assemble in the classroom next to my office. All right, Mr. Chase. Thank you. I'll be right back, Doris. Yes, Mr. See you gentlemen now. Looks like the rally's just breaking up, huh? Three o'clock now. The game's at 3.30. The kids certainly jam up the corridor. Come on, come on. Let us through here. Let us through, please. All right. Now the rest of you go about your business. Go on now. What's the matter, young lady? What's the trouble? Patty, Mr. Patty Larson just fainted. What's the matter with her? Look at her dress. It's covered with blood. An ambulance was called, and the injured girl was taken to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, where she was treated for a cut on her right forearm and a deep slash across her hips. She was not in serious condition. It was the doctor's opinion that the wounds had been inflicted either by a very sharp knife or more probably a razor. A detail of plain clothesmen were dispatched to Charter High School to keep the grounds and quarters under strict surveillance until further notice. At 7.30 the next morning, policewoman Lorraine Jensen, Ben and I met at the high school with Principal Chase and Jim Travers, the head of the boys' council. By 9 a.m., all of the 21 knifing victims were assembled in one of the empty classrooms. Policewoman Jensen outlined our plan of questioning. May I have your attention, please? This isn't going to take very long, girls, but I will have to ask you to cooperate with us. Try to remember every detail of the time and the place that the knifings occurred. Do you all have a report form to write on? Yeah, they're all set. We'd like to have you write three things. First, exactly where you were when you were injured. After that, write the date and the time. Make that just as close as you can remember. I don't remember, do you? You're not going to know what you're writing. At the bottom of the page, write the name of the person you suspect might have cut you. Your answer will be kept confidential. <laughs> Please don't compare notes with the girl next to you. We want your version, not your neighbor's. Sergeant. Yep, driver. Five-minute warning, Bill. Yeah, okay. All right? Yeah, Joe. There's a recess coming up. We want to check the quarters. Can you make out a loan for a little while? Sure, you two go ahead. We can check the slips when you get back. All right, let's go, Ben. Yeah. The top of the stairs is best, Sergeant. Okay. If you stand back a little from the railing, no one down below can tell if they're being watched either. Okay. I'm pretty much interested in police work. You know, the lie detector and stuff. Uh-huh. Can you keep on going here? One more flight. All right. I wrote a paper once on the lie detector for our physiology class. The teacher liked it. That so? Yeah. I've been reading how they take fingerprints, cloth imprints, and all that. Pretty interesting. Here we are. We can keep an eye on the whole corridor from here. Okay. What detail do you officers work out of? Georgia Street Juvenile. You know uh, Lee Jones or uh, Ray Pinker? Oh, yeah. I've read a lot about the crime lab. Why don't you come downtown some afternoon? We'll show you around. That'd be swell. Okay. Must be interesting, meeting all kinds of people, watching how they behave, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. During the recess, while the students moved from classroom to classroom, we kept the main quarter under close surveillance. The other men from Juvenile Bureau covered the rest of the corridors. We kept an eye on the main quarter during the third recess between periods at 11 a.m., Again, no results. At 11.30, Travers went to check with the members of the boys' council to set up the noontime watch. Ben and I went back to the classroom on the main floor to check with policewoman Jensen. We helped her tally the results of the questioning of the girl victims that morning. Let's see, 17, 18, 19. Well, that takes care of the lot. Let's see. There it is. Now what's it mean? Well... Twelve say they were knifed on the main corridor. Three knifed outside the building. Four on the stairway. Two in a classroom. The times they list. Doesn't look like there's any pattern there. How about the suspects that they wrote down? That's even got me beat. We've got more of them than we have victims. Here. There's four pages of names. Some of the girls wrote down as many as five suspects. That's going to help a lot. How many all together? Mm, let's see. Thirty-four. Oh, hi, Mr. J. Did you find out anything? Well, it didn't turn out too well. Nothing definite. Terrible morning. Parents calling up newspapers. I don't know. Certainly out of my hands. Are there any assemblies scheduled for this afternoon? Yes, after the fifth period. Why? 
Well, I think maybe you better cancel it. Seems like every time the kids are crowded together, we just ask for trouble. No, all right, I'll, I'll have it canceled. Fine. Something else, uh, Mr. Chase. Yes. The girls that we had in this room this morning, the victims, we'd like to have every one of them brought back here after the next class, can we? All right, Sergeant. I'll have excuse slips sent to each one. Thank you, sir. Gives you the chills. Those kids getting cut up in broad daylight. Whoever it is, the guy's got a stomach for it. How do you know it's a guy? It's as good a guess as any. How about the school employees, the janitors, and the rest of them? Checked them all out this morning. When we get the girls back here, we'll go through the same routine. One thing we missed the last time we talked to them... Yeah? We ask them to pick suspects. We might have more luck if we have a bigger choice. Well, how do you mean? Well, instead of asking them to pick out somebody, we'll tell them to list the names of every person who was around them or near them when they were cut. It might work if we can spot a couple of repeats on the list. Sergeant, they want you downstairs. Hurry. Come on, Ben. What's the matter? It's terrible, terrible. I found her. You found who? Betty Price. Where? Downstairs, unconscious. I'm afraid. What do you mean you're afraid? I'm not sure she's alive. We located the unconscious girl in a corner of the basement near the rear entrance to the girl's locker room. She'd been cut severely about the face and arms. At Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, she was given an immediate blood transfusion. In addition to her wounds, she was also treated for shock. We questioned the victim. She stated that she did not see the person who attacked her. Later that afternoon, she was removed to her own home upon the advice of her family physician. 1.35 p.m., Ben and I got back to the high school and checked in with policewoman Lorraine Jensen. How'd the last session turn out, Lorraine? Hey, a lot better. It was a good idea, Joe. Yeah? How'd we come out? Pretty good. They had the list they made out. 21 of them. Uh-huh. Each girl listed an average of eight persons around her at the time she was knifed. Yeah. There's one name that occurs on 19 of these 21 lists. Here, Joe. Jim Travers. You are listening to Dragnet. The Case History of a Police Investigation, presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Mr. Frank Fenton, well-known author and Hollywood screenwriter. This is his actual signed statement. When a writer gets absorbed in his work, he loses track of time, smokes more than usual. And this happens often to me. As a result, I appreciate a mild cigarette... Fatima is extra mild. I agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And so do more and more smokers every day. Actual figures show extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Friday, November 5th, 1.45 p.m. Ben and I started checking on Jim Travers. In the registrar's files, he was listed as James Kirkland Travers, 17 years old. He was a well-known, popular student. He was a fine athlete. He was from a well-to-do family. His father was the head of an engineering firm. His mother was from one of the oldest families in the city. During his three and a half years at Charter High, Jim Travers had maintained close to an A average in his studies. He'd been president of his class since freshman year, and he'd held numerous other class offices. We interviewed his teachers. They had nothing but praise for Travers. They tabbed him as a brilliant young man with an excellent future. We asked about Travers' friends, who we palled around with. We picked up a small lead. We were told that he had very few, if any, close personal friends among the students, but he did have one girl at the high school he was especially fond of. Her name was Barbara Ferris, a tall, dark-haired girl, exceptionally pretty. Her scholastic record was almost as high as Travers. 2 p.m., policewoman Lorraine Jensen and I interviewed the girl in a small room off the principal's office. We're not singling you out, Barbara. We're interviewing most of the girls in the upper classes. You mean about what's been happening around school? Yes, that's right. Well, I don't know much about it. I was talking to Jim Travers last night. He's a friend of mine. He told me why you were here. How long have you known Jim Travers, Barbara? Oh, since freshman year, I guess. Mm-hmm. Did you go steady with him? 
Well, we don't like to call it that, but I guess so. We go to the dances together. Sometimes we go to the show on weekends. Do you go out with him very often? No, not very often. Jim's usually pretty busy. He studies a lot. Does he go out with other girls, do you know? Well, no, I don't. Once he went out with Betty Fisher, he said he didn't like her much. Betty's kind of a party girl. Jim likes to talk about things. You know, physiology, books, stuff like that. Do you get along with him pretty well? We get along fine. Sometimes he's moody, but I guess I am too. Could you tell us a little more about Jim? What's he like? Well, what do you want to know that for? Is there anything wrong? No, it's just routine questioning, Barbara. We have to check on everybody. Oh, I see. Well, Jim's certainly all right. He's like the rest of the fellows at school, I guess. Only he's smarter than most of them. Well, is there anything maybe that's odd about him that you noticed? Anything very different? Mm, no, not that I've noticed. He's always been pretty bashful, up until this last year anyway. He's still that way sometimes when we go out on dates. And how do you mean? How is he bashful? You know, about girls and things. He's always nice, though. He's not always thinking about necking and stuff like most of them. You mean he's not the romantic type? Well, he can be romantic when he wants to. Once we parked outside my house after a dance, he's always nice. It was just this one time. What was that? Well, he kissed me and then he twisted my arm behind my back. He kept twisting it for no reason. Yeah? I told him it hurt me, but he wouldn't let go. He kept twisting my arm. What did he say? That's what was so funny. He said, I like you better than any girl I know. Yeah? Then he said, that's why I'm hurting you. After talking with Barbara Ferris, we had a pretty good idea that Jim Travers was a suspect we wanted. But because of his fine background and his record, we realized that we'd have to prove beyond any question of a doubt that he was the guilty person. We had only one thing to go on besides the information Barbara Ferris had given us. During the morning recesses, when Travers was with Ben and I was watching the corridors, not one knifing took place. When we had left Travers and gone downstairs to check with policewoman Jensen, the girl had been found slugged and cut at the rear of the girl's locker room. 2.30 p.m., Ben and I met with the suspect. How's it going, Sergeant? Any luck? Mm, not much, Jim. What's that, another rally? No, a band practice. Junior proms tonight, isn't it? Yeah. You talk to the girl who was knifed downstairs, huh? Find out anything? No, not much. You want to stick with us this afternoon? I think you might be able to help us out. Sure. I, I've got the fellas on the council standing by if you want them. All right. Let's go outside, huh? Got something to tell you. Sure, okay. We can go out this way. I certainly appreciate your letting me tag along. Hope I can help you. I think you can, Jim. So when we talked to those girls this morning, uh, we drew up a new list of possible suspects. Yeah? Funny thing, one of the names on the list was yours. Well, I've got nothing to hide. Well, we'll make a systematic check of each name on the list and start with yours. Well, uh, will we have to go on the lie detector? I'd like to try that. I never saw one. Well, only pictures of it. No, no, you won't have to go through that. It'll just be a couple of questions, and then we're going to check your locker. Okay, I'd be glad to show you. Does this take us to the locker room? Yeah, we can cut through here. Say, uh, when we were questioning those girls this morning, some of them said that they saw you in different parts of the building when the night things took place. What do you mean? Well, your location didn't exactly jibe with your classroom schedule. In other words, your class was on the third floor, but you were seen down in the main corridor. Now, how do you account for that? Well, you see, I usually take walks between periods. Sitting in classrooms makes me nervous sometimes, you know. Uh -huh. Here, I'll get the door. Uh -huh. Any other questions I can answer, Sergeant? No, that's all. How did you happen to get interested in police work, Jim? You said your father was an engineer, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. I don't know how I got into it. I just took to it, I guess. I always like to watch people's reactions and their behavior. Fascinating. Uh, the locker room's down this way. Okay. What are you planning on doing when you graduate? College? Yeah, I guess so. Dad wants to send me to MIT. It's good school. Yeah. Say, uh, if you ever have the time, I'd sure like to see some of the ballistics equipment down at the police crime lab. I've read up on ballistics quite a bit, too. Oh, is that so? Yeah. The polyograph and lie detector. That's my favorite, though. Wonderful machine. Mm-hmm. Imagine charting positive and negative reactions like that. It's marvelous. Yeah, it is. Say, have uh, either one of you ever read Dawson's Treatise? Uh, I think it's called The uh, Psychology of the Criminal Mind. You ever read it? Mm, I think we had that in training, didn't we, Ben? Mm, something like that, yeah. 
How about uh, Criminal Behavior and its Basis, uh, Maxwell's book? Did you ever read that one? Mm, no, I don't think I did. It's a great book. I got quite a few textbooks on crime. There's one on sex crimes I just got. It's very good. Mm-hmm. This locker room? <laughs> yeah, I almost went past it. My lock is down this way. How do you shave, Jim? You use an electric razor or a safety razor? Me? Electric razor. They're the best. Yeah, they're a lot easier to use. Here it is. I'll open it for you. All right. Ben, you got those envelopes? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, here they are. Okay, would you step aside there, Jim? Yeah, sure. All right, we'll get some dust scrapings from the shelf here. All right, there you are, Ben. You want to mark it? Yeah. Jim Travers, dust scrapings from locker. All right. Let's see here. Here's some more scrapings from the bottom of the locker this time. Huh? Okay, I'll see these envelopes. Oh, here's a nail file. Okay, Jim. Now, will you hold out your right hand? Hmm? Oh, yeah, okay. Hold an envelope under his hand, will you, Ben? Mm -hmm. Catch the nail scrapings? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Say, what's all this for, Sergeant? Oh, it's just routine with everybody, Jim. Just gonna take some sample specimens to run through the spectrograph. The spectrograph? Mm-hmm. Now, let me scrape that middle fingernail a little. Oh, okay. That's it. Now, the index finger... What about the spectrograph? We use it all the time. Well, it won't work in a case like this, will it? All right, that's all for the right hand, Ben. Don't forget to mark the envelope. Yep. Yeah. Let's see. Jim Travers. Scrapings from fingernails of right hand. There we go. All right, now the left hand, Jim. Hmm? Yeah. No, we don't know if this is going to work or not. It's worth a try. We'll know this afternoon. This afternoon? Yeah. We'll have to run you through on the machine. Hold the envelope a little closer, Ben. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, how's it going to help you? It might tell us what you had for breakfast a week ago. It might tell us what kind of clothes you wore three days ago. The kind of objects you came in contact with. Oh. Well, uh, what kind of principle does it operate on? No, oh, I don't know. We can ask Lee Jones. Here, let me get the scrapings from your thumb. All right, there it is. Now, seal it and mark it, Ben. All right. You want to call the office and tell them we're on our way in? Yeah, I'll be in that, in that room right next to the principal's office. Okay. You can close your locker, Jim. That's all. Yeah, all right. We'll check the things in your pockets when we get to the crime lab. Let's go. That spectrograph must be a marvelous machine. Well, it's worked for us a lot of times. We've got evidence on a suspect that either convicts him or clears him. You'll probably get a kick out of it. Mm -hmm, I'd like to see it. You say it tells you everything a person's come in contact with, huh? Yeah, that's right. Could it tell you how I shave? Well, how do you mean? I mean, uh, with an electric razor or, or a safety oh, razor. Oh, yeah, sure. That's one of the primary things. Hmm. I don't know exactly how it works, but it does the job. We'll get Lee Jones to explain it to us. Out this door, we can cut across the courtyard. Oh, These are sure nice grounds. Will they keep me long downtown, Sergeant? What do you think, Jim? You know, the strange part about these knifings out here... What's that? Whoever's responsible probably doesn't even realize what he's doing. Yeah. Mentally, he's sick. He's very sick. Best thing for him would be a doctor. Mm -hmm. Just like any other sickness, it's not going to get better by itself. Yeah. The only trouble is, he's just getting his appetite up with these knifings. Now, if he goes much longer... Uh, how about that spectrograph, Sergeant? Uh, say, for instance, well, if I happen to hold a knife in my hand, or maybe a razor... Oh, yeah, that is showing the machine. We go in here? Yeah, uh-huh. terrible thing. Whoever it is. It's a terrible thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> In here, Jim. <laughs> Joe, how's it going? I think he's ready to tell us. Hope so. That's 
expect a girl for. <laughs> All right, son, you want to tell us about it now? I couldn't help myself. I, I had to do what I had to. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't study unless I did it. I couldn't help myself. You're responsible for all the knifings, are you? <laughs> you knew, didn't you? Who told you? You told us, Jim. I'm glad you caught me. It was getting worse. It might have been too late. I'm glad you caught me. Why? Barbara. After the prom tonight, yeah. I was going to kill her. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 15th, the hearing was held in Juvenile Court, Department 38, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast. Extra Mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Seventeen-year-old James Travers was examined by court psychiatrists who found him to be one of the most dangerous mental cases they had ever examined. The boy's parents, who cooperated to the fullest with the police officers and with the court, made only one request that the boy be committed to a private sanitarium. James Travers is now under confinement at that sanitarium for an indefinite period of time. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Screen Director's Playhouse presents a Damon Runyon story tomorrow on NBC. The story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. An elderly woman on her way to the bank has been robbed and beaten senseless. The suspects are cruel, ruthless... Your job, get them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. 
was Saturday, August 9th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Walker, captain of robbery. My name's Friday. It was 10.14 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Hi. Hi. Hello, Joe. Hi, Wynn. How is he? Won't know for a while. What did the vet say? Thinks the dog picked up some kind of poison food. Oh, that's too bad. Sure hot. You got a penny? Yeah. Yeah, there you are. Thank you. Somebody poisoned, huh? Yeah. That's what the vet says. I never could figure why some people poison dogs. I don't understand some people not liking animals, but I can't see why they poison food and then just toss it around wholesale loss. You know how I feel about that dog of mine. If anything happens to him, I don't know what I'll do. Oh, he'll be all right. Those vets can do wonders these days. I sure hope so. They told me to check back with him about noon. Yeah. I'm about to melt in this heat. Yeah. Doesn't seem to be any air at all. Well, tomorrow's Sunday. Guess I'll just lie out in the backyard. It's going to be good to just loaf around and read the Sunday papers, huh? It's a hot shot. I'll take it. My wife wants me to get out and get a little color. She says I'm better looking with a tan. She ought to know. All right. Will you get married, Joe? After so long, it gets so you believe everything they tell you. Here's one to roll on. Yeah? Robbery and shooting. Victim's car was stolen. You want to get on it? All right. Let's go, Joe. Bank job. Don't make any plans for Sunday. 10.53 a.m. Ben and I pulled up in front of the Union Trust and Savings Bank at Melrose and Logan. We made our way through the usual crowd that was milling in and around the bank. We spoke with the manager, a Mr. Bill Four. He told us that he didn't see the actual robbery. The victim was taken in the parking lot next to the bank. Her name was Myrtle Shaw, a longtime customer of the Union Trust and Savings. Four told us that she always did her banking at the same time each day, around 10 in the morning when the bank first opened. He said she was the proprietor of Myrtle's Cafe, four doors west of the bank. Let us through, please. Sorry, let us through here. Officer, over here. Yes, sir. Friday and Romero, Central Robbery. Did you answer the call? Yes, we did. Freeman and Welsh, unit 13R. Ambulance just left. Bacon didn't want to go to Georgia Street, said she wanted her own doctor. Okay, is she inside the cafe? Yeah. Let's go in, Ben. Are you Freeman? No, I'm Welsh. Freeman's inside. See if you can clear this crowd a little, will you, Welsh? Right. Thank you. All right, you've seen everything now. Well, let's move along. Come on. It's black on the street there. There she is, over in the last booth. Freeman? Yes, sir. Friday and Romero, Central Robbery. Is this the victim? Yes, that's right. Her name's Myrtle Shaw. Miss Shaw? Yes, that's right. My name is Romero. This is Sergeant Friday. We're from Robbery Division downtown. You men detectives? Yes, ma'am. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Yes, all right. I hope you can catch the man that did this. Well, we're going to do all we can. It's a little hard for me to talk. My face is so swollen. It hurts something terrible. What happened? One of them struck me. Yes, ma'am, we know that. Do you want to tell us how it happened? And I was on my way to the bank. I drove in the parking lot there next door. Yeah? I just got out of my car when these men walked over to me. You're only four doors from the bank. Do you always drive such a short distance? No, no. I just picked up my car from Edgar's fill-in station. I haven't greased once a month. I see. Where was I? You'd just driven into the parking lot when these men walked up oh, to you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, one of them said, just hand over the money and there won't be any trouble. The other one said, this is a gun in my pocket, Grandma. Yeah. My head's splitting. Did someone call Dr. Van Hale? Yes, ma'am. He's on his way. Oh, thank you. Well... I carry my day's receipts in a cloth bank bag. I had it in my purse, and I wasn't sure if they knew I had any money. Yeah? I told them I didn't have any. And I was going in to draw some out, and one of the men said, Look, old-timer, we don't want to get rough. Just hand it over. We know you got it. What'd you do? Well, I turned and started to walk away, and I saw this one man's arm flash out of his pocket, and then something hard like a rock struck me on the side of the face. Must have slugged you with his gun. Oh, yes. It couldn't have been his hand. I don't think he could have cut my face like this with his hand. You should have let them take you to the emergency hospital. No. No, I don't want to go in an ambulance. I want my own doctor. He'll know what to do. Ambulance crew gave her first aid. She wouldn't let him take her. Mm Mm-hmm. Thanks. Miss Shaw, uh, would you know the men if you ever saw them again? Well, I think so, yes. One of them looked like the worst kind of a hoodlum. And they got your money, huh? Oh, yes. And they tell me they got away with my car, too. 
How much money did you lose? $116.23. Do you own this cafe? Yes, I do. It's a small place, as you can see. I, I do all the cooking and serving up to 11.30 in the morning. Then I have a college girl that waits on tables in the afternoon and evening. Do you think those men have ever been in here in the cafe? No, Have you ever no. seen either of them no, before? No, I never laid eyes on them before today. How about the girl who works for you? You think she's ever seen them before? I don't know. You can ask her. She should be here soon. What time is it now? Mm, 11.20. Yes, she'll be along any minute. Oh, I wish there was something to stop this aching. We know you must have a lot of pain, Miss Shaw, but we've got to ask a few more questions so we can get right on this. Yeah, I understand. I'll tell you all I can. All right. Ben, do you want to get the dope on the stolen car and a description of the man? I'll call the office. Right. Say, is there a pay phone I can use here, Miss Shaw? Yes. Right over there behind the phone. Thank there. you. Do you need change? Yes, ma'am, I'm afraid I do. Well, just help yourself in the cash register there. Thank you. Put in a dime, taking out two nickels. Oh, well, now, that wasn't necessary, young man. You didn't have to tell me. Well, I know, but we don't like to open other people's cash registers. You're a police officer, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. I trust you. That seems to be the reason a lot of people don't. I called the office, and as fast as Ben repeated the information, I phoned it in. The detailed information was broadcast to all units. The stolen car was a 1946 green Ford sedan, license number 1X-Ray 1898. All units were instructed to be on the lookout for the car and if found abandoned, to notify robbery detail immediately and to keep the car under surveillance until we arrived. I called in a description of the suspects and the fact that the money was taken in a cloth bag stamped Union Trust and Savings. Myrtle Shaw's doctor arrived and she was ordered to bed for rest and treatment. Ben and I interrogated all the possible witnesses in the parking lot and we found only one man who saw the actual robbery. His story compared to that of Miss Shaw's, but he could add nothing more. We talked with a young college student who worked in the restaurant. She didn't think she'd ever seen the men in question. We drove back to the city hall and went to the stats office. They made a run for us on the descriptions and M.O. that we had, and we pulled the packages of all possible suspects that the machine sorted out. We narrowed and sifted the 24 possibles down to 12. We took the mug shots out and showed them to the victim and the one witness. They could not identify any of them as the two men in the holdup. 2.35 p.m. Saturday... We started to canvas the neighborhood, door to door. That takes care of Logan Street for one block, both sides. Want to start here on Melrose? Okay. Let's try this drugstore. I'm on fire. Paper says it's supposed to hit 99 today. I believe it. Come on. Yes, sir? Police officers, we're looking for a couple of men. Here's the descriptions. I wonder if you'd read this and tell us if you've ever seen them. Yes, sir. We got time to have a coat. No, we better not. It's getting late. No, I'm afraid I've never seen anybody who answers either one of these descriptions. You sure? Yeah, quite sure. Well, thank you. I'll have to have that back. Oh. Let's go. Is it just my imagination, or does it seem to be getting hotter to you? Well, talking about it doesn't help. I've tried ignoring it. That don't help neither. Let's try this bakery. How do you do, gentlemen? All right, police officers. Wonder if you'd read the two descriptions listed here and tell us if you've ever seen either of these men. Yes, of course. No. Sure smells good in here, doesn't it? No, yeah. I don't seem to recall anybody that looks like this. Anybody else in here who might have seen them? No, I don't think so. I wait on trade. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Let's go. That smells just like good old apple pie, doesn't it, Joe? We're baking Danish coffee cake at the moment. Oh. The next place here is a plastic factory. Yeah, it looks like they're closed. Half day Saturday again. Somebody in there cleaning up. Guess he didn't hear me. Oh, here it comes. Yeah. A lot of money in this plastic business. Mm-hmm. Really came into its own during the war, didn't it? Oh, yeah. The plant's closed Saturday afternoon. Police officers, wonder if you'd look this paper over and tell us if you may have seen two men answering these descriptions. All right. I have to put my glasses on. Yes, sir. There now. I don't need them for sweeping, just reading. All right, here you are. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Uh, what was that? 
I said, what do you think? Have you seen him? Well, I don't know. How do you mean? I'm not sure yet. Hmm? I'm not sure. I may have seen one of them. How about the other one? That's what I mean. Yeah. I don't know about the other one. But you do remember seeing one of them? I might have seen both of them. But you're not sure? I don't know. Well, do you want to tell us what you remember about the one you did see? Oh, well, don't you want to know about the other one, too? Well, yes, sir, we do, but I understood you to say that you didn't know about the other one. No, I don't. Well, you just tell us what you know, then. Then you uh, want me to just forget about the other fella? No, sir, but if you don't know, it's all right. I might know. Yeah? I haven't read about him yet. Oh. You asked me a question just as I finished reading uh, about the first one. I was just starting on the second one at that time. Yes, sir, sorry. What was that you asked me? It wasn't important. Then I'll read about the second one. Yes, sir, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I seen him. Two or three days ago, both of them. In this neighborhood? Yes, sir, right around back in the parking lot. They work here? No, sir, they don't. Seems to me I've seen them a couple of times. What were they doing? I don't recall. I just remember I've seen them. You sure? Yes, I'm positive. One of them had on a brown suit, the other gray. Just like it says here. The descriptions fit all right. You have any idea where these men might be now? No, sir. We're investigating a robbery. We want these men for questioning. I wish I could help you more. I do know I've seen them, but... That's about all. I, I don't know their names. All right, sir. What's your name? Seth Williamson. We'll leave you one of our cards, Mr. Williamson. If you see him again, appreciate you letting us know. Yes, sir. Sure will. Let's go, then. Wish we had something more definite to go on. We just had a picture of the guys. Yeah, it'd help. There's a vacant lot in the corner. Finishes out this block. All right. Let's double back on the other side of the street. All right. Sure, huh? 4.30 p.m. We continued knocking on doors, checking every place that was still open or showed any activity Saturday afternoon. We talked with hotel managers, janitors, and cleanup men at the different factories or business establishments. We checked grocery stores, private homes, everywhere that we could find anybody to show the descriptions to. By 6.15 p.m., the only person who showed any sign of recognition of the two hold-up men was still Seth Williamson, the janitor at the plastics plant. Before we took time out for a sandwich and a cup of coffee, we drove back to the city hall to check the office. Hey, Friday. What do you say, Marty? A couple messages for you here. Thanks. What's the matter with you, Romero? I'm dehydrated. That sun almost fried me. Well, Joe, that one call there from your mother said tell your dog's out of danger. Oh, that's fine. Called in around two, huh? Yeah. That other one's from some guy who says he wants to talk to you right away. Been calling in since about three this afternoon. Seth Williamson, eh? Called four times. Yeah. Said tell you he'd wait at that number there they heard from you. I'll call him right now. Been hot downtown, Marty? Pretty warm, yeah. Any kick back on that stolen car? No, not yet. Yeah, Benson Plastics. This is Sergeant Friday, Police Department. Oh, yes, I'm glad you called me back. I think I've got a little more information for you. Yeah? Those two fellas you were looking for, did you find them? No, not yet. Well, I just remembered what they were doing out back there in the parking lot. Yeah? They were taking pictures. Of what? How were they dressed? The blonde had on a white shirt of some kind and a black dress. That's all I can tell you for sure. Who was taking the pictures? Well, first the fellas took the girls' picture, and then the girls took snapshots of the fellas. Thank you very much, Mr. Williamson. I hope it'll help you. Yes, sir, it will. Goodbye. Goodbye. What do you got? They've had their pictures taken. Yeah? Let's find the prints. <laughs> are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Miss Nancy Appel, a night news writer for one of the world's great press services. This is her actual signed statement. When you're working hard, smoking more, it's nice to enjoy a really mild cigarette. I've found the king-size cigarette that has this quality above all others. That cigarette is Fatima. Because it's extra mild, Fatima is always more enjoyable. That's why I agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And more and more smokers agree to that every day. 
Actual figures show Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Ben and I figured if we could possibly turn up the photographs that had been taken, we'd have something more definite to go on. We still had a lot of doubts. Maybe the janitor Seth Williamson was wrong. Maybe there were no pictures. If the snapshots had been taken, maybe they were still on the camera, undeveloped. With any kind of fast service and processing, the photos could have been picked up by now. We figured it was worth the chance and the time involved to check the lead out. All we had was the victim's scant description of the two hold-up men, and if we could possibly turn up pictures, it'd help a great deal. If Williamson was right, we'd have another lead, the two girls. 6.40 p.m., we started checking drugstores, going through all prints that had not yet been picked up by the customers. We'd made the rounds of all the drugstores in the neighborhood earlier in the day, but... We double-checked the descriptions of the two men with the personnel in each store. By 9 p.m., we checked out ten drugstores and found nothing. We were going on the hunch that the photos would most likely be dropped off for processing somewhere in the immediate neighborhood. It was only a hunch, and we were running out of drugstores. Police business. We'd like to go through your photos that have been left for developing. Yes, sir. Here's the box right here. Oh, thank you. I'll take half. Not very many this time, huh? Oh, don't forget to check the negatives, too. Sometimes they don't print them if they're bad. Yeah, I know. No, nothing in this one. People sure take a lot of pictures of babies, don't they? Yeah. Nothing. These are sure fuzzy. Pictures of the zoo. Pictures of Yellowstone. Ben. Yeah? Pay dirt, maybe. Let me see. Two guys. Two girls. One's a blonde, white blouse, dark skirt. Look close. Let me see. Left by a Marion Lang, 223 East Bexel. Oh, well, Claire. Yes, sir? You want to double check us on this envelope? Yes, sir. This date and time right here, 3.30 p.m. August 6th? Uh, yes, that's correct. That's when the films were left for processing. Three days before the robbery. Did you ever see this woman in the picture before? Let me see. This one. Oh, yes. Yeah. She comes in here quite often. Miss Lang is her name. How about these men or, or this other girl here? No. No, I've never seen them. When were these prints supposed to be picked up? I waited on her. She told me she'd pick them up Friday, yesterday. Well, we'll have to take these photos along with us. They'll be returned. All right, sir. How will I explain this to Miss Lang? If this is the right address, you won't have to. Before we left, we called the office and had a stakeout placed in the drugstore in case Marion Lang tried to pick up the photos. We checked the address she gave on the envelope, 223 East Bixel. It was a small apartment building near the corner. The manager told us that Marion Lang had moved out the morning of August 9th, the day of the robbery. She left no forwarding address. The manager knew nothing of the other girl or the men in the photos. We checked with Myrtle Shaw, the victim. She positively identified the two men as the ones who robbed and slugged her. She knew nothing of the two girls. Hadn't seen them before. We put out a warrant on Marion Lang and gave the photos to Lieutenant Frank Cunningham and the record girl. Monday morning, August 11th. Morning, Frank. Hello, boys. Any record on the guys? Nothing we could find, no. I'm having copies sent out right now. Kind of thought maybe if we came up with pictures, we'd be halfway home. Maybe we are. How do you mean? I had Tony make some blow-ups from the negatives. They're full of grain. Probably taken with a cheap box camera of some kind, but they might help. What'd you find? I just checked the enlargements. They were still in the wash, but I think we got something. Let's go over the photocopy. All right. Yeah, they're good and clear now. Clear as they'll ever be, anyway. I had 16 by 20 enlargements made. This will show you what I found. Yeah? You guys take a good look at the face of this this one man here. Thought we did. Why? It's pretty hard to see on those small prints. Look here. 
You see the nose on this one? Mm-hmm. I'd guess it's been broken one time or another, wouldn't you? Yeah. Mm. You see here? Scar over the left eye, scar over the right eye. A couple of them. Yeah. Look at the right ear. See how mashed it is? Mm. We couldn't come up with any names for you, but I'll bet it'd be safe to guess his line of work. Looks like a prize fighter. Nothing in the oddity file. I checked and double-checked everything I could lay my hands on here in the department. I don't place him if he was a boxer of any standing. I don't recall. going. Isn't much. <laughs> Wish I had something else for you. It's a lead, isn't it? Might be. More than we had. It was possible that one of the two hold-up men in the photos could have been a professional fighter. From his appearance and build, we felt it was a fair guess. We took copies of the snapshots to the State Boxing Commission, Los Angeles branch. We spoke with a Mr. Farmer, who couldn't seem to recall the man from his picture. We went over the description that the victim had given us. Farmer said that he knew a great many of the fighters because at one time or another they all check in and out of the commission before a bout. But the man in the snapshot remained unidentified. He checked through several hundred cards bearing the photographs of boxers in the files. No luck. Farmer suggested that we try the Spring Street gym where the out-of-town fighters get into shape and the boxers in town train. We left him a copy of the photograph and our card so that he could continue checking back through his files. It was 10.22 a.m. when we got to the Spring Street gym. Here's the manager's office. Come in. You the boss here? Yeah. What can I do for you? Police officers. Yeah. We're looking for a man we think might be a fighter. I wonder if you can help us out. Sure try. I'm Sergeant Friday. This is my partner, Ben Romero. Hi. My name's Charlie Coleman. Here's a couple of photographs for you to look at, Mr. Coleman. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen this fellow on the right? Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's walk over by the window, get a little light on him. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, used to work out here all the time a couple of years back. Uh, name's Billy. Uh, Marshall, yeah, that's right. One of them named Billy the Kid Marshall. Is he still around? Oh, gee, I couldn't tell you. It's been a good two years since I've seen him up here. Any idea where we might locate him? I uh, doubt it. Used to be a Benny Farber stable. Benny's been in the East now over a year. Uh, let me check back through my locker listings. Maybe I still got something on him. Yeah, let's see. Uh, out cards, yeah, that's what we want. Let's take him over here by the window where we can read him. As I recall, Marshall wasn't much of a fighter. Mm. Farber nursed him up through the prelims, got him in the semi-wind-ups. He started hitting the bottle. Played the dame. Oh, yeah, here we are. Can I see that, please? Oh, sure. Here we are. Thank you. Billy the Kid. Big, beefy boy. Real sucker for right cross. 1637 Carver Avenue. That's the last address you got on him? Whatever the card says, yeah. Real sucker for the old right cross. Thank you very much, Mr. Coleman. You're welcome, boys. Anytime. What's he done? We just want him for questioning. Oh, I see. If you should hear from him, don't tell him we're looking for him. Let's go. Thanks again. Uh, what do you think he did wrong? I don't know. How do you block a right cross? We called the new information into Captain Walker, and he sent a crew of men to the boxing commission to check further. 1637 Carver Avenue. It was a cheap rooming house in the west side of town. Marshall hadn't lived there for over a year and a half. The landlady gave us a forwarding address. The next place hadn't seen him for a year. We kept checking and rechecking, going from one end of town to the other. Each place was a little better than the last. It was easy to trace Billy the Kid's rise in the fight game, such as it was, by the condition of the places he lived in. We covered six different rooming houses, boarding houses, and apartments. Each time, his residence had been a little more recent. 5.15 p.m., Monday, August 11th. We pulled up in front of the Sunflower Hotel, 433 Banyan Street. Rates, $2 a week and up. Nobody at the desk. I'll ring the bell. How do you do? Police officers. Have you got a Billy Marshall registered here? No, no one by that name here. Did you take a look at this picture? Either one of these men live here? Oh, sure. That's Tom Green and George Martin, room nine. They in now? I could buzz the room and see. No, never mind. Room nine, you said. Yes, sir, that's right. Let's go. Room nine. Cover me. Right. Yeah? 
Special delivery letter. Slip it under the door. You have to sign for it. All right, stand still, police officers. Pass, Tom. Watch it, Ben. Take the other one, Tom. <laughs> Joe! Joe, look out! All right, hold it right there, Marshal. Get over there against the wall. You, get up. Go over there with him. Move. Give me a hand, Joe. I'll help you up. You all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. There he is, Joe. Looks like his picture. Fits the description. Except for one thing. Yeah? He's no sucker for a right cross. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 27th, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 81, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Both William Marshall and his accomplice were found guilty of armed robbery and grand theft auto and are now serving their terms as prescribed by law. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Screen Directors presents Lucille Ball as Miss Grant tomorrow on NBC. The story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A woman has been murdered, her identity unknown. The body shows the marks of a savage attack. Your job, find the killer. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, December 25th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Blaine Steed, captain of homicide. My name's Friday. It was 39 minutes past 5 a.m. when I got to San Andreas Cathedral on 1st Street. Churchyard. Well, 
Hi, Dave. Hi, Joe. Body's over here. All right. Merry Christmas, huh? Yeah. Sexton from the church found it about an hour ago. Have a look. Pretty brutal. Yeah. Okay. Who is she? No identification. The coroner checked the body in? Yeah. How long has she been dead? When it started raining. About midnight, didn't it? Yeah. The ground's dry under the body. Oh, been dead five or six hours, I'd say. Ben get here yet? Yeah, he's helping Claudio check the area. This park here, is this all a part of the church grounds? I think so. I was stuck out of this rain for a minute. There's an alcove over there by the church. Yeah, come on. How much we got to go on, Dave? Not much. Motive looks like robbery. Yeah. Found a woman's purse near the body. Pretty well picked over. Purse is wet. Lee Jones is dusting the contents for Fritz. Coroner's checking. Any idea of what the killer used in the woman's face? The coroner figures a sharp instrument of some kind. A nasty one. Yeah. Friday, you look wet. Hi, Ali. So do you. Everything happened on Christmas. Purse was soaking wet. Ordinary black handbag. Huh? Raise any prints on the stuff inside? Not a one. Here, yeah, you can check the content. Thank you, Lee. Let's see. Small comb. Most of the teeth out of it. Three pennies. Hairpins. Mirror. Lipstick. That's it, Holly. A couple more things. Yeah. This fountain pen this door key. Armstrong found them in the grass a few feet from the body. Can I have a look at those? Yeah, it's an ordinary ballpoint fountain pen. You buy them in any drugstore for six nine cents. No sign of rust on the key. Must have been dropped recently. Maybe this will explain what happened to her face. Broken beer bottle. Where'd you find that? Laughlin found it back in the bushes over there. These jagged edges here smeared with blood. Mm-hmm. Too much rain. Can't do anything about prints till it dries. Can you get enough from these smears to run a precipitant? I think so. Lee, you got a minute? Yeah, Ben. What is it? Oh, hi, Joe. Hi. Claudio found a set of footprints over by that clump of shrubbery. Rain hasn't spoiled them yet. Did you cover them? Yeah, I think you can get a pretty good cast from them. Better uh, get a picture of them right away. Hey, Charlie. Right with you, Lee. I'll get the stuff from the car. You mind giving me a hand, Dave? Oh, let's go. Well, this takes care of Christmas, Joe. Yeah. Did you get a chance to check the body yet? Mm-hmm. What do you think? Well, there's no sign of struggle. Could have happened after a Christmas Eve brawl, maybe. Yeah. Whoever the victim is, she was probably acquainted with the killer. The two of them came in the park, and the victim got it before she knew what was happening. Might work easier if we find out who the victim is. And we can check her prints through R and I when we get back to the office. What'd those footprints look like? Seemed like a heavy print, maybe work shoes of some kind. Want to see how Lee's making out? Yeah, let's go. Gonna miss Christmas dinner again this year. Hmm. Footprint, fountain pen, and key. Where do we start? It's a cheap pen. They sell thousands of them. Want to smoke? All right, thanks. Footprints will help convict the killer. Got to find him first. Hmm. Thank you. I don't know. Maybe we can work a switch. How's that? Find the lock that fits the key. 9 a.m., Christmas Day. Sergeants Dave Arroyo, Robert Claudio, Ben and I went back to the office and took stock of what we had to work with. It wasn't much. A woman had been murdered. Who was she? Why was she killed? Who was the killer? Dave and Claudio had the dead woman's fingerprints taken and they were run through the record bureau. Ben and I checked with Lee Jones at the crime lab. The results of the precipitant test showed that the type of blood found on the broken beer bottle matched that of the victim. From the cast of the foot impressions found at the scene of the killing... Lee estimated that they were made by a person approximately 5 feet 9 inches tall, weighing about 160 pounds. He figured the foot gear must have been of a heavy type, either a boot or a dress shoe with thick double soles, size 11. 9.40 a.m. We checked in at the basement of the Hall of Justice, the county morgue. Yeah, Doc, how's it going? All there, Joe. Death caused by multiple fracture. The skull flashing in the face was a contributing cause. I sent her close to Lee Jones. Yeah, we know. No none remarks. Well, I got two things. Maybe they'll help, maybe they won't. Yeah. Um, the chemist's report here on the blood analysis 
shows the victim was drinking. She was definitely under the influence at the time she was murdered. Twelve hundredths percent alcohol in the blood. Mm-hmm. How about the murder weapon, Doc? We gonna rule out that beer bottle? I'm just coming to that. Step over here. Yeah? This mark here on the side of her face, brown smudge. Well, Joan says that that shoe polish, she analyzed a few of the particles. Ties in. The cause of death was brought about by severe blows in the head and face. Heavy shoe, huh? That's my guess. Probably a boot or a work shoe. That doesn't add, Joe. How do you mean? If they were heavy work shoes the killer was wearing, why were they polished? How many people polish their work shoes? To be waterproofing. No, Joan says it was a brown paste polish. Then it doesn't figure. Unless the killer was wearing some kind of dress boots. Cycle boots, maybe. Hundreds of kids on motorcycles wearing. Yeah. That's going to be about as helpful as a key or a cheap fountain pen. Huh? Excuse me. County Morgue, Tyson speaking. Yeah, all right, Frank. I'll tell him. Cunningham at R&I. I want to see you right away. What's up? They made the victim's prints. During the war years, a complete file of pictures and fingerprints had been kept on all persons employed at local defense plants. Out of this file came our first major lead. The victim's fingerprints matched those of one Maria Camacho, 38 years old, formerly employed at Universal Aircraft. Her address in 1945 was listed as 9230 Sheridan Avenue. Ben and I went over to the crime lab, picked up the key and the fountain pen found near the body, and drove to the Sheridan Avenue address. The house was three blocks from the churchyard where the body was found. A young woman with a baby in her arms answered the door. She identified herself as Elena Gomez. She told us Maria Camacho was her aunt. They were expecting her for Christmas dinner late that afternoon. We told her what happened. When she recovered from the shock, we questioned her and her husband, the furniture worker. So hard for me, please. Why anyone would do this to me? When's the last time you saw her, Mr. Gomez? Well, she was around last night, Sergeant. She brought the presents for the kids. Always brought them presents on Christmas. Did she live here? Was this her permanent address? No. She stayed with us during the war when Ray was overseas. When he came back, she took a room down the street. I can give you the address. All right. What time did Maria leave the house last night? Well, let's see. Must have been around 10 o'clock. Not much later. Don't you think, Elena? About 10 o'clock? Yeah, let's uh, go see what those kids are doing, huh, Ray? Yeah, yeah, all right. Did Maria have anything to drink here last night, Ms. Gomez? Yes, we she had a glass of sherry together, that's all. Could you tell if she'd been drinking before she came here? Well, it was Christmas Eve. I guess she'd had a few. Why? Was she a pretty heavy drinker? Not usually, no. Maybe on the holidays, though. We really like to get out and have fun living alone and all that. Poor Maria. Well, did she drink at home, or was there some particular place she'd like to go? A cantina down on Soda Street. She used to go there. Any others? A couple of bars on Brooklyn Avenue. I don't know the names. What did Maria do for a living, Miss Gomez? She took in some dressmaking. Worked for herself. She wasn't poor, wasn't rich. Her landlady could tell you about her friend. Kids are hungry, Lana. Dinner's getting cold. Sorry that we had to break in on you like this. Well, it's all right, Sergeant. It's just the kids. Ask the officers if they want some mint pie, Ray. Of course. No, no, no. That's all right, Miss Gomez. Thank you. Just one more thing. Would you look at these, please? This pen. Sure, that's Maria's. Look, Ray, Maria's pen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, how about this key? No, I never saw that before. Mm-mm, neither did I. Well... Thanks very much, both of you. Sorry to hold up your dinner. Oh, that's all right. I'm not hungry. Hey, maybe I could fix you a turkey sandwich. Or no, something. thank you, dear. No. The same we have to be going. We'll contact you later on. Here's our card. All right. I can't think of a reason, Sergeant. Why someone would kill her? Why would they kill Maria? Poor Maria. Come on, Maria. Come on. Come on. Nice kid. Gonna be having a good Christmas. Too bad we had to spoil it. We drove down the street to the rooming house where Maria Camacho stayed. We talked to the landlady and the rest of the tenants. We failed to come up with a lead. They told us Maria Camacho drank a little, but she was always pleasant, easy to get along with. We checked her room. We went through stacks of Spanish-language newspapers and magazines. We went through her bills, photographs, her letters. We found nothing. There wasn't an item in the small apartment that could help us. We went through the entire rooming house, trying each door with a key that we'd found for the body. It didn't fit any of them, not even the door to the victim's room. 
5 p.m. There was a lull in the rain. We picked up Dave and Claudio and started to explore the only lead we had. The victim had been drinking a few hours before she'd been murdered, probably at a neighborhood tavern. For the next six hours, we canvassed every bar in the vicinity. 11.15 p.m., Christmas night. The four of us met in a combination bar restaurant at Brooklyn and Soto for a bite to eat. You had as much luck as we did, huh? Nothing, Dave. Everybody we talked to knew the woman. Nobody saw her Christmas Eve. We picked up the names of a dozen friends of hers from the bartenders. Checked them out. They couldn't tell us anything. Well, we still got another dozen bars to cover at least. She must have been in one of them last night. Wish we'd find it. My wife's sure, man. You got company. So's mine. All right, gentlemen. Who had the grilled ham sandwich? I did. All right. And the three hamburgers? Yep. There we go. My plate... You got some ketchup, please? Sure. Uh, say, you wouldn't like a little eggnog to go with that. It's good. I make the batter myself. No, no, no. no, 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 no thank hey, there is something you can do for us. Yes, sir? Would you look at this picture? All right. See if you can identify this woman. She sure looks like Maria. Yeah, that's her. You know her? Was she in here last night, do you know? Yeah, she was. What time was she in? Oh, about 11, 11.30. Why? Was she with somebody? Oh, half a dozen of them, at least. Maria, another woman, and four or five men. Were they drinking? Well, they were well-behaved. Just had a little Christmas cheer, that's all. They liked my eggnog. At what time did Maria leave? Do you remember? Well, no, not exactly, but she left before the others. They closed the place. You fellas cops? Did she leave alone? No, Tony followed her out. I think it must have been sometime around midnight. I'm not sure. Who's Tony? Tony Perez. He's busboy here. He knows Maria. Where's he now? Christmas. He's off. Lives in a hotel down the street someplace. I don't know. Time fit. Maybe the key does. <laughs> Dave and Claudio started to check the neighborhood to locate the hotel where Tony Perez stayed. Ben and I continued our canvas of bars and restaurants in the area. 1 a.m., the rain started in again. We checked in at a bar on Brooklyn Avenue near Cornwall, the Cantina Sinaloa. Yes, sir, gentlemen? Police officers. Would you look at this picture, please, see if you can identify it? Wait till I dry my hands. I'm just getting some of these glasses out of the way. Let's see. Never see her before. Oh, yeah, that's Maria. Too bad. I read in the papers about it. Can you tell us if she was in here last night? No, I didn't see her. I read in the papers about it, though. Terrible. Poor Maria. Is it possible she might have been in you didn't see her? No, I always know when Maria's here. She was always full of fun. She liked to sing. I better get these glasses finished. Ben, you want to call the office? Yeah, okay. How about a drink, Sergeant? You don't look so good. You got any coffee? It's not very fresh. It's been standing there a couple of hours. Well, that's all right. Okay. Here. Here's the sugar. Hey, thank you. Yeah, that's not very warm, huh? Oh, that's okay. What do you think, officer? The guy was crazy? I don't know. Ah, he must have been crazy. Lots of nice rain. Let's go for the farmers. Yeah. Sure. You ever see this key before? Let's see. I don't know. Uh, Joe. Yeah. Dave and Claudio found the hotel that picked up Tony Perez. Took him in. What did he tell him? Dave says they're talking to him now. He won't say much. Did they find anything on him? He's wearing a pair of dark brown boots. Yeah. Well polished. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of skater Larry Jackson, one of the stars of the Los Angeles Ice Capades. This is his actual signed statement. When the excitement of the show is over, a mild cigarette is important for smoking enjoyment. I found Fatima the most enjoyable king-size cigarette because it's extra mild. I agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And so do more and more smokers every day. Actual figures show Extra Mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Extra Mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, 
superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Monday, December 26th, 9 a.m. We checked Tony Perez through R&I. He had a record of seven arrests, but no convictions. During the past year, he'd been booked on suspicion of 211 PC, assault with intent to do great bodily harm, and second-degree burglary. In each instance, he'd been released for a lack of evidence. All of his shoes and clothing were brought to the crime lab for examination. 9.25 a.m. We brought Perez back to the interrogation room. He admitted that he had been with Maria Camacho Christmas Eve, but he denied having anything to do with her killing. He told us that after he had left Maria, he'd gone to a party at some friend's house. Dave and Claudio went out to check his story. I gave them the key found near the body and asked them to try it on the door to Perez's hotel room. Ben and I continued to question the suspect. How well did you know Maria Camacho, Tony? I told you already. She was just some old crow who used to hang around the bars, that's all. I used to talk to her once in a while. You ever have any arguments with her? No. How many times are you going to ask me that? It would help a lot if you could tell us exactly where you left Maria Christmas Eve and when you left her. I told you already, I don't remember exactly. We were drinking, we were all drinking, I don't remember. How'd you get to that boy? I walked. Place down on Malabar Street. Maria stopped at a bar someplace along the way, and that's the last time I saw her. Did you go in with her? No, she went in alone. I went to the party. That's all I know. Interrogation room, Friday. Lee Jones, Joe. Yeah. Check the polish on Perez's boots. It matches with the smear of polish on the victim's face. Wax components are exactly the same. Good. How about the cast? Nope, they didn't match. The prints we cast out there were size 11, big heel. Perez wears a 9, pretty small heel. No match at all. What about the other stuff? Went over the rest of his shoes and his clothes. Nothing that ties in. Okay, Lee. Thank you. Do you shine your own boots, Tony? No. Why? Where do you get them shined? I go to Angelo's, Chicago Street, right near first. When's the last time you got a shine? Oh, Christmas Eve. What time Christmas Eve, Tony? When I got off work, about two in the afternoon. Hi. Hi, Dave. See one of you outside a minute? Yeah. Chris, telling the truth about the party. He was there. We timed out how long it would take him to walk from the restaurant to the party. Yeah. Pretty close. His friends say he got to the party about 12.30. Doesn't look like he had time to kill that woman. Well, where does that leave us? You still got those boots? No, no more. They don't match the impressions at the murder scene. Well, that makes us even, huh? Here's your key back. Didn't fit. Tony Perez was held for further investigation. Dave and Claudio took up the canvassing of bars in the same area where we had left off the night before. Ben and I drove down to Angelo's shine stand... It stood just outside a barber shop, four chairs with an awning full of cigarette holes over them. He identified Maria Camacho's picture immediately. We questioned him while he polished her shoes. Maria, I used to tell her, Sergeant, running around like that, she had so many friends, too many. Did you see Maria on Christmas Eve, Angelo? Christmas Eve? Let me see. No, no, last time was a few days before Christmas. Angelo, do you know a man by the name of Tony Perez? Tony? Sure. Tony Perez. Tall fella. Big shoulder. Is he one of your customers? Yeah, all the time he comes to see me. Was he here on Christmas Eve, Angelo? Yeah, yeah. He was here. I gave him a shine. Good customer. You remember what kind of shoes he had on? Sure. Boots. He always wears boots. What color were they, do you know? Brown. Always wears brown boots. Well, what's the matter? Tony in trouble? What kind of polish do you use on his boots, Angelo? Well, I got the can down here. Yeah, this one here. High-grade polish. If you've got boots, I can fix them up. Do you use the same polish on all the boots you shine, Angelo? No, only the brown boots. That's brown polish. You fellas ask too many questions. You make me go too slow. Well, there's no rush, Angelo. Can you tell me this? Yeah? Besides Tony Perez, was there anybody else with brown boots who got a shine from you Christmas Eve? Well, I don't know. Lots of people get shined. Christmas Eve is pretty busy. Just the people with brown boots, Angelo. Can you remember? 
No. No, no, I don't think so. Tony was the only one with the brown boots. There's no others. And how about heavy brown shoes? Huh? You remember the people with heavy brown shoes that came in for a shine? No, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. Look, please, just to let me shine your shoes, huh? Uh, that can of brown polish, Angelo, you say that's the kind you use on Tony Perez's booth? Yeah, that's the kind. This kind right here. Well, can you remember how many times you used that polish on Christmas Eve? Well, I opened this can that morning. You see how much is gone. Maybe I used it, oh, well, maybe half a dozen times. Can you remember the people whose shoes call for this kind of polish? Yeah, lots of them. Brown shoes. I know the feet when I see them. I don't know the faces. Don't you remember any of them? If they like the shine, maybe by and by they come back. They were three, four fellas, maybe. I see them before. I, I, I don't know their names. Ah, okay, finished. You like the shine? Oh, yeah, fine. Uh, see, I'm going to buy that can of polish from you, Angelo, and we're going to check back with you later. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Here, here it is. That's uh, fine polish, Sergeant. Best you can get. Yeah, but it rubs off. <laughs> December 26th, 5 p.m. We drove back to the crime lab and had Lee Jones analyze the can of shoe polish. It matched exactly with the particles of shoe polish taken from the victim's body and from the boots of Tony Perez. We arranged for a stakeout at Angelo's shine stand. In case the people with heavy brown shoes returned, Angelo could point them out immediately to the men on duty. 5.30 p.m. Dave and Claudio called in. They thought they had another nibble, this time from the bartender at the El Cidello Tavern, a bar on Soto Street. We drove down to South Main and Harlem Place for a meet. Hi, Dave. Hi. Figured we'd better move on this tonight. What's the pitch? Bartender on Soto tipped me that Maria Camacho was in his place Christmas Eve. Said it was a little after midnight. Yeah. Said she had a drink, left the place about ten minutes past twelve with a guy called Frank Talano. He nosed around, found his Talano works at the midnight mission. Over there. All right, let's go. This hit there? Yeah. Good friends, Mission. Come in for a nice, warm, spiritual bath. Coffee and soup free. Hey, watch the stairs. Yeah. Now, brothers, I only hope that our little meeting here has brought you closer, made your souls to glow with the great and glorious light of the spirit. And yes, brothers, if we be not born again of that light, as the book says, we'll be damned, brothers. Damn. Amen. 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 Now, brothers, while Sister Myrtle Ferguson plays one of his stirring marches, let's join arms, brother to brother, and march into the lunchroom where, through the kind graces of one of our benefactors, Pete Wodurus of the Acropolis Cafe, each one of you will be entitled to a bowl of turkey soup, some of Sister Wilson's homemade bread, and a cut of mince pie. Uh, Sister Ferguson, you march. <laughs> Guess that's the man to see. Yeah, let's go. Sure pack them in, don't they? That soup smells real good. Uh, excuse me, sir? Uh, yes, brother? What is it? Police officers. Do you have a Frank Delano working here? Well, what's the trouble? Does he work here? Well, yes, he's a very good man, Frank. Anything wrong? Is he here now? No, he is. Where can we find him? Well, I'd like to know what the trouble is. We'd like to talk to him, Mr. That's all. Well, he has a room at uh, Good Friends Mission Annex. That's over on San Pedro Street. Is that his permanent residence, the Mission Annex? Yes, Frank's very helpful. He works for a small salary, and we give him room and board. Is he over at the Annex now? Yeah, but uh, maybe you'd better not see him now, officer. Why not? Well, Frank's not at his best. He's been drinking again. That's a sure sign. How do you mean? Well, whenever Frank starts drinking, that means that he's worrying. He's one of those he drinks to forget. Yeah, he's been drinking for three days. You must have a lot to forget. Come on. 6.30 p.m. We drove over to the Good Friends Mission Annex on San Pedro Street. The man in charge told us that Tolano had a small room to himself at the rear of the second floor. Dave and Claudio went around to cover the Mission Annex from the back. Ben and I went up a narrow flight of wooden stairs. The plain white plaster walls were chipped and cracked and scrawled with pencil markings. We walked down to the end of a wide hallway to a brown panel door with a transom above it. There was a man in soiled work clothes sitting on the bed. On the table next to him, there were three quart wine bottles. Two of them were empty. Get out of here. You Frank Delano? What about it? Police officers like to talk to you. Get out of here. 
And not taking me, I'll cut you to pieces. Drop the bottle, Tolano. Get out of here. Drop the bottle. I'll cut you to pieces. Like you cut Maria. I'll kill you. Put it down, Tolano. Drop it. Get the cuffs on them. Yeah. Let's go. Just a minute. Protect the innocent. On March 7th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 94, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Frank Dominic Tolano was tried and convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. He is now serving his term in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Patty Page visits Jack Birch tomorrow morning on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, we suggest that you pay particular attention to an important announcement which will be given at the end of tonight's program. The story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to personnel division. A resident of your city files a report of robbery and assault. The suspect, a rookie police officer. Your job, arrest him. If you want a long cigarette... Smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, transcribed in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, April 9th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of personnel. 
My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Deputy Chief Holman, Commander BIA. My name's Friday. We're on the way over from the city hall, and it was 5.25 p.m. when we got to Central Division. The assembly room. Yeah, how's wife? See him, Joe? Yeah. It looks like him over there. Hi. Are you Russell Clark? Yeah, that's right. Friday and Romero, personnel. All right. Lieutenant Drummond over at BIA would like to talk to you. All right. When do you want to see me? Right now. Okay. All right, we're looking for the captain. Okay, let's go. What do they want to see me about, you know? Drummond will tell you. Okay. How long you been on the job, Clark? About two and a half months. How do you like it? Oh, I like it fine. Wife doesn't think much of it. She wanted me to stay at my old job. What was that? Selling insurance. I like to have me home nights. Doesn't like to be alone, especially now. Yeah? Well, she's expecting you a couple of months. You're not there yet. Yeah. That's close, yeah. Hey, I uh, put in a request for day work. You think that's why personnel wants to see me? I don't know. I don't think so. Boy, I'd sure like to get that day watch. Yeah. Is that the way you fellas started? I did, yeah. You started in traffic, didn't you, Ben? Yeah, uh huh. Had nine months, Ellie. Go ahead, Clark. No, thanks. I have to be on the job at six. Think it's going to take very long? I don't know. Hi, Friday. Hi. I'm right in, looking for waiting. Listen, Al Coleman. Lieutenant? Yeah, come in. This is Officer Clark, Lieutenant Drummond. How do you do, sir? Oh, hey, Clark. Sit down. Thanks. A couple of questions for you. Yes, sir. You were on special duty at the Olympic Auditorium last night, is that right? Yes, sir, for the fights. Anything unusual happen out there last night? Mm. Well, it wasn't very important, Lieutenant. Mm. After the fights, a drunk fell down the stairs on the way out of the auditorium, broke his arm. I took him to Georgia Street, and they took care of the arm, and I drove him home. He was pretty drunk. Why didn't you book the man? I, I didn't think it was necessary. How long have you been with the department, Clark? Two and a half months, sir. Didn't you know he should have been booked for violation of 4127A LAMC? Well, the man was in pretty bad shape, Lieutenant. Broken arm. I, I guess I didn't think the law was that strict. Law is there for a purpose. You decided to forget it, now you're in a mess. Right up to your neck. I don't understand. You remember the name of that drunk you took care of last night? Yes, sir. His name was Stacy. He lives out in West L.A. Well, what's the matter, Lieutenant? That drunk, Mr. Stacy, wants to file a complaint against you. What for? He claims you took him back at the auditorium, beat him up, broke his arm, and robbed him of $128. Oh, he's crazy. He's lying. I didn't do that. You got his word against yours, Clark. Facts seem to favor him. But I can prove it. Well, there, uh, there was at least a couple of dozen people around. There, there was a doctor, he can tell you. Maybe you better take it from the beginning, Clark. Exactly how did it happen? I was right after the fights. I was on duty in the lobby, and I saw a bunch of people crowding around the foot of the stairs. Yeah. I went over to see what the trouble was, and they were looking at this man lying on the pavement. Stacy, a doctor, was examining him. This doctor, did he identify himself? Yeah. I asked for his identification. He, he showed it to me. Gave me a card. He was a doctor, all right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, he told me that he'd seen Stacy fall down the stairs coming out of the auditorium. Said that Stacy had broken his left arm. What'd you do then? Well, the doc said it'd be okay to move him, so I helped him into my car and took him down to Georgia Street. He was so drunk he could hardly stand up. The attendants at Georgia Street took care of his arm. Well, they can tell you all about this. Maybe, but they can't help you out as witnesses. You could have beaten up Stacy, robbed him, then taken him to Georgia Street. But I didn't, Lieutenant. I tell you that Stacy's lying. What did you do when you left Georgia Street? Well, I drove into Central and told him what happened. I told the watch commander I was going to drive this Stacy home, and he warned me about it. Guess I should have known better, but... Well, I, I swear to you that Stacy's lying. You should have known better. Where'd you go after you left Central? Well, I drove him home. On the way, he said he was hungry, so I stopped. I bought him a sandwich and some black coffee. Kept telling me what a nag his wife was. Said he was afraid to go home. Go on. Well, when I got him to his place, his wife started chewing me out. I just said goodnight and left. That's it, huh? That's it. So help me, that's exactly what happened. Now, how about the doctor at the auditorium, the one who saw Stacy fall? Did you get his name and address? Well, no, no, Lieutenant, I didn't. I didn't think it was necessary. How about the crowd that was standing around? Did you spot anybody you know? No. No, no, I didn't. They're just a bunch of people coming out of the fights. Then you haven't got anyone to corroborate your story. But all those people saw it. There must have been a couple of dozen of them. What are their names? I, I don't know. All I know is I didn't beat him up and I didn't take his money. I tell you, the Stacy's lying. You could be lying. We got no proof either way. I'm not lying, Lieutenant. I didn't do it. 
We might believe you, Clark, and it doesn't make any difference. If this man files a 211 against you, it's got to be settled in court. But I, I didn't do it. I, I tell you, I swear I did. In just a minute. Mike, send in Mr. and Mrs. Stacy, will you? You can hear the story the way we get it from Stacy and his wife. I'd like to hear it. I, I don't know why he's doing this to me. I helped him all I could. Look, Jerry, there he is. That's the one. Yeah, that's him, Chief. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Stacy. What's this all about? Hold it, Clark. Mr. Stacy, would you repeat the same story you told us this morning, please? You know what I told you, Chief. You had the stenographer take it all down. It's the same thing. I'd like to have you repeat it in front of Officer Clark here. He's entitled to know what you're charging him with. A man like that's entitled to nothing. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Look, lady, your husband's lying. Don't call my husband a liar. You're not a policeman. You're a hoodlum. All right, wait a minute. I'd like to know what this city's coming to. Cops going around beating up private citizens. Who do we trust if we can't trust a policeman? Just a minute, please. You don't know, Captain. You should have seen my husband when that officer brought him home last night. Arm all bandaged, his face all cut up. He was hurt so bad he could hardly stand up. He was too drunk to stand up, lady. Don't you get fresh with me, man. All right, that's enough. This cop got hold of me as I was coming out of the fights. Took me in back of the auditorium. Told me if I didn't hand over my wallet, he'd book me on a drunk charge. Were you drunk, Stacy? I was not. Had a couple of beers, that's all. When I wouldn't give him my money, he beat me up. Broke my arm and took my wallet. How do men like you ever get on the police force? He figured he'd cover up, so he took me and had my arm fixed at the emergency hospital. Then he drove me home. Threatened me all the way. He said, you tell anybody about this and I'll get you. That's just what he said. I don't get it, Stacy. You know that story's a pack of lies. Why are you doing this to me? It's the truth. And I'm going to press charges and get my money back. $128. What have you done with it? We can take care of the question, Mrs. Stacy. I don't see you doing it. Make him tell. Where's our money? I haven't got it. Don't talk back to me. Mr. Stacy. You and your wife want to file a crime report at this time. We want to press charges. Romero? Yeah? Take Mr. and Mrs. Stacy down to the record bureau, have them make out a report for 211 and assault. All right. Get them this way, please. Now, listen. We're going to get action if we have to take this to the district attorney. We're not afraid of the publicity. We'll go to the newspaper if we don't get action. Yes, ma'am. What's it, Clark? They're lying. I, ca- I can't prove it. They're lying. Well, you can see the position it puts us in. If you're innocent, we'll do all we can. If you're guilty, we'll see you get everything that's coming to you. But they're lying. You know that. Not up to us. The court's going to have to decide. That's it. That's it. <laughs> no, there's no other way, Clark. we got 4,500 men in the department. We don't claim they're all saints. Once in a while, a bad cop comes along and pulls a caper, and all of us get a black eye. This book of rules is the only protection we got against that. By failing to enforce the law, you violated your duty as a police officer. Got yourself in a real mess, Clark. Like anybody else, you get a fair trial. Does that mean I'm dropped from the force? And those people have filed a crime report. Draw suspension pending the outcome of the case. After that, if you're cleared, there'll be a hearing before the Board of Rights. Right through right now? You'll be booked for robbery and assault and held in county jail. The case will be presented to the district attorney tomorrow. What can I do? I'll have to have your badge. On the desk. Your gun? Yeah. ID card? Yeah. On the desk? Yeah. All right, Joe, that's it. Okay. Take him. Six p.m. Ben returned to the office, and together we took rookie police officer Russell Clark across the street to the Hall of Justice. At the county jail booking desk on the 12th floor, he was booked on suspicion of 211 PC and assault with intent to do great bodily harm. He was lodged in the cell block. Investigating charges against a police officer involves exactly the same procedure as cases where private citizens are concerned. Prove the suspect innocent or guilty. That's the job. If Clark was innocent, it looked like there was only one way of proving it. That was somehow to find the unnamed doctor who was supposed to have seen Stacy fall down the auditorium stairs and then examined him afterward. If Clark was guilty, we had to find proof that his story about Stacy falling downstairs was a lie. Besides that, we had to find evidence that he beat up Stacy at the rear of the auditorium that night and that he robbed him of $128. Thursday, April 10th, Ben and I checked in for work at 7.45 a.m. and found a message from the jailer on the phone board. Clark wanted to see us right away. We met with him in the county jail, interview room. How you doing? Not too bad. Don't let it sour you, huh? Sergeant, 
You really think I rolled that character? Come on, tell me the truth. We checked you out. Good family. You got a fine army record. No, we don't think you did it. I just can't understand why he picked me out. I tried to help him all I could. Then he walks in the next day with a frame story like that. You got any idea why Stacy would pull something like this on you? I don't know. I'm worried, Sergeant. Believe me, I, I, I can't afford to sit here missing my pay. We, we live pretty close to the budget with a baby coming. I'm worried about the wife. I just don't know what to do. Are you sure you told us everything about this that you remember? Well, that's the one reason I wanted to see you. I didn't sleep much last night. I kept trying to remember the name of that doctor. Yeah? Well, I remember once he did mention his name, and then when I asked for his identification, he showed me one of his cards. Any idea what his name was? Well, I'm not sure, but as I remembered, it was some kind of a Swedish or Norwegian name, something like Johnson, Tollison, you know, something with a son on the end of it. It's on that card. That doesn't narrow it down too much. Where is it going? Well, I think I put his card in one of the pockets of my other uniform shirt. That's why I called you. I wonder if you could check that for me. It's at home. Sure. Where do you live? Out on Norwich Road, 411. It's right near the Coliseum. 411. Yeah. All right. We'll check it out for you. Just ask the wife, will you? Card should be in one of the pockets. Yeah, if you put it there. Ben and I left the interview room at the county jail and drove out to the home of Officer Clark on Norwich Road. We introduced ourselves to his wife and told her what we were after. Her eyes were red and looked like she'd been crying. She asked about her husband. We told her he was all right. They're making a terrible mistake, Sergeant. Russ never did anything crooked in his life. He didn't do it. I know he didn't. We'll do everything we can to straighten it out, Mrs. Clark. The court will have the final say. I knew Russ shouldn't have left his insurance job. I just knew it, all this trouble. How about that shirt that your husband told us about, the one he wore that night at the auditorium? Oh, yes, his other uniform shirt. Mm -hmm. Can we see it, please? Oh, yes, certainly. It's right this way, back in bed. What's so important about the shirt, Sergeant? Your husband told us that there might be a card in one of the pockets. Might help clear up things. Well, it should be hanging up here in the closet. I always like to keep Russ's shirts on hangers. He keeps them much nicer looking. What's the matter? This morning I sent it to the cleaners. Clark's wife, Ben, and I drove down to a dry cleaning shop a few blocks away where Mrs. Clark had left the shirt. The counter girl there told us that the truck had already been by that morning and picked up the day's cleaning. It was a store rule to check all garments for contents. She had found nothing. We got the address of the main plant, the Great Northern Dry Cleaners, a place down on Factory Street. 10.15 a.m., we checked in at the main plant and explained to the manager what we were after. We gave him the tag number of her cleaning, and Mrs. Clark gave him the description of the shirt. We waited in the manager's office while he made a search for the dark blue wool police shirt. How about this one, lady? It's the only blue wool shirt picked up at your cleaners this morning. Yes, that's Russ's shirt. That pocket flap there, I mended it. I'll check the pockets for you. I had to pull it out of the tank. It's all wet. Anything? Not in this pocket. Try the other one. Yeah? Look for yourself. Nothing. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette... It will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Northwest Airlines stewardess Jean Madsen. This is her actual signed statement. There's one thing I really look forward to after a long flight. A good, mild smoke. That's why I prefer the new king-size Fatima. It's milder than any other long cigarette I've tried. Yes, I agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And so do more and more smokers every day. Actual figures show extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer... Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. 
Thursday, April 10th. Shortly after noon, the daily newspapers were on the streets, and the head on one of the top front page stories read, Rookie Cop Slugs Rob Citizen. Ben and I went back to the county jail and told Clark that we'd failed to find the card. He could give us no other lead that might help in clearing the case. During the next two days that followed, Ben and I ran down every possible lead, no matter how remote it was. We made a thorough check on Mr. and Mrs. Stacy. We double-checked back on Clark's record. For one full day, we did nothing but phone doctors in and around the city of Los Angeles. From a list of hundreds, we came across three doctors who had been present at the fights in Olympic Auditorium on the night Stacy claimed he was beaten up and robbed by Officer Clark. None of the three had seen a man tumble down the stairway leading from the balcony to the lobby. None of them had seen any accident or had been called on to help anyone professionally. Monday, April 14th, we met with Lieutenant Ralph Drummond. No go, huh? Thanks, got us, Ralph. We can't figure. It's almost a fact Stacy's lying. Clark, what about him? Well, there's still nothing to show that he didn't do it. He had the opportunity, maybe he had a motive. He needs money, you know. Who doesn't? How much you get on Stacy? He and his wife run a secondhand furniture store in South Flower. It's a small business. Stacy's quite a gambler. He bets on the fights. Yeah? He checked around with some of the gang down at the auditorium. Stacy's well known down there. He laid some pretty heavy bets the night he claims Clark rolled him. How much? You got the dope there, Ben. How's it figure out? Well, he lost over seventy-five dollars in small amounts. Add to that the fact that he was doing some partying. That might account for the 128 this missing. Stacy blew the roll, was afraid to tell his wife, so he cooked up the story against Clark. Yeah, sure, maybe that could have been the way it happened. What do you got on the other side? Not much, Ralph. Couldn't dig up anything against Clark. I don't know, he doesn't seem like the type to pull something like that. Maybe not. You still can't prove he didn't do it. How about the papers? You have been plugging for witnesses? Yeah. There's the ad. Had it running in personals for four days now. Oh, thanks. All well, those saw men fall down the stairway... The auditorium. Please call Michigan 521-875. No, he's also. No. All the possible doctors in town have been checked out, too. How about the local medical magazines? Got an ad in there, Ralph. Nothing's happened. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing is sure. Something's got to happen. Newspapers are scorching the kid in the department along with him. A victim without a trial makes good reading in the tabloids. There's one thing I can't understand. If Clark's leveling and there was a doctor at the fights that might have looked at Stacy, then where's the doctor? We've had this thing noised all around town. Well, give it a little more time, he might turn up. I kind of like the Stacy angle. What do you mean? Well, suppose we get him in here. Think we could break him down into questioning? No, 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 I doubt that. We can't even get close to him. That wife of his and that lawyer, they're with him all the time. He's afraid to talk to us. Mm. Maybe if we pass the word to his wife, he'd been gambling. How far could we go on that? Well, she might believe us, she might not. You've seen what she's like. Yeah. I got an idea. He sold her on a story, and she's tagging along to get the $128 back. That gives me an idea, Joe. One thing we might have missed. Yeah, what's that? We found out that Stacy did a little partying before we went to the fights at the auditorium that night, didn't we? Yeah, go ahead. We checked out a couple of the bars he was drinking at, but we figured he must have parted away at least 50 out of that $128. Mm-hmm. He didn't spend that much at the bars. Oh, well, sure. He probably hit a few other places, too. That's what I mean. That's still a lot of money to drink up alone. You figure a woman? Maybe. You got any reason to think Stacy plays around? Just one. Yeah? His wife. Monday, 1 p.m. Ben and I started a canvas of bars and small nightclubs in the general area around the Olympic Auditorium. We started with those where Stacy was a regular customer. We failed to turn up any leads. Either the bartenders refused to tell us or they had no knowledge of Stacy's running around with other women. We kept at it. Another day passed. Two days. Nothing. One of the newspapers started a campaign against the brutality of police officers. On Thursday, we got a tip from a bartender at a place out on Washington Street, the Brown Cow. He told us that he thought he saw a man answering Stacy's description in his bar a few nights before with a flashy blonde in her late 20s. He said he didn't know Stacy too well, but he knew the girl, and he knew the hotel where she stayed. Her name was Sandra Gay, an acrobatic specialty dancer at the Cheap Nightclub. We checked out her hotel, but she wasn't in. We left word for her to get in touch with us, and then we picked up a hamburger and some potato salad for lunch and checked back in at the office. How you doing, Coleman? Not as good as you two. How you mean? Can't you smell a perfume? Hmm? It's off a blonde named Sandra Gay. She's waiting in the next room. Won't talk to anybody but you. (laughs) Thanks. Come on, Ben. Didn't waste much time, did she? Perfume. Sure strong. 
Your name, Sandra Gay? Yeah, Shai. You the fellas been looking for me? Drop by your hotel. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Sure, it's all right. This is my partner, Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. How you doing? Hello. Romero, huh? Kind of cute for a cop. What can I help you with? Do you know anybody by the name of Gerald Stacy, Miss Gay? Gerald, yeah, I hate that name. Do you know any man who calls himself that? No. I think that's a terrible name for a man, Gerald. The man we have in mind is pretty short, stocky build, dark hair, and he wears steel-rimmed glasses. Yeah, where's he hang out? Place out in Washington, the brown cow. Supposed to have been seen with you. Gerald Stacy. Oh, yeah, I think I know what you mean. Furniture business and runs a place near the brown cow. That's right, you know him? Oh, Pop, sure I know him. We get together once in a while, he's a kick. Pretty big spender? I mean, he's got it, yeah. Last time we went out, he was fine. He can kick it around when he wants to. <laughs> oh, Pops. When's the last time you were out with him, Miss Gay? Uh, maybe a week, two weeks ago. The Tuesday night, I think, yeah. Tuesday the 8th, is that about right? Yeah, it must have been it. Why, was it all about? Did you spend most of the evening with him? No, I had to get back to the club, do my act. He went on to the fights over at Olympia. I get it. Personnel, Friday. Is this Sergeant Friday? Yes, that's right. This is Dr. Samuelson talking, Sergeant. I've been out of town. I just got back this morning. I saw the ad in the paper. Yes, sir? I was at the fights that night, Sergeant. What did you want to know? Would you mind telling us, Doctor, did you see a man fall down one of the stairways to the lobby? Certainly. I was the one who examined him. Five PM. Mr. and Mrs. Stacy were called to Lieutenant Drummond's office. Arrangements were made to have Officer Russell Clark brought over from his cell in county jail. At five fifteen, Ben and I checked into the lieutenant's office. Stacy and his wife were already there. I'm certainly proud of our police department, Chief. No whitewashing this time. You gave that fellow exactly what he had coming. Thanks. You sure you didn't make a mistake? I'm sure, Chief. That's the right man. You got him. Jerry, don't make mistakes on things like this, Inspector. How about our money, the 128? He tell you where he hid it? No, he hasn't. We're bringing Officer Clark in from county jail. Figure we try to crack him. That's right. Make him tell what he did with our money. Joe, will you have Officer Clark brought in? By the way. All right. There he is. Where's our money? What have you done with it? Just a minute, please. Stacy, are you sure Officer Clark here is the man who beat you up and robbed you? Of course he is. Dragged me behind the auditorium and almost beat me to death. Broke my arm, took all my money. $128, where is it? I haven't got your money. Joe, bring the doctor in. I understand. In here, Doc. All right. Mr. Stacy, you're a liar. This officer didn't break your arm. I saw you fall down a flight of stairs at that auditorium and break your own arm. I examined it. Jerry, who is this man? What about it, Stacy? He doesn't know what he's talking about. I never saw him before in my life. No, but I've seen you, Stacy. You were drunk. I saw you fall down those stairs. You're crazy. Joe, send Miss Gay in. All right. All right, Miss Gay. Okay, thanks. Pure strong perfume. You recognize any of these people, Miss Gay? Hello, Pops. I don't know you. Don't you remember the perfume you give it to me? Who is this woman? Just a friend, honey. All right, Stacy. Now let's have it straight. It was all a mistake. I don't want to make trouble for anybody. It wasn't this cop's fault. I don't want to make any trouble. What about this woman? It was all a mistake. Believe you me. You took that money, Gerald. You spent it on her. Now, wait a minute. Causing all this trouble, squandering our money. After all I did for you, you're no good. This time I'm through. All right, Clark, let's go. Okay. Well, that's it. I don't know how to thank you, fellas. And doctor's the best friend you've got. Yeah. Yeah, I better call a wife she want to know. Friday, phone message for you here. Oh, thank you. From your wife, Clark. Yeah? She found that doctor's card. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 2nd, trial was held in Municipal Court, Division 7, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette... 
that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Gerald Stacy was tried on charges of filing a false crime report. He was convicted under Section 5250 LAMC and served his term as prescribed by law. Officer Russell Clark was returned to duty with full back pay. Ladies and gentlemen, in response to thousands of letters asking us to broadcast Dragnet at an earlier hour so that the entire family might hear it, we wish to announce that summer scheduling enables us to fulfill these requests. Beginning next Thursday, June 8th, Fatima Cigarettes will bring you Dragnet one half hour earlier over most of these stations. Consult your local newspaper for exact time. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Hear your favorite Jack Birch tomorrow on NBC. to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A woman has been shot to death. The apparent motive, robbery. The killer's still at large. Your job, find him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild to give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Friday, March 16th. It was damp in Los Angeles. We are working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 11.45 p.m. when we got to where we'd parked our car. Second in Maine. Couple of drops on the windshield. Yeah, I hope it holds off. I was thinking of going out to see the Cubs and Pirates play an exhibition game tomorrow. Guess maybe now I won't. You might be lucky. What's the weatherman say? I don't know. Get the radio off. Yeah. It's a slow night. Yeah. Uh-huh. Might not be tomorrow night. What? March 17th, isn't it? Oh, yeah. 
62A, Collier Station. All units in vicinity of 102 South Virgil, 211 and shooting, code 3. All units in vicinity of 102 South Virgil, 211 and shooting, code 3. Unit 13, take the call. Happy St. Patrick's Day. 11.58 p.m., we arrived at 102 South Virgil, the Bartlett Hotel, four-story building. Sergeant Scheimer met us in the lobby and informed us that the shooting took place at 11.40 p.m. in room 432, occupied by Mr. and Mrs. Theodore V. Benham. Mrs. Benham was the victim. We went up to the fourth floor where Officer McCready was stationed outside the room. Any witnesses? Only Benham says it was a thief. Did you talk to any of the people on this floor? None of them saw anything. They're all in their rooms. Any other way out of here? That stairway in the rear leads to the roof. I took a look. Nothing up there. Mm -hmm. Where's Benham? Across the hall, lying down. Cox is with him. Okay. Let's look at the body. We went into the room, a dreary place with a single light hanging from the center of the ceiling. The carpet was faded and worn in spots. On the north side were a closet and a bathroom. Against the east wall was a dresser. Across the room was a double bed, and at the foot of the bed, a window looking out over the roofs of adjoining buildings and the marquee of a movie house down the street. A steamer trunk was in the corner, and a straight-back chair was next to the door. The mirror of the dresser was smashed, and on the dresser, a Gideon Bible. On the bed was the body of a woman sprawled face down. There were several splotches of blood on her coat. In the chair was a 3220 revolver, which McCready said belonged to Benham, the husband of the murdered woman. We asked McCready to put in a call to the crime lab, and we went across the hall to question Benham. This is an awful shock. I'm not feeling well. I'm under doctor's care. Hemophilia. It's an awful shock. Sit down, please. Yes. I... I don't know what it'll do to me. I should be in the sanitarium right now. We'll see you taken care of. Lincoln Sanitarium in Eagle Rock. Could you tell us what happened tonight? Why, yes. We... My wife and I went out to the Sycamore Cafe over in Alvarado. What time was that? Oh, about 9.30. We had a couple of drinks and something to eat. And listened to a piano player, then came home. I unlocked the door and Elizabeth went in first, went over to the dresser. I just walked over to her when a man stepped out of the closet in back of us. He had a gun. Mm-hmm. Can you describe him? I don't know, I don't know. Did you see his face? No. He had a blue bandana over his face and he had a cap on, a blue and white check. Did you notice his clothes? No, no, I didn't. Anything else? He seemed very nervous, and he wasn't holding the gun still. My wife was opening her purse, and I said, well, I haven't got very much, but I'll give you what we have. And he fired and hit Elizabeth. I pulled my gun from my overcoat and started shooting. Are you in the habit of carrying a gun? No. No, no, I'd noticed suspicious-looking men follow me lately, so I bought one. Is uh, this the gun here? Yes. Then what happened? Well, I fired all the bullets I... Don't know how I missed. The room was small. He kept moving around all the time. Mm-hmm. But uh, I guess I did miss. Then he ran out of the room. But how old would you say this man was? Officer, I haven't the faintest idea. Uh, see you a minute, Sergeant. Sure. We'll be back, Mr. Benham. This has been an awful shock to me. I wonder how his wife felt. McCready told us that Sergeant Shimer had found a woman in the Nevada hotel next door who might know something. We went next door and questioned Mrs. Caroline Cromwell, a resident of the hotel. She occupied room 415 on the top floor. She told us that about 20 seconds after she heard the shots, she looked out the door of her room and saw a man come down the back stairs, which leads to the roof of the hotel, and enter room 402. She'd seen the man several times and was positive of her identification. Sergeant Scheimer said the man was registered as Jack Morrison. We went to room 402. Try it again. Police officer. What do you want? I'd like to ask a couple of questions. I was going to bed. We'd like to talk to you. Won't take very long. All right. What do you want to know? How long have you been in your room? About ten minutes. What? Where were you? To the movie. Which one? Right down the street. Why are you asking me all these questions? You been drinking? A little. Not much. Mind if we look around a little? I was out all the time. I didn't know nothing about a shooting. Then you won't mind if we look around. You won't find nothing here. These all the clothes you've got? Yeah. 
this your coat? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were wearing this tonight, were you? No. It's the only coat in the closet. What'd you do with the coat you were wearing? Guess I was wearing that one. Did you spill it? What? A bottle of whiskey. It broke. How? How do I know? You got a hole here in the sleeve. What'd you do with a broken bottle? Threw it away. Where? I don't know. On the street. Joe, I found something. A shirt. Stuck down between the wall and the bathtub. Looks like blood on it. Is this yours? Where's the shirt you wore tonight? Take off your pajama top. Why? Take it off. All right. But I didn't have nothing to do with that shooting next door. What happened to your arm? Guy shot at me. Who? I don't know. I bought a bottle and had a couple of drinks and went to the movie for a little while. Would you mind moving away from the bed, please? No, no. Thank you. I came out of the movie because I was getting dizzy. And I went up on the roof here to get some air. While I was standing there, a guy ran across the roof and shot at me. What did the man look like? I don't know. He came from the roof of the hotel next door and ran into this place. How big was he? It was dark. I couldn't see. What did you do? Well, after I was sure he was gone, I came down. I was going to have my arm fixed in the morning. Better get your clothes on. Why? Well, you got a pretty bad arm. You better have it fixed up. We'll take you to George Street Receiving Hospital. It's all right. I don't have to go there. Find right, anything, Ben? No. You got a clean shirt? No. Well, you better wear your pajama top then. Oh, here's something. What did you say your name is? Jack Morris. Here's a card I found in the closet. It says, Tommy Kane, report for work Joe's Cafe, 8 o'clock March 1st. Who's Tommy Kane? That's me. Where are you from? Elgin, Illinois. How old are you? I'm 22. Why'd you leave Elgin? No work. I've been bumming around. You ever been arrested? I was picked up on a vague charge a month ago. Here? Yeah. I don't know why you guys are bothering with me. When somebody gets shot, we bother. 1.30 a.m., we took King to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, where they found that a muscle in his upper right arm had been severed and the right side of his chest was bruised. Before taking him to Ward 1300 General Hospital for further treatment, we took him back to the roof of the Nevada Hotel. Still trying to rain. Yeah. Well, where were you standing when you got shot at, King? Right over there. I was leaning against the bricks. Where'd the man come from? Out of that door in the other roof. The roof of the Bartlett Hotel? Yeah. Was he running when he shot at you? Yeah, yeah, he was. Where'd he run? Right across here where we are. And then he went through this door here into the Nevada Hotel. Did you notice anything unusual about him? Well, his face was covered with a handkerchief and he wore a checkered cap. But you said before it was too dark. Well, I could see that. I mean, you know, I could see that. I couldn't see his face. And you were standing over there by the parapet? Yeah. Uh, about, uh, about, about here? Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get over the roof of the bar. It's a little high. Can I help you over? No. Come on, Ben. You ever been in this hotel before, Kane? No. Everything all right, McCray? Yeah. Crime lab's here. Checking the murder room. Ben, I'm awake. I think so. Mr. Benham? Yes? Mind if we come in? Of course not. You ever seen this man before? Let me see. Can you stand over there in the light? My eyes aren't as good as they used to be. Okay. Move over there. How's that? That's better. This the man who shot your wife? No, that's not the man. We left instructions for another car to take Theodore Benham to the Lincoln Sanitarium in Eagle Rock. We took Kane to Ward 1300 General Hospital. 2.42 a.m. We arrived back at the Bartlett Hotel where police chemist Ray Pinker had finished his examination. 
Three slugs, 38 caliber, and five slugs, 3220, were found in the mattress and the walls, all on the same side of the room. On the floor of the room were found a piece of white cloth and some brown threads. Ray Pinker returned to the crime lab while Ben and I made a search of both hotels, the incinerators, the alley, and all likely places for the missing 38. It was not found. 3.48 a.m., Ben went to the record bureau to check on any possible criminal record Kane might have had. I went to the crime lab to see what Ray Pinker had found. Yeah, nothing on this one. Must have been a clean mess. And yeah, nothing on these four thirty-two twenties. Mm-hmm. Where'd you find those? I dug the thirty-eight out of the window frame. Thirty-two twenties are in the south and east walls. How about the others here? Well, on these two thirty-eight slugs, I found minute portions of threads. They compare with the dress and coat worn of the deceased. Mm-hmm. Hi. Hey, Ben. I checked King's record. He told the truth. Nothing more than a vague charge, huh? Mm. How's this come? There's threads on two of the 38 slugs. And on one of the 3220s. Mm. Same kind of threads? Yeah, same kind. 3220, that's the gun Benham used. Yeah. Did you check the cloth yet? I uh, will right now. Benham must have been shooting awful while. Where'd you find that 3220 slug, Ray? On the floor near the bed. Nothing on any of the other 3220s. No. Yeah, this piece of cloth matches the shirt. How about the coat and those threads? Got only a couple of threads that might match. Let me have a coat. Yeah. We better have Benham take another look at Kane, huh? Yeah, I guess so. I could use a cup of coffee. How about you? As soon as we get finished. How about it, Ray? You better make it. Yeah, you match. Well, that's it, huh? Oh, one more thing. Yeah. Fresh stains on the carpet of that room. What kind? Whiskey. March 18th, we picked up Benham at Lincoln Sanitarium and drove him to the general hospital. Three times he asked us to stop someplace so he could have a drink. We told him he'd have to wait. We arrived at Ward 1300 at 1.40 p.m. and Kane was brought out. Take a good look, Mr. Benham. No, that isn't the man. I'm sure of it. All right, Kane, tie this handkerchief over your face. No, no, this way. That's right. Now put on this cap. Okay, now stand over there, please. Now a little further. That's good. All right, Mr. Ben. You know, his eyes and forehead look a little familiar, but I don't know. Oh, my nerves are all shot. I can't be positive. I'm a sick man. All right, Kane. Wish I could help you, boys. So do we. Come along, please. Yeah, you don't have to take me back to the sanitarium. Just take me to a streetcar. I'll make it all right. Good day, Kim. Sergeant. Yeah. Can I see you a minute? Sure. Yeah. Did you notice anything when you first brought Kane out of the ward? No. You must have been closing the door. Yeah, I was. And that man, Benham, he winked at him. listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Dick Hyland, sports columnist for one of the great Los Angeles newspapers. This is his actual signed statement. Do I smoke a lot when I'm reporting a close ball game? You bet I do. Do I still enjoy smoking when the game's over? Right again. Because I smoke a mild cigarette, Fatima. No other king-size cigarette tastes so good is as mild as Fatima. I agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And so do more and more smokers every day. Actual figures show extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos Superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. We took Benham back to his sanitarium. On the way, he asked if he could be excused from testifying at the inquest and preliminary hearing. 
We told him it couldn't be done. 7 p.m., Ben and I returned to the general hospital and took Kane into a small room adjoining the prison ward. After three hours of interrogation, he stuck to his story. Cigarette, Kane? Thanks. How's on? All right. Hurts a little now. When are you guys going home? When we get a straight story. I've been telling you all I know. Yeah, you've been telling us the same story for two days, but it doesn't hold water. What do you mean? How do you account for the fact that parts of your clothing were found in that room? I told you before, you must have made a mistake. No, no, it's no mistake. And Mr. Benham's starting to think he recognizes you. What? Why'd he wink at you? He didn't wink at me. We got somebody here who saw him. And he seems to think whoever did the shooting didn't take the gun with him. When we drove him back to the sanitarium, he asked us if we found it yet. He thinks we will. How long has Benham lived in L.A.? A long time. How long? Why do you want to know how long he's lived here? Is a dead woman really his wife? Well, certainly she's his wife. Why? Where's he been since the shooting? In the sanitarium in Eagle Rock. What's the matter with him? Hemophilia. You know what that is? No. You sure that was his wife? Positive. She wasn't a stool pigeon? Stool pigeon? Where'd you get that idea? You guys never saw her before? Never. You never heard of her? Kane, what's eating you? Did you check on her? We always do. You don't make mistakes on anything like that, do you? Not at all. Look, she was a pretty nice woman from all we could find out. Happily married for 30 years. Something's wrong. What, Kane? What's wrong? Whole setup. Yeah? Yeah. What did Benham say about me? We told you. He says you look a little bit like the man. Did you say anything else? He winked at you, Kane. Why? She wasn't a bad-looking woman. Wasn't she, Kane? All right, now how about it? You guys swear that was his wife? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you where the 38 is. Where? The mattress on the roof of the Nevada Hotel. Benham cut a hole in it that day. He told me to hide the gun there after the shooting. All right, let's have a look. I don't want anybody to know I'm telling you this. Why? Benham's a real smart guy. He's got a gang. He's in on it as much as I am. Yeah? He double-crossed me. He tried to kill me. I'm going to jail. He's going with me. Maybe he will. Kane told us that he had known Benham for about two months. During that time, Benham helped him along by giving him a couple of dollars every once in a while. On March 11th, Benham got Kane a room in the Nevada Hotel and gave him $20 to buy a gun, which Kane did. On March 15th, he gave Kane a blue bandana and a checkered cap. On March 16th, he told Kane that he'd been sent by a gang in Chicago to kill a woman who was a stool pigeon. He promised Kane $100 for his help. Early that evening, Benham told Kane how to enter their room and where to hide. When they came home, Benham stood by the door. Kane stepped out of the closet and, after a few words, shot the woman. As he moved toward the bed, Benham started shooting at him. Kane ran from the room and hid the gun in the mattress on the roof, then went to his room and flushed the cap and bandana down the drain. 11.15 p.m., Ben and I found the gun where Kane said it would be. 38 Special Detective, Colt Revolver, 2-inch barrel, number 381327. 11.52 p.m., we checked and found no evidence that Benham belong to any kind of a gang. March 19th, 9 a.m. Ben and I reported into homicide and picked up Captain Steed. We went over to Dr. Wagner to learn his autopsy report. It showed that the deceased had been shot three times. Two 38 slugs and one 20 were recovered from the victim's body. They were initialed for evidence. 8 p.m. Captain Steed, Ben and I went to the sanitarium and told Benham that there were a few angles we wanted to clear up before the inquest next morning. Benham got dressed and we drove back to the Bartlett Hotel. It was raining. I'm still trying to remember what happened. I was very shocked that night. Yeah, I suppose you were. Well, sometimes my memory comes back for a little bit. The red light? Yeah, I see. You know, the man who did the shooting knew you lived in room 432. And he knew you'd be gone that night. How do you suppose he figured that out? Well, I've been noticing that a lot of men have been following me. Suspicious looking men. I told that to Sergeant Friday, didn't I, Sergeant? Yeah, that's right. Must have been one of them. You ever give money to characters on the street so much they might follow you? Hey, that must be it. Many times I used to do that. I'd be nice to them. They'd try to make friends. Do you remember any of them? Yeah, yeah, I do. There was a uh, old man Dorsey and Jolly Swanson and a fellow named uh, Kane. Blaine. Kane? Yeah, that, that's it, Kane. There you are. There you are. Uh, the young man you took me to see in the hospital. I, I, I'm thinking, I believe that's Kane. Are you sure? Quite sure. He's the burglar. What makes you think he was a burglar? Well, what else would he be? 
He didn't rifle any of the drawers or steal anything, did he? He must have got there just before us. Did you have anything important there? I uh, yes, some insurance policies. And your wife? Yeah. How much? Oh, one policy for four thousand and two for twenty five hundred each. Who's the beneficiary? Why uh, I am. We took Benham up to room 432, where he got out the insurance policies on his wife and showed them to us. Then Captain Steed asked him to reenact the shooting. Benham acted as the killer. I played Benham, and Ben acted as his wife. Well, uh, the man was over here in the closet. My wife and I came in that door, and then my wife went over to the dresser. Oh, over here? Did you turn on the light? Oh, yeah, and then I closed the door and went over behind her. Like this? Oh, she was closer to the bed. Uh, Here? Yeah. Were you standing next to her? Yeah. Did you start to take off your coat? Well, I was just going to when this man stepped out of this closet here. How far? Oh, here. Yeah, yeah, right here. And then what? Well, he held the gun in his hand and asked how much money we had, and Elizabeth said we didn't have much. From here? Yeah, but but, but she turned around. Like this? Yeah, that's it. What happened then? Well, then I said I haven't got very much, but I'll give you what we have, and started shooting. Yeah, but you said before that your wife started looking in her purse. Uh, yeah, that's it. She did. I forgot. And that made him think she was going after a gun. How do you know? Well, I, I suppose that's what he thought. He shot and Elizabeth fell on the bed. I pulled out my gun and started shooting and the man ran out the door and that's all. That's exactly what happened, huh? Just as I remember it. Will I help you? Not very much. What's the matter? Well, if you were standing where I am, there'd be bullet holes on uh, that side of the room there, wouldn't it? They're all on this side. I see. I, I got it. Uh, come with me. Where are you going? Uh, on the roof. What for? I want to show you something. Uh, it's raining. There are two umbrellas in the closet. I'll get them. Why do you want to go up there? I, I think I know where that gun might be hidden. I bet it's there. Here, you take this umbrella. Thanks. We'll take this one, Captain. Let's go. But it's up there. We'll find it. Hey, you got your flashlight, Ben? Yeah. Should be around here somewhere. What? The mattress. My wife used to take sun baths on it. Where would it be? Well, just about here. I don't see any. You sure it's up here? I bet it's on the next roof. Didn't you say Kane lived in that hotel? He probably moved it. Hey. Flash your light over there behind that elevator shaft. There? Yeah, there. You see it? We have to climb over this parapet to get on the other roof. Watch it, Captain. It's pretty slippery. Oh. Okay. Man, it is slippery. This mattress here? That's it. Take a look, Joe. Right. No, nothing here. Did you look all around there? Did you look in the corners? No. Well, that'd be a good place to hide a gun, don't you think? Hey, let me see. Might be a hole cut in one of them. No, maybe the other corner. No. Well, maybe this one. Yeah, you see, the mattress has been cut. No. No, it's... It's got to be here. Where is it? It's, it's here, I tell you. It's here. I know it's here. I'll find it. I'll find it. You wait. You'll see. I'll get it. I know it's here. I'll find it. You wait, I'll get it. I'll get it. You're getting wet, Joe. We got the 38. Kane told us about it. You ready to talk? Yeah. The insurance. That why you did it? Yeah. I'm a sick man. Let's go, Benham. On your feet. All right. They played that ball game the other day. Yeah? 
to one. Pirates, eight to seven. Sure do like baseball. Must be a real nice business. Yeah. Fans only yell if they never do it. What's that? Kill the umpire. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 89, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Thomas Kane was convicted of second-degree murder and received a term as prescribed by law. Theodore V. Benham was convicted of first-degree murder and assault with a deadly weapon. He received a life sentence and died in prison one year later. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, one year ago tonight, through the facilities of your local national broadcasting company station... We were privileged to enjoy your attention at the premiere broadcast of a new series of authentic documented dramas entitled Dragnet. This evening, on the occasion of our first anniversary as weekly guests in your home, the cast, technicians, and producers of Dragnet wish to state publicly that our indebtedness is enormous. For the degree of success which Dragnet has achieved during the past year, our first and greatest obligation is to you, our weekly listeners for your support, for your many kind letters of encouragement, criticism, and appraisal. If Dragnet is a proven success, then you have made it so. Behind the scenes, we have many more people to thank. Our engineers, our sound technicians, our cast. To the radio editors and columnists across the nation, also a sincere thank you for your judgment of our efforts. Additionally, claims on our thanks are held by the Los Angeles Police Department, for the National Broadcasting Company, and the Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company, makers of Fatima cigarettes. To all of these, and to you, our gratitude. Here at the starting point of Dragnet's second year of broadcasting, our wish is twofold. First, that we may enjoy your continued support. Secondly, that we may deserve that support. Thank you. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. Scores of lone women have been beaten and robbed. The victims have been unable to identify the criminals. Your job, get them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest... Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. 
That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, July 1st. It was mild in Los Angeles. You're working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Walker, captain of robbery. My name's Friday. It was 9.27 p.m. when I left the phone booth at the Sunset Drive-In and got to our car. 80K. Anything new? 8 code 7. Oh, captain Walker's wife had her baby. Boy, 8 pounds. Oh, that's well. She all right? Yeah, so does the captain. Look at the uniform on the waitress coming. Yeah, they sure dress them up, don't they? Good evening. Hi, Daisy. Oh, hello. Didn't recognize you. What do you have, the usual? No, I think I'll have something else besides a hamburger this time. Here's the menu. Take your choice. Hey, thank you. Well, I'm kind of hungry. Maybe I'll take a meal. Mm-hmm. 42R, 816 West Hoover. Fried shrimp's good. Where's that? Mm, right there. Oh, yeah. 95 cents. What's all this stuff I've been reading in the paper? Hmm? What's that? A couple of guys going around snatching purses and beating up women. The paper says it's happened seven times in the last two weeks. Roast beef, 90 cents. Roast beef's good, too. Don't you know who's been doing it? No, not yet. What do you get with these liver and onions, Dave? Same as with everything else. Soup, potatoes, and coffee. 85 cents. Why don't they just take the purse? Why do they have to beat up the women? We don't know. Well, there's headlines staring me in the face every time I open a paper. I'm getting afraid to walk home at night. Do you get coffee and dessert with the Salisbury steak? Yeah. 65 cents. 72T, Roger on your call. Say, do you guys know what I've been talking about? Yeah, Daisy, we know. I'll take the Salisbury steak. Yeah, so will I. Hamburger special, on two. Well done on mine, please. Burn. Okay. Be a couple of minutes. Thanks. All units in the vicinity of 1016 North McCadden. That's us. Get it 484 up. P.S. and slugging. Mm. Code three. <laughs> All units in the vicinity of 1016 North McCadden, 484 PS, and slugging code 3. 61F, take the call. Okay. I'll let her know we're going. Okay. I'll be right there. No, we're leaving. We'll be back. Okay. You know, I've been wondering. What's that? Hamburger and Salisbury steak, what's the difference? Price. officer, the lowest thief and most cowardly is the purse snatcher who preys on women. For more than a month, lone women throughout the western section of the city have been robbed and beaten. The descriptions were confused and varied because the attacks took place at night. 10.06 p.m. We got to the location on North McCadden where the woman was lying on the sidewalk. She'd been badly beaten about the face and neck and her jaw had been broken. Officers Reed and Shell of Unit 61F were already there. Any witnesses, officer? Yeah, this man in the sweater here saw it happen. Says the victim's name's Swanson. This is Mr. Kahn. How do you do? This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. I wonder if we could talk to you, please. Yeah, certainly. Do you want to come into the house? Right over here will be all right. That officer there says that you saw it happen. That's right. I was watching television. I heard this scream outside. I looked out and saw these two men beating her up. Can you describe it? Well, the light it wasn't real good. Right, me... They're about as tall as you two, but they had slighter bills. How old were they? Could you see that? I'd say they were young, maybe 18, 19. I I saw them knock her down. It was terrible. They hit her, and then they kicked her. Uh, They picked up the purse and and, and, and ran down that way. And you called the police? Uh, Yes, but not right away. I I ran out and and saw them get in their car across the street. They drove right past me. Then they turned east there on on Romaine. Can you describe the car for us? I got the license number for you. The last three numbers were 552. Just three numbers? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Can you describe the car? What kind was it? Oh, I don't know. It was new. I think it was black. Maybe a sedan. Well, was it a large car or a small one? Oh, kind of medium. Did you notice the back of it? Yeah, that's where I saw the license plate. No, I mean, did you notice anything about the car? Maybe a dent on the fender or a sticker on the window? No, I didn't look at the window. 
Did the car have a spotlight or a radio antenna? Well, I guess I didn't see any. I was trying to look at the license plates. Did you notice anything unusual about the car? Any, any identifying marks at all? No, no, I didn't notice. How about the make of the car? Did you see what kind of one? No, the last three numbers on the license plate were 552. California license plate? Uh, yes, it was. Now, that should be enough here. Do you think you'll catch them tonight? Do you know how many plates end in 552? While Ben called in a general description of the car and the two attackers, I talked to the other bystanders. I found out that the victim's name was Mrs. Frida K. Swanson, a widow. She had a room at 1003 North McCadden. None of the neighbors had seen the robbery or the beating take place. 11.28 p.m., Ben and I arrived at Hollywood Receiving Hospital to interview Mrs. Swanson, but she was unable to talk or to identify her attackers. She wrote on a piece of paper that she'd been slugged from behind. She never got a good look at the man. Besides a broken jaw, she was suffering from a fractured wrist, a broken nose, and bruises about the face and body. Tuesday, July 2nd, the getaway car used in the attack on the previous night was found abandoned on Hollywood Boulevard and proved to be a stolen car. License number 6 Young 4552. The victim's empty purse was found inside. Routine investigation developed no leads. We met with Captain Walker. Because the last four attacks had taken place within a six-block radius, we set up a plan of decoys in an attempt to trap the two purse snatchers. Four policewomen from Juvenile Bureau and a special detail from Metropolitan Division were assigned. Tuesday, 4 p.m., a special detail was ordered to the squad room for briefing. Hello, Joe. Oh, hiya, Dorothy. How's your tuxedo back in mothballs? Yeah, how are your feet? My feet, nothing the matter with them. You're a good dancer. Yeah, I bet I could use some lessons. Oh, you don't need lessons, Joe. You need practice. Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> I don't have to tell you the risks involved in an operation like this. I want all of you to know where everybody will be at any given time. By all of you, I mean the police women and also the men who will be in the squad cars. If anybody misses anything, stop me. We don't have much of a description of the men we're after. There are two of them, both about 18 years old. Usually they wear sneakers, slacks, and sport coats. They've been in different kinds of cars, all of them stolen. We keep each car for a few days and ditch it. Uh, pull down the map, will you, Joe? Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, here's the area here. Residential, 90% of the dwellings have garages, so if a car is parked on the street, it might be unusual. Each of you will be given a list of cars stolen in the last 48 hours, still outstanding. I want you to check all parked cars against the hot sheet. Oh, uh, first hold up your purses, please. <coughs> Young lady, that purse is too small, I'm afraid. Let's make it look worthwhile. Yes, sir. All right. Of course, you won't be carrying your guns in your purse. You wear a shoulder holster. Before you leave, Sergeant Friday will pass out some marked bills I want you to carry. Okay, now, Policewoman Short... You'll board a westbound streetcar at Western and Santa Monica Boulevard at, uh, at 9.03 p.m. Don't worry about these schedules. The streetcar will be there. Okay. Get off at Las Palmas at 9.13. Walk south to Willoughby. Turn east on Willoughby to Hudson and north one block to Romaine. You go west on Romaine to Coenga and then retrace your steps to the starting point and you're through. Got it? Yes, sir. You'll be covered by Unit 81K. Captain. Yep. How fast or slow should we walk? Oh, I'd say a pretty good pace. No woman likes to be alone on the streets at night, so it'd be natural. Yes, sir. Policewoman Ball. Yes, sir. You'll board an eastbound bus at La Brea and Melrose at uh, 9.35 p.m. Okay. You get off at Wilcox and Melrose at 9.45. Walk north on Wilcox to Waring. Turn west on Waring for two blocks. Then north on Cherokee. Follow Cherokee for two blocks, turn east on Romaine. Mm. Follow Romaine to Cole, and turn north on Cole. When you get to Santa Monica Boulevard, retrace your steps to your starting point. You'll be covered by Unit 87K. Will the cars be cruising, or will they be parked? Both. Friday and Romero will be cruising all the time. I'll get to the others when I finish with these instructions. Of course, if you see any police car, give no recognition. Yes, sir. Captain. Yeah? You said the two suspects wear sneakers? That's right. It's going to be pretty hard to hear them come up behind you. I'd say so. Did any of the victims hear them? If they had, they wouldn't be victims. Nine p.m. The decoy plan went into effect. We waited. Tuesday night passed. Nothing happened. Wednesday night, nothing. 
Thursday, July 4th, the decoy plan was enlarged to include a larger area, but everything was quiet. Friday, July 5th, Captain Walker decided that the new plan covering an area from La Brea to Vine Street and from Sunset to Beverly would be kept in operation. 10.45 p.m., Ben and I cruised the exposed area. We've been thinking about moving to a new place. Yeah? Only trouble is we don't know what's going to happen. You mean if rent control goes off? Yeah. We don't know if rents will go up or down. He's got a lease on it. Unit 71, next month. on in Mariposa, 507 party. We don't know what to do. We even tossed a coin to decide. Well, that's about as good a way as any. Coin came up tails four times in a row. Yeah? Wife changed her mind on each toss. No decision. Roger, 71R. Got a policewoman down there? Yeah. Nancy Short. You got her out there? Uh, south on Hudson, east on Melrose, then up Wilcox to Sunset. All units, Willoughby and Hudson, 484 BS and slugging code 3. That's us. Let's roll on it. 83F, Willoughby and Hudson, 484 BS and slugging code 3. We drove to Willoughby and Hudson, just south of the corner, and saw a woman sitting on the grass with a few people around. She was a young woman, about 25. Her clothes had been torn, and there was a red welt on her right cheekbone. She was trying to get to her feet as we came up. There'll be an ambulance here in a few minutes, miss. Can you tell us how it happened? It's my cheek swelling. Did you see who attacked Yes, you? I did. I can tell you about them. Look, here, I ripped off one of their pockets. These cards fell off. Mm-hmm. Mm, driver's license. George Landon. Here's the piece of cloth I tore off his pocket. I'll take that, ma'am. Thank you. You want to stay with her? I'll see if I can get a make on this license. You're okay. Oh, would you give me your name, please? Barbara Curtis. I live over on Hudson. 80K to control one. 80K to control one. Go ahead, 80K. Check suspect for making warrants. George Landon, male, white, age 18, 5 feet 9 inches, 155 pounds, blue eyes, black hair. Address, 27, 22 and a half, Arthur Avenue. KMA 367. Roger, 80K. I just want to I'm going to be robbed by a couple of young women. Did you see the car? Yes, I saw it. White sidewall tires. It was a club coupe. I tried to see the license plate. I couldn't make it out. What color was the car? I don't know. Dark green, I think. I'm so mad I could boil. Can you describe the man? Well, you got the driver's license. It's all there. Well, that's just for one of them, miss. You said there were two men. I don't know. I grabbed one of their coats, and the other one hit me. Mm-hmm. The thing I'm so mad about is I tried to scream and nothing had come out. I understand. Hi. Hi. You're the 63F. We got the call. That's fine. This is the victim, Miss Curtis. If you'll handle the report and see that she gets home, we got a lead to check out here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Control 1 to 80K. Control Don't you call back, Joe? Right, we better get it. Come on. Right with you. Uh, 80K to Control 1. Go ahead. 80K. Suspect has misdemeanor and felony record. One arrest, suspicion of robbery, and one arrest, GTA. No wants at this time. Most recent address on suspect, 27, 22 and one half, Arthur Avenue. Roger. Been in trouble before, felony and misdemeanor. Yep. And the address matches. Maybe this cloth does. listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of beautiful aviatrix Bab Beckwith, one of the few women who holds a commercial instructor's rating for single-engine land and sea aircraft. This is her actual signed statement. I've been smoking long cigarettes for quite some time. Recently, a friend told me about a really mild king-size cigarette, Fatima. I'm very glad I tried them. Fatimas are a lot milder than any of the others I've smoked and have a much better flavor. I agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And so do more and more smokers every day. Actual figures show extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Friday. 
Friday, 11 p.m., Ben and I drove to 2722 and a half Arthur Avenue. It was a small house at the rear of a lot on the east end of town. Alongside the front house, there was a narrow passageway leading to the house in the back with a small lawn between the two. There was no alley, and anybody leaving from the front or back door had to go through the narrow passage. As we approached the house, a light was on in the front room, and through the window we could see a middle-aged woman reading a magazine. We rang the bell. Yes? Police officers. Does George Landon live here? Why, yes, he does. I'm his aunt, Miss Landon. What do you want? Can we come in? Why, yes. Thank you. Won't you sit down? Thank you, ma'am. Is George Landon at home now? No, he isn't, but I think he'll be home soon. He never stays out late. He isn't in any trouble, is he? Do you know where he is? With his friends, I suppose. He's a popular boy. He really should be home soon. Where has he been, Miss Lynn? I don't know. He goes out at night, you know, with his friends. Who are they? Well, I really don't know. You see, it's difficult to keep track of a young boy. Mm-hmm. He's a big boy, and he's full of vitality. He has to find things to do. Yes, ma'am. He lives here with me. I'm his aunt. I'm not married, so I take care of him. His parents died when he was a baby. I see. Does George work, or does he go to school? Oh, he's finished school. You aren't here about that automobile that was stolen a year ago, are you? No, ma'am. Oh, he had some trouble then, but I'm sure he didn't do it. Since then, he's been very good. He hasn't missed a day's work, and he goes to church with me any time I ask him. Where does he spend his evenings, do you know? Well, I told you, with his friends. A young man has to use up his energy. I don't try to hold him too tightly. Good boy like him. Can we look at his room? Oh, yes. yes it's right here. All right. I'll show you how neat he keeps it. Now, there. Isn't that nice? Yes, ma'am. I'm not trying to defend him. I'm only telling you about him. He keeps this room cleaned up himself. He smokes a little, but I've never smelled a drop of liquor on his breath. He's a very good boy. Yes, ma'am. He even reads a lot. You, you can see his books over here. Mm, yes, ma'am. You mind if we look around a little? No. No, that's all right. Should be home soon. He's probably at a movie. Do you want to wait for him? No, I won't be necessary. He's always home by midnight. I'll tell him you were here. Oh, that must be George now. George! Yeah? These men would like to talk to you. They're police officers. All right, take it easy, young fellow. Well, let go. Hold him. Turn him around. Yep. <laughs> Stand still, young fellow. No, it's no gun. What do you guys think you're doing? I didn't do anything. I was just out for a ride. This your nephew? Yes. Coat's torn, Joe. Pocket ripped off. Is this your driver's license here, George? Yeah. I lost it. When? Last week. It was found tonight. So what? How'd you tear your coat? Getting out of the car the other night. Here's a piece of cloth. The girl who was attacked tonight gave it to us. It matches the tear there in your coat. What have you done, George? Tell her. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it any time. He talked me into it. Who talked you into he it? He made me do it. He's got a gun and he stole the cars. He made all the plans. Who made all the plans? Well, Tommy, oh, we never did anything except hang out at the drugstore until that time a year ago. What's his last name? He said that it'll always be held against me and I better go along with him. Tommy who? Decker. Was he with you tonight? Yeah, he's the one that hit her when she grabbed hold of me. He's the one that always hit him. I never wanted him to do it. Mm -hmm. Where's the stuff you took out of that purse? Well, Tommy's going to hide it. Where? Back of where he works. Where's that? Oh, garage someplace. I don't know where. He just started working there. Where does he live? Place on West 6th. I've never been there. What does this Decker look like? Well, he's the same age I am, but about an inch taller and must be 15 pounds heavier. He's got dark hair. How's he dressed? Just like me. Sneakers and brown slacks and a tan sport coat. Better call the office, Ben. Yeah. Can I use your telephone, ma'am? Oh, it's in the hall behind the door. Thank you. You said Decker's got a gun? Yeah. Officer, will you tell me the truth? I'll try, ma'am. 
Are George and this Tommy Decker the two men the papers have been writing about? I'm afraid so. The ones who've been robbing the women? Yes, ma'am. And beating them up? Yeah. I didn't mean it. I didn't know what I was doing. I raised you, George. I didn't either. Eleven forty two PM. We checked into the office with the eighteen year old suspect George Landon. While Ben and a police stenographer took down the statement, I went down to R and I and pulled a package on the other suspect, Thomas Decker. His mama sheet showed a petition had been filed on four fifty nine PC and four eighty eight PC. They also showed three different recent addresses for Decker. One on West 6th Street, one on South Mariposa, and a third on North Catalina. Two units were dispatched to the first two addresses. Ben and I went to the address on North Catalina, a rooming house. We learned from Decker's landlady that he was working as an apprentice mechanic on the swing shift at a large garage on South Flower Street. 12.51 a.m., Ben and I arrived at the garage. I beg your pardon. Yes? Police officer, does Thomas Decker work here? Yeah, he works here. Thank you. Here you are. You with Thomas Decker? Yeah? Police officers like to talk to you. Watch it, Joe. <gasps> Come on. Hey, he's going in the locker room. All right. It's locked. Come on, hit it. Yeah. No go. Hey, you. You over there. Any yeah. other way out of this locker room? Yeah, down the hall in the end. Come on, Ben. All right, you... Here we are. Yeah. Watch it! Came from behind that car, back by the door. All right, cover me. All right, Ben, give it back to him. Give up. Throw your gun out! Throw it out! Here it is! Don't shoot! All right, now, come on out. Hands behind your head. I'll get the gun. All right, you turn around. Lousy! Watch it, Joe, watch it! Hey, get in the way! Head him off downstairs. No! There he goes! Head yeah, him up! Let him go! Let him go! Let go! All right. All right, get the cuffs on him, Ben. Yeah, you yeah. yeah. 18 years old. What's it prove? I don't know. Sometimes you kind of wonder if it's true. What's that? There's no such thing as a bad boy. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. On November 1st, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Thomas Decker and George Landon were tried and convicted on five counts of grand theft person, five counts of grand theft auto, and five counts of assault with intent to do great bodily harm. They were sentenced to the state penitentiary for a term as prescribed by law and are now serving their sentence. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief of Police W.A. Wharton speaking from his office in City Hall, Los Angeles, California. As Chief of Police of the City of Los Angeles, I wish to extend my heartiest congratulations to the program Dragnet on the occasion of its first anniversary. The overwhelming success of this program, as indicated by the hundreds 
of commendatory letters, telegrams, and personal comments, I feel has been due to the splendid job of portraying police officers and their work. The American public, by its enthusiastic acceptance of Dragnet, has indicated a desire for factual police programs. The Los Angeles Police Department is proud to contribute to the constructive entertainment of both adults and children through this medium. May I extend my best wishes to the National Broadcasting Company, the sponsor, the actors, the writer, and the producer of Dragnet. And I trust there will be many more years of continued success for this program. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, a great new show, Sarah's Private Caper on NBC. change to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. The owner of a fur store has been shot and killed. Your only lead, a missing fur coat. The killer is at large. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, November 23rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. Boss is Blaine Steed, captain of homicide. My name's Friday. It was 6.35 p.m. and we got to the corner of Western and Lexington. The Western Fur Shop. Hi, Brennan. Hi. What happened, Frank? The owner's been shot. His name's Albert Kreiber. Yeah. Who is that? Mrs. Kreiber. Haven't been able to get anything out of her. Where's the body? In the back. Munkers is back there. Did you call the lab? Yeah. Jones on his way. Photographer and fingerprint men with him. All right, let's take a look. Nothing seems to be messed up. Back room is. It was a small shop. A couple of fur coats on dummies on one side of the store, and on the other, a tall glass case holding about 15 more. Mrs. Kreiber sat on a straight back chair staring at the floor. We went through the curtains into the back room of the store. Sprawled out on the floor at the far end of the room was the body of a man. He had a fur coat gripped in one hand. Sergeant Munkries from Hollywood Division was standing by. What do you figure, Mo? Looks like a couple of hours. Did you call the coroner? Yeah. How long you been here, Monk? Just a couple of minutes. You think Mrs. Kreiber moved anything here? I don't think so. She was sitting in that chair when we got here. I don't think she's moved except to call in. Did she put in the call? Yeah. Empty shells are on the floor. 
Oh, you got a pencil? Uh, yeah. Yeah, 32. Yeah. You think robbery? I don't know. Let's talk to the wife. Wait a minute. This bottle here. Yeah. Sierra Valley Wine Company. World's finest muscatel. 27 cents a pint. Nobody touched this today. No, well, I've been here, no. Okay. Let's get out front. Anything in the customer files, Brennan? Not so far. Have you tried to talk to Miss Kreiber again? No, pretty bad. No, let's give it a try. Miss Kreiber? I'm Sergeant Friday. This is Sergeant Romero. We'd like to talk to you if we could. We know how you must feel, but there are a few questions that we have to ask you. Did you telephone the police? We have to know how it happened, Miss Kreiber. Miss Kreiber? Can you tell us what happened? Uh, who, who is it? What do you want? We're police officers. Oh, Albert. Albert's dead. Albert! Albert! Someone call the police? Miss Grabber, we are the police. My husband's been murdered. He's dead. <laughs> we better leave her. Yeah. Friday, hmm? here's something I found in the customer file. Mm hmm. Miss Terry Shepard, 10113 Normandy, apartment 3. What about it? She took a coat out that was in storage. Took it out today. Well, we'll check her out when we're finished here. Thanks. Looks like the only hot receipt in the file. Mm -hmm. Hi, Lee. Joe, again? In the back room. What is it? Killing. Mercury's will show you. Okay. Let's look. Think we ought to try the wife again? We can try. <laughs> Miss Kreiber, can we do anything for you? Oh, I'm a little better. I... I'll try to tell you what I can. All right. When did you get here? It must have been about six o'clock, a few minutes after. I came to take him home. Any customers around? No, the store was empty. I stood here for a few minutes waiting, and then I went in the back and... <laughs> yes, I so... Is the front door open? No. Yes. The front door? Yes, ma'am, the front. Yes, open. Did you telephone the police? I, I think I did. Did you come here to pick him up? No. No, usually he drives home himself. I came down on the streetcar to ride home with him. What kind of a car do you have? An Oldsmobile. 1939 or 40, I guess it is. Huh? Where does he usually park? In the rear of the store, this little place. But... I'll take a look. All right. Where is your home? 3412 Northwestern. I thought there was something wrong when I... I got a telegram from him. He said not to come down tonight. He said he'd be home late. What time was that? About four o'clock. Oh, I, I'm all mixed up. I, I haven't told it to you as I remember it. First, yes, at first I telephoned here to the shop. That was this afternoon? Yes, 3.30. I'm sure of that because I, I made some other calls. I spoke to Albert. He didn't say he was going to be late. Then at 4 o'clock, I received the telegram. Do you have that with you? Yes, it's in my purse somewhere. 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 Oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Don't come down. I won't be home until late. I have to see a customer, Albert. Can I keep this? We'll return it to you. Yes. What'd you do after you got this wire, Miss Kramer? Well, well nothing. I... 
I thought it was strange, but I didn't think too much about it. Then I, I started wondering why he didn't say anything over the telephone about being late. So well, I came down here on the streetcar. Did you phone the store just before you left your house? Yes, yeah, but there was no answer. Mm-hmm. Parking lot's empty. Better get out an APB on the car, huh? Miss Griber, you said your car was a 1939 F40 Oldsmobile, didn't you? 1940, I remember now. What model is that? Oh, it's a sedan, light blue. Do you remember the license number? Well, I have it on this chain with the extra keys. Here it is, on this little tag. The veterans make these. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Joe, can I see him now? Sure. Excuse me, Miss Kramer. Do, do you want me to wait? I, I'd like to go home. We'd like you to wait for a little while, yes. Do you have any relatives living here? A niece and a nephew in Beverly Hills. Jerome Reed. They live on Cannon Drive. All right, we'll call them for you. Thank you. Lee, is this phone out here all right to handle? Yeah, it's been dusted. Okay. Hey, Joe, you coming in? Yeah, right away. Pretty clear, easy to trace. Mm-hmm. I'd say he was standing over here by the curtains when he was shot. That's where the stains begin. Mm-hmm. Then he must have stumbled along this glass case. You can see the smears here in the glass where he tried to grab hold of something. Yeah. And I guess he caught hold of that fur coat and pulled it down with it. Mm-hmm. And he stumbled and bumped up against this coat rack, fell through that and up against the safe. How many times was he hit? Six empty casings on the floor. Looks like four through and through wounds. Thirty-two, huh? That's right. The wife know if anything's missing? Yeah, she's in pretty bad shape. It looks to me like somebody took his wristwatch and a ring from his left hand. If he had a billfold, that's gone. No coat. All the trouser pockets are turned inside out. And what about that wine bottle? It's smeared. Can't lift a thing. Okay, thanks. Ben? Still on the phone. Okay. No, no, no. License 15, Boston. 6707. No, 707. Yeah. Driver might be on. Hang on a minute, Wallace. What? Now, give that DMV, will you? Save another call. Miss Kriber, did your husband have a wallet? Yes. Yes, brown alligator. Did he keep his identification in it? Yes. Did he carry much cash? No, just a few dollars. He was always afraid of holdups. Thank you. You want to give that to him, Ben? Yeah, okay. Hey, Wallace, suspect might have a brown alligator wallet with identification cards of Albert Kreiber. Yeah, that's C-R-I-B, Boston, B, Boston, New York. 3412 Northwestern Avenue. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, bye. Joe? Hmm. Might be something here. Yeah, Monk? An invoice from a far north fur company. Three mink coats delivered here today. I looked all around. I only found two, one missing. Did you find a sales slip for the other one? No. Miss Kreiber, would you come over here, please? Yes. Where are they, Monk? Over here. All right. Over this way. Well, these are mink coats here, aren't they? Yes. Yes, wild mink. Albert told me he ordered them. Yes, ma'am. We found the invoice. He ordered three. There are only two here. Do you know anything about any of his customers? No. No, I don't. I never met any of them. Oh, I remember now. Just the night before last, he called someone from home, told her he had some minks in today, and she could come in and look them over. Do you know who that was? I I didn't hear any name. Miss Kreiber, do you have any idea who might have wanted to shoot your husband? No, none at all. He was friendly with everyone. Everybody liked Albert. He didn't run around. He, he was either working or at home. Did he drink? Not at all. No, I mean beer, a little no, wine, maybe? No, no, He never touched anything. All right, thank you. Brennan, will you see that Ms. Kriber gets to her nephews? Right away. Thank you. Might as well go, Ben. Yeah. We can talk to some of the neighbors. Six shots fired. Wonder why nobody heard him. Pretty heavy traffic outside, huh? Somebody wanted a mink coat pretty bad. A coat like that cost quite a bit, doesn't it? This one's going to come a little high. Yeah. Seven oh five p.m. Most of the stores along the street were closed, but a small shoe repair shop across the street was open, so we went over there. 
On the window was one word, Pete, and a picture of a shoe. Sitting in the window was a small, dark man wearing a leather apron who was working on a pair of shoes. Hello. We're police officers. I see you drive up across the street. Are you Pete? Sure. Uh, what happens to Mr. Kreiber? He's robbed? No, he was killed. No. Shot? I do not hear anything. Have you been sitting in your window all afternoon? Oh, most all the time. You see, I have machinery here. I advertise that way. People watch me. Mm-hmm. Do you remember seeing anybody going into Mr. Kreiber's this afternoon? Uh, this afternoon, the four men. Uh, two, three, long black cars. Uh-huh. Anybody else? Uh, some. Were they women? Officer, they are all women. Did any of them walk out with a new fur coat? Uh, they're all done. I do not see all of them, I guess, but I see two. Can you describe them? Uh, one beautiful young girl, tall, red hair. She walk out with a big package. What time was that? Three, four o'clock. Uh, the second woman is about the same time. Funny thing. I do not see the bottle, but Benny from liquor store and corner tell me the second one, the blonde... She buys bottle of wine. Did he tell you what kind? No. Reason I remember, I laugh when he tell me. I go over to Benny's for a can of beer. Uh, he tells me she buys cheap wine, walks out of Kreiber's with new fur coat. <laughs> me, I spend five dollars for good wine, and my wife has no fur coat. How old was this blonde? How was she dressed? Uh, she's maybe 25. Young, you know, not too young, but young. She has on slacks, uh, gray. Mm-hmm. What kind of a fur coat was she wearing when she came out? Mink. Look from here like mink. I see. Did you notice where she went? Mm. The blonde, the gray slacks, mink coat. Yes, it turned the corner onto Lexington and she went up the street. Did you see Mr. Kreiber's car drive away? No, he parked in back. I don't see him come in. I don't see him come out. All right. Thanks a lot, Pete. Mm-hmm. Y you know, officer, uh, that blonde, something wrong there. How do you mean? Well, she has got fur coat, but she drinks wrong wine. I don't understand. Why do you say that? $5,000 coat, 27 cent wine. 7.45 p.m. Ben and I questioned Benny Davis at the safety liquor store. He remembered the blonde and said she bought a bottle of Sierra Valley Muscatel from him between 2.30 and 3 o'clock that afternoon. He'd never seen her before. We contacted communications and gave a description of the blonde to supplement the all-points bulletin. Then we started checking Western Union offices to find out where Mrs. Kreiber's telegram had been sent from. We finally traced it to the office at Normandy and Hollywood Boulevard. The operator who sent the telegram to Mrs. Kreiber also remembered receiving the call. She told us that the person who phoned in the message was a woman. The time, 3.22 p.m. We asked her to put a tracer on it and told her we'd check back. 8.24 p.m., Ben and I went to 10113 Normandy to talk to Miss Terry Shepard, whose name had appeared in the customer files at the first store. The receipt showed she'd taken a coat out of storage that afternoon. This is something like the place the wife and I used to live in. Yeah? Same people must have built it. Apartment 3. Miss Terry Shepard. All right, come in. The door's open. Find yourself a seat, Fred. I'll be in a minute. Police officers, Miss Shepard. Oh? What's wrong? We'd like to talk to you. What about? What if you could come out here, please? Well, I just got out of the shower. You'll have to wait a minute. Yeah? Yeah, this place has got the same floor plan as mine. Huh? Kind of small, isn't it? Mm, not too bad. I wonder what rent she pays. Uh, you don't mind if I wait a two and leave my hair's wet. It's all right. We're sorry to bother you. What can I do for you? Have you got a fur coat, Miss Shepard? Yeah, sure. What if we could see it, please? Sure, but I don't think it'll thrill you. It's only muskrat. I bought it in Pittsburgh. Where is it, in Florida? Yeah. Okay. It's uh, down the hallway, first door on the right. I think I know where it is. What's this all about, Lieutenant? What time were you at the Western Fur Shop today? Oh, I'd say 3 o'clock. Why? What'd you do while you were down there? I got my coat out of Hawk. I had it there during the warm weather. Paid the man, signed something, and uh, he put the coat in a box, and I took it. Mm-hmm. Do you know Mr. Kreiber down there, the man that owns the store? You got me. The man was about 50. His hair was a little gray. I hardly even looked at him. This is the only fur coat, Joe. Mm -hmm. Could have passed for mink when I first bought it. It's 
pretty sad now, isn't it? Not me. I'll give that closet the last check. All right. What happened? Did somebody steal a coat? Was anybody else in the store while you were there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there was another girl there. What was she doing? Nothing, just sitting. Do you remember how she was dressed? Oh, uh, she was wearing a gray suit. Slacks. Blonde. Her face wasn't much, but she had a neat little figure. Do you remember anything else about her? Oh, I didn't pay that much attention. Anything else in there, Ben? Not a thing, Joe. Maybe I'd better take this towel off my head. It doesn't look so hot when it's wet, but it's natural. It's natural red. Yeah. Is there anything else that you might be able to tell us? Mm, I think that's about all. I gave the man my claim check and the money, and he got the coat and put it in a box and gave me a receipt. Mm -hmm. Nothing else? No. Well, when I got the receipt, I saw the blonde walk over and pick up the telephone. I was just leaving then. Did you hear any of the conversation? She asked for Western Union. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Edith Gwynn, well-known Los Angeles columnist. This is her actual signed statement. It's my job to keep up with what's going on around town. And here's one thing I've noticed lately. More and more people smoking Fatima. You certainly can tell why once you smoke them. I found them milder than any other king-size cigarette. And that's important to me. Yes, I agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And so do more and more smokers every day. Actual figures show extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Sunday, November 24th, 9 a.m. Ben and I contacted the owners of all the shops in the vicinity, but none of them saw or heard anything at the time of the shooting. Officers Brennan and Monkreys interviewed all the regular customers of Albert Kreiber's fur shop. Only three had been in the store on Saturday, but none of them had noticed anything wrong. 11.35 a.m. We spoke to Mrs. Kreiber again, but she could add nothing to her story. Her niece and nephew had been to a football game at the Coliseum in the afternoon and knew nothing had happened until they were telephoned by Officer Brennan. 2.55 p.m. We spoke to all the tenants of the apartment house at 5513 Lexington, which is in the rear of the fur shop. None of them had been home, but the owner told us that he had some men working on the roof of the apartment house at the time of the murder. Through the owner of the Durable Roof Company, we traced the two men who had been working on the roof, and they told us that about 4 o'clock they had seen a blonde dressed in gray slacks enter the parking space in the rear of Kreiber's fur store. They whistled at her, but she paid no attention to them. She got into an Oldsmobile and drove east on Lexington. 7 p.m. We checked in at the office and got word that Albert Kreiber's car had been located in the parking lot at Vermont and 8th. We drove down to the location and talked to the parking lot attendant. Well, the car must have come in sometime last night. It probably came in the back way, because I don't remember it coming in, and it doesn't have our lot tag on it. Did you work all last night? No, I finished at midnight and started at 10 this morning. I kept waiting for somebody to claim this thing, and, well, and after supper, I figured it might be stolen, so I phoned the police. It's been sitting here all that time. Are there any keys in it? No, sir, there weren't last night either. Have you ever seen this particular car before? No, sir. Have you ever seen a blonde woman about 25 wearing gray slacks? You mean hanging around here? Yeah, or in the neighborhood. Yeah, but not today or yesterday. You remember one? Well, yes, sir. Does she drink a lot? Maybe. Well, there's one that hangs out in these bars around here. Once in a while, she comes in the lot, but not lately. When did you see her last? Oh, a couple of weeks ago. Was she with anyone? Yeah, but I don't remember him. I've seen her with a lot of different guys. Does she hang around with anybody in particular? Yeah, her husband. 8.30. Before leaving the parking lot, we pulled the rotor out of the distributor so that nobody could drive the car away. 8.12 p.m. We called Homicide and asked for more men to canvas the bars in the neighborhood. Ben and I staked out on the car. We sat in our car across the street from the parking lot until midnight. Nobody showed up to claim the car. 
The streets were almost empty. Our only chance was that the blonde lived in the neighborhood or was in a bar and would sooner or later try to claim the car. 1.53 a.m. Hmm. What rent do you suppose that shepherd girl pays? You got me. 75? I don't know. I bet I pay more than she does. Is that Monkreys? Yeah. Hi, Monk. Hi. Let's take a look up the street. See that couple? Where? Coming this way. Blonde, gray slacks, fur coat. She's pretty drunk. Where'd you spot her? Turn the corner from Olympic. They've been looking in parking lots. Monk, there's a rear entrance to this lot off the alley. Do you want to cover that? Yeah. Thank you. You see him all right? That's it. Where'd they walk under that light? Yeah. Pretty drunk. Looks like the same kind of coat, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stopping. Looking for another parking lot, I guess. Sierra Valley Wine. World's finest muscatel. And going into the parking lot. She's not carrying a purse. Those coats don't have pockets big enough for a 32 automatic. That stuff sure gets people. All right, let's go. We're getting in Kriber's car. Look, we can't even find the door. She's helping us. You take the other side of the car, will you? Yeah. Stop rushing me. <laughs> Who are you? Police officers. Can I see your driver's license, please? I ain't got a driver's license. And what's going on? What's your name? Betty Moore. What's it to you? The registration slip on the steering column says Albert Kreiber. What's the matter with this car, anyway? Who's uh, Albert Kreiber? Oh, I know who he is. Bad guy here. Who is this man? Huh? What do you say? He's a friend. That satisfy you? Yeah, I'm a friend. What's the matter with this thing? Take a look in the glove right. compartment, Ben. Okay. Come on, honey. Let's get going, huh? Yeah. It's locked. What do you want in there for? Let me have those keys. Hey. Here you are, Ben. How about going home? There's there? nothing in there. Let's go. Here's a purse. Give me that. You keep your hands in the wheel. It's a gun, 32. It's his. It's empty anyway. There's nothing wrong in that. Do you have a permit to carry it? Yeah, I got a permit. Can I see it? I lost it. Give me those you keys. Keep your hands on that wheel. There's a wallet. Identification cards, Albert Kreiber. Where'd you get these? I don't know. The man's watch, Albert Kreiber, engraved on the back. Who's Albert Kreiber? I don't know, I told you. All right, let's get out of the car. Hey, let me push it. Why didn't that car start? All right, come on. Stand up, you get over there. Where'd you get the fur coat? I bought it. Where? I don't know. Joe, look at her slacks. Wine stains. I spilled wine on them. What kind of wine? Muscatel. Muscatel isn't a red wine, it's a white wine. Who's Albert Kreiber? I don't know. This is his wallet, this is his car. Where'd you get him? I don't know. I don't know. Is this the gun you shot him with? Is this the gun you shot him with? <laughs> I was going out with him. He said he'd give me a fur coat. He promised me a watch and he never gave me one. And then we sent a telegram to his wife and everything. <laughs> Give me a fur coat and take me out. <laughs> he backed out of me. So you shot him? Sure I did. He promised me the coat. He said I could have any coat in the shop. <laughs> he promised me. What are you crying for? You got the coat. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 27th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs>
Betty Moore was tried and convicted of second-degree murder and received sentence as prescribed by law. She is now serving her term in the state penitentiary at Tehachapi. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, hear Sarah Berner in Sarah's Private Caper on NBC. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A woman has disappeared, taken from her home by a man posing as a police officer. Your job... Finder. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, April 4th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was ten minutes past six p.m. when I got to the basement of the city hall. Carpool. Over here, Joe. All right. Thad Brown will be down in a minute. The captain will follow us out later. Okay. No contact yet? No, he's still waiting. You take care of the local broadcast? Already gone out. They'll put the descriptions on the air every hour. How's it look to you now? I don't know. Nothing more we can do to, like, make a contact. Oh, here's Thad Brown now. You want to squeeze over a little? Oh, yeah, sure. Hi, Chief. Hi. Let's go. Might as well take Beverly Boulevard, huh, Ben? Yeah, it's as fast as any. You got the address there, Friday? Yeah, it's 617 Paris Avenue. It's out by Echo Park. Well, who's covering the house now? Ross and Pacelli are staked out in a private garage across the street from the house. Donahoe and Wiseman are on duty inside the Kessel Place. You want to smoke? Mm, thanks. Light me one, will you, Joe? Yeah. <clears throat> but you got the story from the maid at the Kessel's house, is that right? Mm-hmm. You check it out? Oh, I'm pretty sure she's telling it straight. If anything... Anything's wrong. I don't think she's got a hand in it. Here you are, Ben. Oh, thanks. You got the call about three this afternoon? Mm Mm-hmm. A few minutes after, we went right out and talked to the maid. How'd she tell it? She said she was fixing dinner about two this afternoon when the doorbell rang. She answered it, and a young man in a gray suit asked for Mrs. Kessel by name. He told the maid it was an emergency. Yeah. Well, the maid said Mrs. Kessel came to the door, and the man identified himself as a police officer told Mrs. Kessel her husband had been hurt in an accident and she was to come right away. Man show his identification? Maid said no. Said Mrs. Kessel just took it for granted he was a cop. Yeah. Go ahead. Mrs. Kessel got her coat and left with the man. About an hour later, her husband, Professor Kessel, got home. He wasn't hurt. He hadn't been in an accident. He hadn't seen his wife. As soon as he heard from the maid what had happened, he got on the phone and called up. 
What's the background of the husband, this uh, Professor Kessel? He's supposed to have quite a name. He's a professor of philosophy out at Simmons College, that small school out near Glendale. Oh, yeah, I know. He's a devout man, president of one of the local synagogues. Sure about the maid's story, huh? Sure as we can be. She gave us a good description of the man who picked up Miss Kessel. I got it right here. Yeah. Here. White male, American, 25 to 30 years old, 6 feet, 170 to 80 pounds, gray suit, gray head, brown shoes. How about the car he used? Late model Chevrolet, dark blue, white sidewalls. That's all the maid could tell us. She didn't notice the last. You better cut over on West Lake. That'll take us past the detail, won't it? Mm-hmm. This Professor Kessel, has he been told what to do? Yeah, he's been briefed. We've had a couple of men with him since this thing broke. He's taken it pretty hard. How old a man is he? Oh, his late 30s. Wouldn't you say so, Ben? Pretty close to 40. Nice fellow. It's quiet. Two kids in the family, just about school age, boy and a girl. This next one ought to be Paris Avenue. Yeah. There's a big gray house down there, Skipper. White trim. Don't park too close to the house. I saw to do it right here, don't you think? Yeah. What time you got? Uh, it's 6.15. Almost dark. Now, where's the garage our men are covering from? Can you see beyond that light pole there, the white stucco place? Oh, yeah. Next one here's a castle home. Doesn't look very rich. Neither did the Kessels. I don't think they got much money. Hi, Donahoe. Come in. <laughs> that the husband? Yeah, I just got a phone call a couple of minutes ago. I listened on the extension. Who called? Try to trace it. The guy wouldn't stay in the line long enough. What'd you say? Tell the cops to stay away. Said it twice. Tell the cops to stay away. Yeah. Said if they don't, I'll kill her. The Kessel house had already been placed under strict surveillance, and the victim's husband instructed not to contact the abductors without knowledge of the police. To the working detective, there's only one rule to go by when the job of solving an abduction is put in his hands. Find the victim as fast as possible, get the victim to safety, then go after the criminal. It's not an easy job. The responsibility isn't light and the outcome isn't always successful. If you press too hard, the abductor gets frightened and kills the victim. If you don't press hard enough, the criminal has more time to work for his payoff and then escape. Somewhere between the two was the right answer. We had to find it. 6.30 p.m. Special details of men were ordered out to the bus depots, the railroad terminals, and the airports. Roadblocks were set up at all main arteries leading into and out of the city. Every branch post office in Los Angeles was covered to watch for possible ransom notes addressed to Professor Kessel. 6.40 p.m. We met in the Kessel's living room. Chief, Wiseman. Professor Kessel will be down in a minute. Says he's sorry to keep you waiting. You feeling any better? A little. Phone call about his wife shook him up a bit. Well, how about those people who came in a few minutes ago? Who are they? Relatives. Half a dozen of them. They're waiting back in the kitchen. Well, how'd they know about Mrs. Kessel? They didn't. They'd been invited to dinner. They didn't know anything was wrong till they got here. Mm-hmm. Kessel asked them to stay for the meal. He wants to keep up appearances for the sake of his kids. Doesn't want them to worry about their mother. The dinner that important to him? Well, tonight's the start of the Pesach, the Jewish religion Passover. Oh, yeah. It's one of the big holidays. Oh, I see. Well, they started off with this dinner tonight. Is that the way? Yeah, big dinner. They call them seders. Tonight they have the first seder. Good evening. Sorry to keep you waiting. How are you? No, please, please sit down. We don't like to intrude on your privacy, Professor Kessel, but I think you can see it's necessary. Oh, yes, of course. I'm very grateful. If there's anything at all I can do to help. Do you have any idea who might be responsible for abducting your wife? That's what has me so confused. How do you mean, sir? Well, I, I'm sure I have people who don't like me, who don't like us, but someone who would take my wife who says they'll kill her? No, I, I don't know who it could be. How about the voice on the telephone, Professor? Did you recognize it at all? No, it didn't sound like anyone I knew. He talked so fast, I could hardly understand the man. Do you think the person who took your wife has some other motive besides holding her for ransom? I can't understand that either. If it's money they want, why go after a teacher's wife? Fifteen hundred dollars in the bank, that's all I have. That and this house. How about your immediate family, Professor? Well, my wife, Ruth, her people have quite a bit. I guess you would call them rich. But it's their money, not mine. I I can't understand why anyone would do it. Poor Ruth. Anything happened. Children. Albert? 
Uh, I'm sorry. It's all right. We understand. Albert. Yes, Bertha. Come in, would you, please? Gentlemen, this is my sister, Bertha. She's here with her husband for the Seder. How, How, How are you? Uh, Albert, it's late. Sundown. It's time to start the kitchen. Oh, yes. Um, all right, Bertha. You tell everyone to come to the table. I'll be right in. The officers will have the first Seder with us? Yes, Bertha. You, you please set them places. Huh? Yes, Albert. Say, we don't mean to intrude here. We can wait outside while you have your dinner. Oh, no, please. I'd be honored to have you sit at the table with us. No one in the house should be without food tonight. First Seder for Passover. It's the law. How's that, sir? Oh, excuse me. The Hebrew law. Would you come this way, please? Yes, sir, Professor. He turned and led us down the hallway into the dining room. A long white cloth covered the table. In the center was a brightly polished brass candelabra holding four lighted tapers. There were a few platters of food already set out and at the head of the table where Professor Kessel stood an open prayer book. In order not to add to the alarm of his two small children at the absence of their mother, Professor Kessel introduced us as friends from Simmons College. Uh, This is Mr. Brown, Mr. Friday, Mr. Wiseman, Mr. Romero. You do, you do. Of course. Now, sit down. Please sit down. <clears throat> yeah. So smells good. Yeah. yeah. You got enough room there, Joe? Oh, fine. Say, hey, how's it work, Wiseman? Should we join in the prayers? Not unless you speak Hebrew. Oh. Baruch atoh Adonai, Eloheinu melech oilam, Boire pri agofen. Baruch atoh Adonai, Eloheinu melech oilam, Friday talking. This is Lacey, Joe. Just got a call from the morgue. Yeah? They brought in the body a few minutes ago. They checked the description. Yeah? They think it's Mrs. Kessel. I went back into the dining room and told Chief Brown about the call. He told Professor Kessel. He said he'd finish as quickly as possible so as not to alarm the children and then go with us to the morgue to check the identity of the body. The prayers continued along with the dinner. John? Yes, Papa. Manish dona halalo azeh, mi ko halelos, shebacho halelos anu ochlin, chame tzu matzo, halalo hazeh, kulo matzo. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Papa? What was it, Wiseman? What was the boy saying? It's part of the ceremony during the meal. He's supposed to ask his father certain questions about the Passover, and then the father answers him. I guess it was too much for Kessel. Sure broke him up. What'd the boy ask him? Why is this night different from any other night? Seven thirty p.m. Sergeants Wiseman and Donahoe stayed on duty at the house while Chief Brown, Ben, and I drove Professor Kessel to the county morgue. On the way, we called in and checked with Captain Steed of Homicide. He told us there'd been no reports on Mrs. Kessel. 7.43 p.m. Ben and I took Kessel to the basement of the Hall of Justice, county morgue. This way, Professor. Oh, yes. You sure you feel up to it? Thank you. I'll be all right. Cold in here. Yes, sir. Hi, fellas. It's back here. Okay, Archie. This is Professor Kessel, Archie. How do you do? This way. Jane Doe, number five. I called over as soon as they brought it in. Yeah, thank you. Found the body near Avenue 19, the riverbed, crossing the auto cam. No identification? No. 
Here we are. All right. Professor. <laughs> Thank God. Not my wife. It seemed as if both the victim and whoever had taken her had vanished completely. At 11.30, Captain Steed, Ben, and I went across the street for a cup of coffee and a fried egg sandwich. We got back to the office at 10 minutes to midnight. Still no word. At 2 a.m., Ben and I drove back to the Kessel house to relieve Donahoe and Wiseman. We stood our watch in the living room. In the bedroom directly above, we could hear Professor Kessel pacing the floor most of the night. At 5 a.m., Captain Steed called. He told us a letter addressed to the professor had been reported at the arcade post office. As soon as the outside of the envelope had been photographed and checked for prints, it would be brought out for Professor Kessel to open. Front door? Yeah, I'll get it. Chief? Morning. Hi, Lee. Hi, Joe. In here. Did you lift anything off the envelope, Lee? Nothing we can use, no. Might have more luck with the letter. Good morning. You brought the letter? It's right here, Professor Kessel. I'd like you to stand by while we open it. Uh, this is Lieutenant Jones, my crime lab. Lieutenant? Uh, you'll check the note for fingerprints. Oh, yes, I, I can get you a letter open. I think this one over here. Yeah, that's all right. I could use my pocket knife. You want to grab one corner of the paper, Bannon? Just the tip of the corner. Use your fingernail. Okay. And that does it. Open it. And pin down these corners here. What is it, Freddy? In other words, they're put together with small printed letters. They all seem to be the same kind of typeface. Letters were probably clipped from a book, then pasted together to form these words. Well, who sent it? What does it say? Uh, can I... Thanks, Link. If you want to see your wife alive, have 30,000 small bills tonight. Tell police I kill her. Instructions follow in mail. No signature. 30,000. I haven't got the money. I can't get it. You'll kill her. Mr. Castle, there's still a chance. But what can I do? I haven't got that much money. He says he'll kill her. What can we do? What we've been doing. Yes? Wait. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. Fatima, the long cigarette that has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. And there's a very good reason for this amazing increase. Men and women everywhere are finding out it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. I agree, says Lee Silva, news reporter. I agree, says Jean Matson, airline stewardess. I agree, says Mike Charters, attorney at law. I agree, says Bab Beckwith, fashion stylist. Yes, all agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. So, enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor and aroma. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. Wednesday, 7 a.m. With the aid of an iodine fume gun, Lee Jones checked the extortion letter from Mrs. Kessel's abductor for fingerprints and other marks of identification. He found nothing. The piece of paper on which the cutout printed letters had been pasted was of a common variety sold in most stationery and five and ten cent stores. Jones photographed both sides of the envelope and the letter. 11 a.m. Still no word. None of the special details had anything to report. At 1.45 p.m., another letter was delivered to the house. The envelope was open, and the letter removed carefully and pinned down at the corners. It's put together the same as the last one. 
Uh, tonight, 11 o'clock, come alone, your car. Tell the police I kill her. Is there more, Friday? Yeah. Drive corner Lakeshore, Charter Street. Wrap money, brown paper, small bills. Come alone, your car. Put package by fire plug, then leave. Tell police and I kill her. No signature. I haven't got the money. Wait, sure, and charter. That shouldn't be too hard for us to catch. Sounds pretty much like an amateur. It makes it touchy. If he's green, he'll scare easy. If he's scared, he may kill her. Not if we reach him. How can I get the money? Well, you won't need any. We'll have a dummy package made up. There'll be a single dollar bill inside. Must be newspapers cut to the size of currency. That's what you'll deliver. But when he gets the package, when he finds out it's not the money, what's he going to think? We'll explain it to him. Starting at 10 o'clock that night, more than a dozen cars from the detective bureau circled the area around Lakeside Avenue and Charter Street, keeping a distance ranging from three quarters to a full mile away so as not to scare off the abductor. Some of the cars were parked in service stations, some in private driveways. The neighborhood was located in the heart of a new veterans' housing project. For a full five blocks in either direction, there were no buildings of any kind where we could keep an eye on the package of fake ransom money. The owner of one of the completed houses nearest the spot on Charter Street was contacted, and he agreed to let us use his home as a lookout point for the stakeout that night. 9 p.m. Ben and I took up our positions on the roof of the lookout house. We were equipped with two pair of night binoculars and a walkie-talkie. I could think of a few other places I'd rather spend the night. How well can you see that intersection from here? Hmm. Comes in fine with these binoculars. The guy shows we ought to see him. Yeah. I better check with the captain again. What time you got? 9.25. Where's the skipper parked? Private driveway near Charter and Hayworth. Friday to 105K. Friday to 105K. Come in. Yeah, Joe. Go ahead. Got a clear view of the intersection. Nothing yet outside of cramped legs. You reading me okay? Yeah, Joe. Fine. Over. Roger. Standing by. Sure lucky my kid can't see me now. Why? He'd never understand. Why should his father be sitting on top of somebody's roof late at night? He'd never get it. We waited. 10 o'clock came, 10.30. At exactly 11 p.m., as we watched through our night binoculars, we saw Professor Kessel drive up to the designated location five blocks away, place the fake package of ransom money by the fire hydrant near the intersection, and then drive away. 11.30, we waited. Midnight. 2 a.m., nothing happened. The package was still lying by the fire hydrant, undisturbed. Captain Steed checked with us periodically on the walkie-talkie. At 3.30 a.m., we were still waiting. At a few minutes past 6 a.m., Professor Kessel was directed to return to the intersection, pick up the package, and drive back to his home. His wife's abductor had failed to show. Maybe the suspect had sensed a trap. Maybe he had no idea of showing up in the first place. Maybe Mrs. Kessel was dead. We didn't know. 10 a.m., Thursday. No further contact from the abductor. A special detail from Homicide, including Ben and I, were ordered on a door-to-door -door canvas of the general area around Lakeside Avenue and Charter Street. After seven hours of ringing doorbells and asking questions, we came across a Mr. Harold Olander, one of the longtime residents of the Silver Lake area. We showed him the general description of Mrs. Kessel's abductor. Yeah, that could be Thompson. I don't know for sure, though. Where did you see this Thompson, Mr. Olander? Oh, I saw him lots of times. He rents that cottage of mine down the street there. You see? The white one? Mm-hmm. Does this Thompson have a car? Thompson? Yeah, yeah, new one. I wonder if you could describe it. Chevrolet, nice looking, blue color, I think. Could be, Joe. Is Thompson in the house now, Mr. Olander? Nope. Saw so him drive away early this morning. I can show you the house if it's official police business. It is. Well, come on, then. I got the key right here. Cottage just down the block there. See the one I mean? The white one? Yes, sir. How long's Thompson been in the house? Two weeks tomorrow. You noticed anything unusual about him? Mm, nothing special. Comes and goes at odd hours. Then a lot of people do. I don't cry. It's this house right here. Does he usually keep all the blinds drawn? Yeah, now that you mention it. A lot of people do, I guess. Want to 
check back in the kitchen, Ben. Yeah, right. Look at the living room, Sergeant. Yeah. On a stick of furniture. That's funny. You sure you didn't see anybody else in this house besides Thompson? No. No, he's the only one. Looks like it, Joe. Hmm? Found this woman's purse stuffed in one of the kitchen cabinets. This sales slip was in the purse. I see. This is Albert Kessel. Is there a phone here, Mr. Olander? Uh, out in the hall. All right. Is it still connected? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Joe, I'll check back in the bedrooms while you're phoning. Right, Ben. No, you better stay with me, Mr. Orlando, if you will. Oh, all right. City Hall. Homicide. Homicide? You any idea where this Thompson is now, Mr. Orlando? No, he comes and goes. I don't like to pry. Homicide, Steve. This Friday, Skipper, we got one for you. I've got one for you. Hmm? Mrs. Kessel, she's been found. <laughs> Mrs. Kessel was unharmed. She had no idea where she had been or why she had been suddenly released. All additional information which she could furnish on the suspect was immediately relayed to the entire state in an APB. Two hours later, at a neighborhood garage Thompson patronized, we got his license number. We ran it through DMV and found the car was registered in the name of Charles Cottrell, 10115 Green Oak Drive, 7 p.m. Yes. Police officers. Is Charles Cottrell here? Yes. Come in, please. I knew you'd find him. I kept hoping, but I knew you'd find him. Where is he, ma'am? He'll give himself up. I'm his wife. I talked to him. There won't be any trouble. No trouble. Where is he? You've got to understand, he didn't know what he was doing. We needed money. He didn't know what he was doing. We'll have to search the house, ma'am. Charlie! Charlie, come downstairs! Come down! Get your hands behind your head. I don't have a gun. Charlie. Charlie. All right, Ben. Behind your back. Tell them, Charlie. You didn't know what you were doing. Tell them. We needed the money. I thought it'd work. What'd I do wrong? Come on. Should have worked. I planned it all out. Where'd I make a mistake? When you thought of it. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild, because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Charles Cottrell was tried and convicted of kidnapping and received the sentence as prescribed by law. He is now serving his term in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, here's Sarah Berner in Sarah's Private Caper on NBC. The 
the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a hit-and-run felony detail. A dead body is found in the streets in the early hours of the morning. There's only one clue, a set of skid marks on the pavement. Your job? Find the killer. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, April 19th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of traffic division. My partner is Ben Romero. The boss is Lieutenant Calfey, Commander AID. My name's Friday. It was 7.55 a.m. when I got to the second floor at 123 South Figueroa Street. Accident investigation. Get and run felony detail. Get and run felony. Morning, Joe. George? Yeah. How is it? Oh, it's not much better. Still aching. Mm, rough. A lousy thing kept me up most of the night. Check with that dentist that told you about? Yeah, I did. Says it's a wisdom tooth. Yeah? This one here. Oh, yeah. Says it's got to come out. I'm supposed to go back and see him today. That's rough. Remember, a friend of mine had his wisdom teeth out. Hurt like the devil. Terrible. Finally pulled him. Ate for five, six days after. Mm-hmm. Roger. Excuse me, Joe. Yeah, McD. Better have a 57 on that follow up you handled yesterday, huh? Okay. I got most of it down. I'll finish it up. Friday? Hi. Ben come in yet? He's down the record bureau. Let's see that jaw of yours. Hmm. Mm. Hasn't gone down much. Uh, it's a bad wisdom tooth. Dennis says he's going to have to yank it. Bum deal, man. Eh? That's the first time I ever had any trouble with him. I remember a few years back, my sister Gertrude had trouble with a wisdom tooth. And packed in. Yeah? Whole side of her face was swollen. Poor kid was in terrible pain. Full week. Even after they pulled it, it still hurt. Uh-huh. Hi, Joe. Oh. Picked up the overnight reports down at Records, Mac. Here you are. Oh, thanks, Ben. This one on top here. I'd like to have you two check it out. Mm, dead body report. Yeah. They left me a note on it. That's about all. Hard to figure. What's the story? Just what you see in the report. The victims. Edward Raymond Stokes, 732 Delano Street, apartment 2. His body was found in the gutter near 63rd in Vermont, 3 o'clock this morning. No witnesses. Only one piece of evidence. Yeah, see, they got it listed here. Skid marks near the body. Is that all? That's it. Parent hit and run. Where's the body, man? Neighborhood mortuary out there. Emerald Hills Funeral Home. One of the deputy coroners handled the body. A fellow named Joe Laramore. Anybody claim it, Jeff? No. Okay. Ben, you ready? Yeah, let's go. We'll check you later, man. Yeah. If you need any help, I've got McClendon and Rogers on hand. Right. How do we manage to draw all the choice ones? I don't know. Skid marks and a dead body. Yeah. Oh, say, I almost forgot. How's your jaw? Oh, it still hurts. Oh, it's tough. Yeah, it's still swollen. Mm-hmm. What did Dennis say? Wisdom tooth. Oh, it's miserable. Yeah. Wife had the same thing a couple of years back. Dennis tried to yank the tooth and it broke right in two. Finally got it out. That's good. Funny thing about wisdom teeth. What's that? After they pull them. Hurts for five or six days. a.m. Ben and I drove out to 63rd in Vermont and rechecked the spot where the dead body of Edward Stokes had been found. 
According to the report, the body was found two feet west of the Easterly Curb and 32 north of 63rd Street on Vermont. We examined the skid marks. They showed definite signs of being a lot older than 24 hours. The consistency of the rubber was weak, and there were heavy dirt smudges over them, indicating more wear than they could have possibly had since the estimated time of the victim's death. We got back in the car and drove to the Emerald Hills Funeral Home at Vernon and Denver Avenue. Sure is rotten weather for April, huh? Yeah. These funeral homes, do you ever notice it? What's that? Why do they always put awnings over the windows? They never open drapes. I don't know. Come on. Funeral going on. You know where the office is? There's a brass plate on that door over there. Let's have a look. Yes, sir? Here's somebody, Jim. Oh. Gentlemen, may I be of service? Police officers. I'd like to talk to Mr. Laramore. I believe he's a deputy coroner. Hi, Mr. Laramore. You came about the hit-and-run victim? Yeah, that's right. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. We'd like to check the body if we could. Certainly. It's back this way. I understand you moved the body from the scene of the accident here to the mortuary. Yes, that's right. Early this morning. Unusual case. Careful, there's two steps down just inside the door. Thank you. Why do you say it's unusual, Mr. Laramore? Well... Here, let me show you. There. Now, for one thing, the victim had a basal skull fracture. I don't know about you gentlemen, but in the hit-and-run cases I've handled, a basal fracture is a pretty rare thing. Well, it is possible, isn't it? Oh, yes, it's possible. Anything's possible, as they say. But it's not usual. A few other things here, too. Yeah. Notice the victim's knee here. Single, clean cut. Also, these wounds on the head... I've never seen anything like it in hit-and-run cases I've been called in. Yeah, that wound on the knee doesn't jive, does it? If he was hit by a car, the knee should be skinned up quite a bit. Exactly. Well, you know how it usually is. The automobile hits the victim. There's always signs that the body was either dragged or thrown. Shredding of clothing, skinned knees, legs, elbows. No sign of that here. You don't think the victim could have been killed by hit-and-run cars, eh? No, I don't say that. It's possible that it might have been a car, but... Well, let's say it's not very probable. Has anybody at all inquired about the body, Mr. Larimore? No one, no. That's funny. Oh, uh, Mr. Larimore, may I see you a minute, please? All right, Tom. Excuse me a moment? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. Where do we start? I don't know. Maybe we won't have to. Hmm? Another lead like this, we can turn it over to homicide. Sergeant? Yeah? There's a young lady in the lobby. Yeah. She wants to claim the body. The girl was shown the body. She identified it as that of Edward Raymond Stokes. She gave her name as Marion Fuller, the victim's common-law wife. After she recovered from her shock, she asked if she might sit down for a while and rest. We took her into one of the offices in the mortuary, and Ben got her a glass of water. She told us that she had last seen Stokes alive at about 1 a.m. that morning. They'd been drinking together at a neighborhood bar on Vermont Avenue between 63rd and 64th Streets half a block from where the victim's body had been found sprawled in the gutter. Why don't you sit down over there, Miss Fuller? Mm, thanks. How long did you know Edward Stokes, Miss Fuller? About six years. On and off. We've been together pretty much the last couple of years, though. Oh, my head. Would you mind telling us exactly what happened while you were with Stokes last night? Everything you can remember? I can't think. This headache's killing me. I wish you'd try, Miss Fuller. It's important. Well... Nettie and I had dinner together at the Spanish oven, face down on South Fig. That was about a quarter to eight. Then we drove out to the Brown Barrel in Vermont, the bar I told you about. Yeah. Nettie and I go there most of the time. We stayed there and drank, played a little shuffleboard. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, we stayed too long, drank a little too much. I started talking to this fellow next to me, and he got sore. Always got jealous when he was drunk. Poor Eddie. Did Eddie fight with this other man, Miss Fuller? No, oh, no, I stopped him. That made Eddie mad. He never could drink right. He always wanted to pick a fight. Who was the other man, you remember? No, I don't. I guess I had a lot to drink, too. He was just some guy at the bar. His headache. Well, it's not going to take much longer. Just a few more questions. That organ's getting on my nerves. What happened after you broke up the argument between Stokes and the other man? Oh, nothing. We... Stayed in the bar. Had he played shuffleboard most of the time. I was one of the booths drinking. Yeah. Around one o'clock, I started feeling sick, so I 
I went outside and sat in the car. I guess I passed out there. In your car? No. I guess it belonged to one of the fellows in the bar. I passed out, and that's all I can remember. Did you sleep in the car all night? No. I guess whoever owned it drove me home. Well, how did they know where you live? Must have been one of her friends. I don't know. I don't remember anything until this morning. They phoned me up and said Eddie was dead. Who phoned you, Miss Farr? One of our friends. I don't remember. I had a rotten headache. Well, you can do better than that. I tell you, I don't remember. He phoned and told me Eddie was dead. Somebody ran Eddie down. All right. Where are we going? Downtown. We'll have a stenographer take your statement. Oh, I've got a terrible hangover. I've never had one as bad as this. Neither has Eddie. Let's go. On the way back to the office, Ben stopped at a drugstore and I picked up a box of aspirin. The wisdom tooth was giving me trouble again. The clerk at the soda fountain fixed something for Marion Fuller's hangover. When we got her back to the office, we questioned her for more than an hour, but she gave us only one additional piece of information. The victim, Eddie Stokes, had been married before and divorced. His ex-wife lived out in the valley with their two children, and on several occasions she came to see Stokes at the Vermont Avenue bar when he failed to make the monthly payments for the support of the children. Each time, they'd argued bitterly. We had a police stenographer take the floor woman's statement, and then she was released. 10.45 a.m., Sergeants Rogers and McClendon were assigned to check out the Vermont Avenue bar where Stokes had last been seen alive. Ben and I drove out to the valley to the home of Catherine Stokes, the victim's former wife. She met us on the front porch. Inside, it sounded like one of the children was practicing the piano. We told her what had happened. Last week, I think it was. Yes, Thursday last week. Eddie hadn't sent any money for the kids' support for three months. I hated to chase after him like that. There wasn't anything else I could do. Where did you meet him, Miss Stokes? That bar I used to hang around. It's over on Vermont, called the Brown Barrel or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, wouldn't you like to come inside? Yes, thank you. Do you happen to know anybody by the name of Marion Fuller? Yes, Eddie mentioned her. It was a man seeing a woman like that. Do you know anything about her at all? No. Whenever I saw Eddie, he'd mention he was running around with her. I guess he wanted to make me jealous. Was your husband a pretty heavy drinker? Yes, he was. So I got the divorce. Eddie was such a fine boy when we got married. Good home. You didn't know any of the people he'd been running around with lately? No, just the fuller woman, that's all. Can you think of anything at all that might possibly have a bearing on his death? No. Eddie was probably drinking. Wandered in the street and a car hit him. I don't know. Oh, there's the bakery man. I've got to get some bread and a few things. Excuse me? I think that's about all, don't you, Joe? Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll leave our card here, Miss Stokes, in case you want to contact us for any reason. All right. So wonderful when we were married, Eddie and I. My folks gave us this house as a wedding present. We got wonderful presents. Yeah. We had everything we wanted. A car, nice house, kids... It's wonderful that we started drinking. Then everything went. His job, everything. Started all of a sudden. I never knew why. Yes, ma'am. How do men get that way? How do they start? I don't know. We only see a part of it. Yeah? When they finish. <laughs> Twelve noon, Ben and I drove back into town to Vermont and 63rd Street for a meet with Sergeants Rogers and McClendon. They told us that they checked out the bartender who'd been on duty the night before and also seven of his customers. Their stories were almost identical. Each of them remembered seeing Eddie Stokes at the bar. Each of them remembered he was playing shuffleboard, that he was drinking heavily, and that he left the bar at about 1.45 a.m. All of us had the idea that for some reason the bartender and the customers were lying. In most cases, it's hard to find two witnesses who tell identical stories, let alone seven. For the rest of that afternoon, Rogers, McClendon, Ben, and I spent our time canvassing the neighborhood in the vicinity of the Brown Barrel Tavern. 4.45 p.m. We talked to the proprietor of a small grocery store two blocks down the street from the tavern. He told us that he rarely visited the bar, but that he thought that the man who ran the butcher shop next to his place, uh, Mr. Eugene Murray, was a regular patron of the Brown Barrel. So we went next door. Mr. Murray, we're having company tonight. Yes, ma'am. Two pounds. Nice-looking meats, Angel. Yeah, the steaks look good, don't they? Mm-hmm. Two pounds. All right. Hey, 
Anything else now, Mrs. Gidney? Got some nice, fresh kidneys today. No, no, George won't touch kidneys. That'll be all. You put it on the bill, won't you, Mr. Murray? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm, you're welcome. Yes, sir, gentlemen. Can I help you? Police officer, Mr. Murray, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, I'm sure. Glad to help out if I can. Have you ever been in the Brown Barrel Tavern down the next block there? Brown Barrel? I go there all the time. Say, would you mind if I fix up an order while we're talking? The customer's going to pick it up in a couple of minutes. I don't like to keep him waiting. Sure, go ahead. I, I got to go in the ice box. When's the last time you were in the Brown Barrel, Mr. Murray? Last night. Wife and I went to the movies. One of them English pictures. Lousy pictures. We dropped in at the barrel on the way home for a beer. About what time was that? Pretty close to two... <laughs> What's the matter? Some kind of trouble? Did you notice anything unusual while you were in there? Anybody fighting or arguing? No, we were only in there a couple of minutes, but now that you mention it, there was something funny happened. What was that? Well, the bartender Carl and a half dozen of the neighborhood gang were back in one of the booths talking together. They seemed kind of nervous, and none of them seemed to be having a good time. Yeah. The wife and I yelled hello at them, but they kind of gave us a go-by. Then this uh, drunk came up to us. Uh, any, uh, say, officer, would you reach that knife for me? Which one? Uh, that, that one. Oh, yeah, here you are. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, this uh, drunk came up to us and whispers to me, say, you better get out of here. There's been a fight. Hey, isn't that a beautiful piece of meat? Well, I didn't pay much attention to him. He was pretty drunk, could hardly understand him. I, I guess they have a lot of fights in there anyway. Is that all he told you, there'd been a fight? Yeah, that time. But he came back a couple of minutes later and whispered the same thing. You better get out. There's been a fight, he said. The wife and I just laughed at him. Mm -hmm. He said, I know all about it. A guy's been murdered. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. Fatima, the long cigarette that has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. And there's a very good reason for this amazing increase. Men and women everywhere are finding out it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. I agree, says Vic Highland, sports columnist. I agree, says Shirley Gelman, registered nurse. I agree, says Frank Fenton, author. I agree, says Nancy Appel, news writer. Yes, all agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. So, enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor and aroma. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. Six p.m. Ben and I went back to Homicide to turn the case over to them. They asked us to handle the investigation for another day because they were short of men at the moment and because there was still a big doubt as to whether or not Eddie Stokes had really been murdered. Actually, the only solid lead we had was the second-hand testimony of a drunken witness, that, and the deputy coroner's doubts that Stokes was actually the victim of a hit-and-run. Mr. Murray, the butcher, didn't know the name of the man who told him that there'd been a murder, and he could give us only a meager description. We brought Marion Fuller back in and re-questioned her. She stuck to her story. She didn't remember anything. She was released again. It looked like we were in for a long night. We went across the street for a bowl of soup and a sandwich, and when we got back, Ben called his wife and told her he'd be working late. I called my mother. Working late again? Oh, Joseph. How's your tooth feeling? Well, it's a little better, Ma. It's still pretty tender. I'm going to go to the dentist tomorrow. Yes, you've got to have that attended to right away. Bad teeth can poison your whole system. You be sure and see that dentist. Is he a good one? Yeah, he's okay. One of the fellas down here told me about him. I'll see you a little later, huh? Don't wait up. Yeah, and you don't work too late, Joseph. You need your rest. Yeah, okay, Ma. Goodbye. All right, Joseph. Goodbye. Joe. Yeah? Just talk to that butcher's wife on the phone, Miss Murray. What'd she have to say? Ask her the same questions we asked Murray. She couldn't add much. Same story. You got something for you? Yeah, Matt? Rogers and McClendon just called in. They're still out at that bar. Yeah? Finally got somebody to talk a little. What'd they get? The bar boy out there. He says there was a fight happened about 1.30. Doesn't remember who was fighting. Not much here. Bar boy's name is Milner. He told Rogers he went outside about 20 minutes to two to put the garbage out. 
He saw the Fuller woman asleep in that car. You get the license number? No. Said there was a ticket on the windshield. Ben and I checked with the sergeant of the watch at 77th Street Division. He told us Unit 111 was assigned to the area where the brown barrel was located. In checking their worksheet, we found that Unit 111 had issued a hang-on citation the night before to a car parked near 6330 and one half Vermont Avenue, the address of the Brown Barrel Tavern. We checked the license number through DMV and found that the car was registered to a William R. Huddy, 14 Naylor Street. We drove out to the Naylor Street address and talked to Huddy's wife. She told us he was playing in a shuffleboard tournament that night at a bar down on South Olive Street. 8.55 p.m., we checked in at the bar. Barton. Oh, yes, sir. What'll it be? Do you know if there's a William Huddy in here? He's supposed to be playing a shuffleboard game here tonight. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. He's with the Highland Park team. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, that's him up now. Out on the blue shirt. Thank you. Come on, Ben. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it, Bill. Good wait. Make it another three. That cleans him. Good one, Bill. Yeah, that's pretty close to beat that one, Max. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah? Are you William Huddy? Yeah, that's right. Police officers. We'd like to talk to you a minute. Oh? What about? I'd like to ask you a few questions. You step over here a minute. Oh, yeah. All right. <coughs> Were you at the Brown Barrel Tavern out in Vermont last night? Yeah, I was. Why? What's the matter? You know uh, Marion Fuller? Yeah. yeah. She hangs around the place. She goes with a guy named Eddie. Did you drive her home last night? Oh. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I did. She passed out in my car. She's a nice kid, but she drinks a lot. I drove her home. Do you mind telling us what happened at the bar last night when you were there? Well, I come in about 9 o'clock and I start playing shuffleboard with a couple of guys. This guy, Eddie Stokes, is one of them. Yeah? Well, he got in a beef with a guy at the bar over Marion. It's nothing big, though. The guy left after a while. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. That's about all. I left the place around 1.30 and they said Eddie was beefing with some merchant seamen about that time. Was the Fuller girl still at the bar at that time? No, when I went outside, I saw her sleeping in my car, so I drove her home. I left her off and then come back to the bar. That's when they told me. Told you what? Well, they said Eddie had a fight with this merchant seaman. They said it'd be better if we kept it quiet. Who told you that? Call a bartender. And I got the real story from one of the fellows I was playing shuffleboard with, Leo McCarty. What did he tell you? Well, he said that when Eddie Stokes left, the merchant seaman followed him out. He said he chased Eddie. McCarty went out about five minutes later. Yeah. Well, the merchant seaman was gone as Stokes was lying in the gutter down the street. Mm hmm Did McCarty look at him? Yeah, he said Stokes looked pretty bad. So he looked like he was dead, but I, I wouldn't believe that. Why not? This McCarty always exaggerates. 10.15 p.m., we had William Huddy come back to the office with us where we questioned him further and took his statement. Then we had his friend Leo McCarty brought in along with a bartender at the Brown Barrel Tavern and the customers that he'd framed his story with. McCarty was the first to give us the straight story and then the others followed. The bartender, Carl Jansen, who also owned the bar, was the last to break. How about it, Jansen? Why didn't we get a straight story to begin with? Well, what about the publicity? How, how would that look, a murder around my place? Could work out worse than that, Mr. Jansen. You've been withholding evidence. You talk these people into the same deal. I'd protect myself. The newspapers, all the... Scandal. Wreck a man's business. I had to keep it quiet. It's not my fault that Stokes is killed. I, I didn't do it. I'm not to blame. No, but you know who is to blame. Now, how about it? Who is he? Well, he works on the ships. Comes in here most of the time when he's in port. What's his name? Henry Baxter. I've cashed some of his paychecks. Ben, you better get the captain, huh? Yeah. Hit and run felony Friday. Oh, yeah. No, just a minute. For you, Jansen. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Yes, Rita, just a minute. Sergeant. Yeah. It's my wife. She's at the bar now. She thought you ought to know. Yeah. Henry Baxter. Frida says he just came in. I talked to Jansen's wife and told her to delay Baxter as long as possible without arousing his suspicions. 11.25 p.m. Ben and I and Mr. Jansen, along with Rogers and McClendon, drove out to the Brown Barrel Tavern on Vermont. When we got there, Baxter was gone. Mrs. Jansen told us he was pretty drunk by the time he left the bar. She'd watched him go down one block, cross the street, and then enter a small nightclub on the opposite side called the Pink Shamrock. She'd been keeping an eye on the place, and as far as she knew, Baxter was still inside. 
We went down the street to the nightclub. Rogers and McClendon covered the back entrance. We got inside in the middle of a floor show. A blonde was doing some kind of a dance. Can you spot him, Mr. Jansen? Mm. No. No, I don't see him yet. How about over on this side, back in the corner there? Mm. Yeah. No. No, he's not there. It's so dark in here, I can't see too well. There's the rear exit to the place. He could have slipped out that way. Gentlemen, I'd like to have your picture taken. Souvenir photograph? No, no, thanks. Maybe we better check with the waiter, Ben. All right, Sergeant, just a minute. That man over there at that table. Where? Yeah, yeah, I'm almost positive. Where? Right, right there next to that pillar. Just behind it, you see? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's him, that's him. All right, come on, Ben. You stay right here, Mr. Jansen. You bet. Waiter. Hey, waiter. Give the coke high. You waiters, another coke high. Your name is Henry Baxter? Yeah, that's right. What? Police officers like to talk to you. Yeah. Well, sit down. Outside. Outside nothing. Can we see a show? Let's go outside. Come on, Baxter. Hey, wait a minute. What's the beef, anyway? You know what the beef is? Sure, I know what the beef is. Come on, let's go. A lousy punk got his strokes trying to give me a bad time. Now he knows what a bad time is. Come on. Rousey punk stokes. I showed him how it's done. Yeah, keep your voice down. I slugged him. Pounded his head on the curb. He was drunk. He never knew what happened. Come on, outside. Hey, everybody. I killed Eddie Stokes. I killed him. Right down. Let's get him out of here. Yeah, okay. How's that tooth feel, Joe? It seems okay. Better have the dentist yank it out first thing in the morning. Oh, I think I'll hold off a while. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. On July 30th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Henry John Baxter was tried and convicted in Superior Court of Manslaughter. He received the sentence as prescribed by law and is now serving his term in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all long cigarettes has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Sarah Berner stars in Sarah's Private Caper next on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, this true story concerns the heart of a great city. It took 58 minutes to resolve the question of its safety or its total destruction. This is the story of those 58 minutes. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes brings you Dragnet. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. 
Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, November 15th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were off duty reporting in on an emergency call. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Lynn White, deputy chief of police. My name's Friday. It was 8.25 a.m. when I walked into the main street entrance of the city hall. I'm Friday? Yeah, that's right. You have to take this elevator, Sergeant. It's the only one to serve. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to run you up to 16. Chief's waiting for you up there. Well, what's the pitch? Only one elevator here in service out of 10. The place looks deserted. What's going on? Well, nobody in the building, Sergeant. All the office people have been sent home. Lots of trouble. Somebody declare a holiday? No joke, Sergeant. Big trouble. Well, you convinced me. What is it? Here we are. 16th floor. Okay. Over here, Friday. Right. Hi, Jim. Hello, Ben. You made good time. I came as soon as I got the call in. Sorry to have to bring you back in. You worked last night, didn't you? Yeah, midnight to 8 this morning. Sorry. Come on. What is it, Skipper? Why all the hush hush? Where do we get inside? In here. Okay. Number one, let's keep our voices down. All right. I'll make it as brief as I can. Every night counts. What time you got, Friday? 8.33. All right, here it is. 55 minutes ago, a man walked into this building with a homemade bomb under his arm. If we don't release his brother from the county jail by 9 o'clock this morning, he says he'll pull the trigger on the bomb and blow up the whole building. He's kidding, Skipper. Who is the guy? Name's Vernon Carney. Here's his package. He and his brother have been in and out of jail since 1937. Small-time thieves. Mm, FBI kickback here. We had him once before, both of them. Brother's name is Elwood. Serving a year for car stripping. And this two-bit thief is sitting here in the city hall with a bomb on his lap? That's right. The next room. Well, what kind of a bomb is it, Lynn? You think he's bluffing? Could be bluffing. The crime lab says no. Lee Jones from the lab get a look at it? He's been in here twice. One of the boxes glass. Says he can't see much without a closer look, but you can't get near the guy. All right, what do you want us to do? It's a volunteer job. I can take it or leave it. I won't order you to do it. How do you want to handle it? You sure you want a piece of this, Romero? No, no, he doesn't. He's got a family. Can you get me another single man? We'll give it a try. Wait a minute, Joe. What makes this job so different? Every time we kick in a door, we never know what's on the other side. That's what makes it different. This time we do. No, you're not going to cut me out. Not the only time I know what I'm getting into. All right. Chandler's tried, Hannon, Davis, Watson, they've all tried. This guy Carney knows what he's doing. He's no pushover, but somebody's got to get that bomb away from him. It's your baby now. I looked at my watch. It was 8.36. We left Chief White and started down the hall. If Carney was going to make good his threat to blow up the building by 9 o'clock, we had exactly 24 minutes to talk him out of it. Ben and I figured we'd better look him over first and then work out some kind of a plan. Maybe just talking to him would do it. Vernon Carney was sitting in a straight back chair against the far wall facing the door. He was seated between two windows that looked out over the city. In the center of the right wall was a connecting door leading to the office where Chief White had briefed us. The door was locked on both sides. Just off the center and favoring the left of the room was a small filing table. There was a dictaphone on it. In the near left corner, shielded by a white screen, was a small wash basin. Vernon Carney sat erect holding a black box on his lap. He held his right hand inside one end of the box. Ben and I walked into the room. What do you say to a man with a bomb? That's close enough. Cigarette, Kearney? I'm not smoking right now. 
What are you trying to prove? You know what I want. We're not going to let your brother out of jail. You've got until 9 o'clock to change your mind. According to that clock up there in the ward, you've got 24 minutes. If we go, you're going with us, Carney. Don't think much of a brain to figure that one out, copper. What made you think you could get away with it? I haven't yet. It ain't 9 o'clock. Unless that clock's slow. I haven't checked it against my pocket watch lately. That's the one that's running this show. Have you given any thought to all the innocent people that are going to go up with that thing of yours? My brother's innocent. I want him out of jail. The court says he's guilty. He'll get out when he serves his time. That's where you're wrong, copper. He gets out at 9 o'clock this morning. All right, come on, Connie. Get your hand out of that box. Put the box on the table. You think I'm bluffing, don't you? I'm going to let you get within five feet of me before I make a liar out of you. All right, Connie. I guess you mean business. You can take three more steps and find out for sure. Suppose we did let your brother out. We'd just come out and pick him up again, you along with him. If you could find us. Let's get this straight. If we let your brother Elwood out, how do we know you'll keep your promise? What promise? I haven't made any promises. You just get Elwood down here first, then we'll talk about it. Look, there's just one thing I can't figure, Carney. Yeah, what's that? If we don't let your brother out, you say you'll pull the trigger on that bomb. What are you going to prove by then? It's 8.37 now. You've got 23 minutes left? No, I wish you'd answer that one for me. Why do you want to kill a lot of innocent people? Don't try to con me, copper. I know they cleared everybody out of this building 45 minutes ago. I know they cleaned out the whole block. They got it roped off. Where'd you get your information? I got a couple of windows here to look out of. Don't you think it's about time you sent somebody over to get Elwood? What's to stop us from leaving the building along with the other few officers and let you sit here and touch off that bomb? Go ahead. Won't be a long wait without you. Who are you trying to kid? You'd let me blow up $10 million with the taxpayers' money? No, you're going to let Elwood out. You wait till the last minute to do it. But you let him out. All right, let's go. Listen, yep. I'm still not convinced that Carney can back up what he says. Then why don't you take the box away from him? Yeah. Well, we're in a spot, let's face it. How about us getting him first? How are you going to handle it? I'm not top man on the pistol range, but I could wing him. And then he hands the box to you? Or maybe he falls and his reflex action pulls the trigger. Okay, I don't wing him. I stop him for keep. You just can't walk in there and shoot him down. Why not? You do the same thing with any armed criminal. Yeah, but you warn him first. I'll warn him. And after you shoot him, you find out it's a harmless gadget. Couldn't have gone off in a million years. No, a gun's not the answer. We can't shoot him until we're positive. We'll be positive by 9 o'clock, but then there might not be anybody around to shoot him. We've located Connie's apartment. There's a detail out there checking it now. But Shelley and Morris. Have you got any ideas at all? Anything we could try? Well, that's why I called you in. None of us have gotten any further than you did just now. But there's just one thing I want to know for sure. Yeah, Friday. Is it or isn't it? We all want to know. Either way, we got to get that box away from you. I get it. White speaking. Yeah. You did? Now stay out there. I'll call you. That was Pacelli. They just found 28 sticks of dynamite in Carney's apartment. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker recorded last week in New York. Hi there. My name is Bab Beckwith. Bab, that's short for Bethany Ann Beckwith. I live in New York City and I'm a fashion stylist. The other day at a showing of the new fall styles, I ran out of cigarettes. A friend of mine, a designer, introduced me to the new long Fatima. I really wish someone had told me about them sooner. Fatimas are a lot milder than the cigarettes I've been smoking. And they have a delightful flavor, too. I'm very glad to recommend them to you. Because I know, from experience, it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatimas. And more and more smokers every day are finding that out. 
Actual figures show extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. We knew now Carney wasn't kidding. We could see into the bomb through the glass window in one end. There was dynamite inside, and there was dynamite in Carney's room. We didn't know if he had the nerve to pull the trigger. We didn't know if it'd go off when he did, but with only minutes remaining, nobody wanted to take the chance. From here on in, all of us agreed that Vernon Carney sat in the next room, holding in his two hands a force powerful enough to destroy us all. I looked at my watch. It was 20 minutes till 9. How do we get it away from him? I got an idea. It might work. What's that? Well, Carney's sitting against the far wall between two windows, and they're both open. That's right. If we could get a man through one of those windows, we might get Carney from behind. How are you going to get him? Well, whoever gets through the window could slug him. What do you do then? Somebody grabs the box. The crime lab can tell us what to do with it then. How do we get a man through one of those windows? We're on the 16th floor. Well, there's some kind of a ledge that runs around the building on each story, isn't there? Wide enough for a man to walk on? Let's take a look. All right. Let's see. Looks pretty narrow, Joe. Yeah. A good 18 inches. Could be done. Too risky. It's been raining out that ledge is slippery. Strong wind out there, Joe. Tear a man right off the building. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, there's still a way. How about a ladder? Sixteen floor, Skipper. Well, there might be a way. The fire department would know that. I'll get Battalion Chief Erickson. Is Lee Jones in the building? No, he's over at the crime lab. I'll get him up here, too. I don't know, Friday. Maybe it'll work. It's got to, Lynn. All right, now, look. It's going to take a couple of minutes to set this up. We've got to know what Connie's doing every second of that time. How about the dictaphone on the table in there? Good. Get it on without him seeing you. We'll try. That dictaphone in there is connected to this one in here. This room is 1614. You got that? Yeah. All right, push down key 1614 on that machine in there and leave it down. Get the receiver off the hook and leave it off. Leave the receiver off. That's right. You know, if it isn't off the hook, we won't be able to hear a thing in here. Right. Come on, Ben. Lynn White speaking. Give me Chief Erickson. Where's my brother? Still in his cell. You coppers are long on talk, short on time. Yeah, we know. I'm telling you, if you're on good, you better get Elwood over here. Carney, I'll bet if we get your brother on the phone here, he'll tell you that he doesn't want any part of this. You mean Elwood doesn't want to get out since when? Sure he wants out, but not your way. He's only got a year to serve. Why don't you leave him alone? I told Al. I told him I'd get him out. He didn't think I could do it, but I'm doing it. I'll make you a bet, Carney. You let us get your brother on the phone. He won't walk out of here with you. Get him on the phone. All right. Where are you going? The phone's over here. Have to use the dictaphone. I got to get an okay from the chief. Elwood's still a prisoner. What's the matter with the phone? No operators. You know the building's been cleared. That's right. I almost forgot. Okay, you can use the dictaphone. It's Friday, Chief. Connie wants to talk to his brother. I know you'll have to send somebody over. Have him put the call on the extension. Wait a minute. What's that extension number, there? 2351. 2351, Lynn. Right? It'll take a minute. All right. I kind of like to talk to Al. Been a couple of months since I've seen him. We've always been together, me and Al, most of the time. Joe, let's go in and see if we can't hurry that call. That's a good idea, boy. It's 16 minutes to nine. Yeah. Hey, cop. Yeah. You got to hang up the dictaphone, didn't you? I put the receiver back on the dictaphone. Ben and I had failed to make good on the first step of the plan. When we got outside the door, we briefed Davis and Watson. They went in to sit with Carney. It would be their job to keep us posted on Carney's movements. The dictaphone was out. We went back into the office next door. Chief Sam Erickson of the fire department and Lieutenant Lee Jones from the crime lab were already there. Would have been a help. We haven't got time to cry over it. Carney's wide awake, Skipper. He doesn't miss a thing. White told us a plan, Friday. We can't run a ladder up from the street. Too high, huh, Chief? The best we've got is a 100-foot aerial. You figure 12 foot to the story, that'll take you up 96 feet, eight floors. Mm -hmm. We got the latest equipment. What's that idea you had, Jones? Sam, can you get a hold of a pump here in a hurry? Sure, we got a lot of scaling ladders, but you got nothing up there to hook them on. You figure on dropping down from the floor above? That's right, and I figure a pump here would do it. 
Sure, well, you could uh, make it past the window cell up there, but you got a foot and a half ledge in the way. No, what you want's a lifeline. You mean lower a man on a rope, Chief? Yeah, Romero, that's the uh, quickest and the quietest. Could you rig it so one of my boys could do it? Sure, Len. What's the risk? None, if you work it right. We'll strap on a life belt, give the man heavy leather gloves. Two of my men will lower him down. Pick your lightest man. What do you think, Lee? That's it. What do we do with the bomb when we get it? I figure that box Connie's holding is about a foot square. Here's what I'll do. I'll get you a bucket with a foot and a half mouth, and it'll be full of water. Yeah. I'll have it right outside the door to that office. When you get that box, place it in the water. We'll get the bucket out of the building as fast as we can. And once we get the bomb underwater, we're in the clear? I can't promise you that, but it's the safest way to handle it under the circumstances. All right, that's it. Sam, you take care of your end? Right away. I'll get a detail to give me a hand down the street, and we'll take the bomb to a safe area and decommission it. Let's move on it. All right, then. Which part do you want, the rope or the bomb? You call it. Fire Chief Erickson said the lightest man on the rope. That's me, Joe. All right, I'll get the bomb out of the building. Okay, that's the routine. We carry this with you. The man that comes down that rope has one chance to make good. Slug him and make it count. There's no second try. Yeah. And Joe, when you grab that box, you've got to get it away from Carney before he can squeeze the trigger. Then you've got to get it down the street. The elevator. You know how to operate it? Well, it's pretty simple, but I'll double check with the operator. And you better do it right now. Okay. Say we better get Carney's brother on the phone for him. He seemed anxious. That might be a pretty good idea. All right, Romero. That's the outside phone. Get the city jail. All right, Skipper. Get going, Friday. All right. Hey, you, elevator man. Yes, sir. I want to see if I know how to work this thing of yours. Uh, you taking over the elevator? In a couple of minutes. You want to check me out? Nothing to it, Sergeant. Um, here's the control. You push this lever right to go up, left to go down. You see this little trigger on the underside of the handle? Yeah. Uh, that's a safety lock. Be sure you squeeze it. You can't move the lever. That's all right if I try it. Okay. Where will I turn off the master switch? All right. That's it. Right to go up, left to go down. Uh-huh. All right. Now, how do you operate the doors? Automatic. They work off the control lever. When the control lever is locked in the up or down position, the doors will close. I got it. Now, in case they jam, this red emergency button up here? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, push it. If that doesn't close, then we call the repairman. Okay. I think I got it. You want to turn that switch back on? All right. You sure now? I have my orders to get out of the building. I'll just leave the elevator right here and take the stairs down. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sergeant, hmm. just curious. You going to take the bomb down this car? We're going to try. You won't have any trouble. We haven't had an elevator failure in 18 months. The elevator man turned and went down the stairs. I started down the corridor and met Ben outside the office. He told me that Lee Jones and Chief Erickson were on their way up in the freight elevator at the rear of the building with the necessary equipment. The two fire department volunteers were with him. The phone call had been put through to the city jail, and in a minute, Elwood Carney would be ready at the other end of the line. We went in to tell Carney. I told him over at the jail to put the call through on extension 2351. When's it coming through? Right now. You got Elwood with you? No. We told you we'd get him on the phone for you. Call will be through in a minute. A minute's a long time, cop. You only got 12 of them left. Elwood's going to talk you out of this. Oh, sure, sure. Everybody's going to talk me out of this. First, it was them other two cops, the little porky guy and another monkey. And you and this Dixie doughhead here. Now it's Elwood. Now, come off it, will you? Get my brother over here. That's him now. It's your brother, Connie, I guess. They put you. Just going to get the phone. You want to talk to your brother, don't you? I'll take care of the phone. We'll just disconnect it for a little... Now, get this straight, copper. I'm through with you, stinking, rotten lion. I want Elwood here, and I want him now. Now, bring him here before I... Oh, you all the pieces. Who threw that phone out in the hall? I did. You want me to go out there and pick it up? Connie, that's not going to get you any place. Are you the big boss around here? Maybe. Are you, aren't you? I answered you. All right, big boy, I got a piece of advice for you. You take your rookie cops here and get it through their thick heads. I mean what I say. I want my brother over here in this room. And you've got just 11 minutes to get it done. Now you tell him that, will you? All right, Carney. It's your show. All right, we got to work fast now. Jones, everything's set for you. Got the bucket with the water right here. Car's waiting down the street. Right. Erickson, your boy's ready? Upstairs, waiting. We all know what to do. I'll need somebody to give me a hand with Carney when he falls. I'll be in there with you Friday. Ready to go upstairs, Chief? Any time. One thing you ought to know. What's that? Wind's getting stronger, about 20 mile an hour out there right now. That's going to last us up? No, but it's going to increase the sway. You've got to allow for it. How do you mean? Wind's coming from the south. We'll lower you just to the right of the window. If I figure right, the wind will do the rest. 
bigger risk, but we don't control the weather. How are you going to do it, Ben? As soon as I get in position, I'll reach in through the window on his right and I'll use the billy. Try to catch him on the right side of the head. One good hit should put him away. Make it two and be sure, huh? All right, you ready, Chief? Let's go. What's the time, Friday? 8.50. Shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes for Romero to get down to that window unless the wind gives him trouble. Jones, there's no use you sticking around. I'll give Friday a hand. That's my job. We've got to keep you alive to decommission a bomb. Bum joke. See you downstairs. You ready, Lynn? Yeah. Scared, Friday? Yeah. Makes us even. Come on. Lynn White and I went into the next room with Vernon Carney. Ben was going to make a try from the window on Carney's right. Somehow, he had to keep his attention on us and away from that window. If anything went wrong and Carney got out of position, the plan had failed. If Chief Erickson didn't estimate the force of the wind correctly, the plan had failed. I looked at my watch. It was eight minutes to nine. Carney, anything we can say that'll make you change your mind? I've asked you a hundred times. Now I'm ordering you. You're going to get to a phone and have somebody send Elwood over here right now. I'm, I'm through waiting. Now move. You ripped the phone out, Carney. Well, then find another one. I told you, I'm sick of your two-bit stalling. We've got until 9 o'clock to make up our mind about this. You had until 9. You wouldn't do what I told you. Now I'm cutting you short. You guys got exactly one minute to get a phone in this room where I can hear you call a jail and have him send Elwood over here. You said 9, Carney. All right, Joe. We'll give him what he wants. David, son, lock the connecting door to this office. I get the phone, Lee. Cord reach? Just a minute. Yeah. Your brother's a prisoner. He's in our custody and he's under our protection. We can't place his life in jeopardy. Leave that up to hell. Come with him. This is Lynn White. We want Elwood Carney over here at City Hall. His brother wants to see him. Explain the situation. If he wants to come, get him over here. Leave it up to him. Room 1614, you'll have to use the freight elevator. And tell him to hurry. Yeah. Tell him to hurry. Oh, that's the only smart thing you've done today. Now, why don't you go next door and figure out another angle? We'll wait for Elwood, too. You don't think I'd let you get out now, do you? We're all going to wait right here for my brother. In case he don't show up, you're going to see me pull the plug. Now, sit down. Not so close, right where you are. Sit down. Loud clock, ain't it? It's windy. It's getting cold in here. Maybe I had a closer window. Hey, turn on the heat. Stay put, cop. What's that? What's going on? Get the wind, cop. Cop! There's somebody out there. I can see his feet. You stupid cops. Pull him up. Get, get back there. You pull him up. All right, tell him to pull him up. Pull him out. You bet I win, you dumb coppers. You didn't think I'd miss a trick like that. Now we'll just close the windows, boys. There's one. And locked. Here's your brother, Carney. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Hi, Vern. I did it. I told you. I told you I'd do it, didn't I? That's far enough for the rest of you. Al, you come on over here. Crazy, Vern, you're crazy. That's what they've been trying to tell me. We're going home now. How are you going to do it? There's a million cops outside. People all over town heard about this. They're holding the crowd back. They ain't going to stop us now. Adam. You'll never make it, either one of you. I got him this far, didn't I? We'll make it. Vern, do you think we could do it? You. Yeah? You're going to get a car ready for us, a fast one. Have it in front of the building. Move! All right, Friday, do what he tells you. All right. Hold it! Yeah? If you ain't back by 9 o'clock, the deal still holds. I told them I'd pull the pin at nine, Al, if they didn't let you out. You ain't fooling, I Vern. That gadget really blow? Four miles high. They won't let you pull it. We're getting out. All right, copper, get the car. You got four minutes. Hey, Ben! Ben! What happened? He spotted me? Yeah, no time to explain. Now, listen, we gotta work fast. Yeah? We had to bring Carney's brother over from the jail. How much time we got? Less than four minutes. How about the ledge? Think you can do it? Strong winds, you'll have to hang on like a fly. I don't know. I can give it a try. Okay, same plan. Every second counts. 
Now, I can't brief Lynn. He's in the room with the guy. It's up to you and me. I'll get on the ledge from one of these offices. I hope I'll make it. If you don't, we'll know you tried. Now, hurry. Hey, Ben, wait a minute. Uh, yeah? I forgot. The window is the one on his right. He locked it. You'll have to crawl around to the one on the left. You got it? Right. Okay. Hey. Carl, be ready in two minutes out in front. Fine. Ellen and I will just sit here and wait. It's going to be good being back together, well... We always were real good together, Vern. Well, that's the way, brothers ought to be together all the time. Yeah, Vern, I'd feel better with the gun. We don't need no gun. We got the bomb. We need the gun when we get out, when we get on the road. Okay, take your pick. They all got him. You, give him yours. I'm not carrying a gun. I left it in the other room. A cop without a gun? <laughs> Who's kidding who? I left it in the other room. Frisk the big boy, though. He's got one, huh? It's about time for that car, ain't it? It's two minutes to nine. Yeah, this feels like it right on his hip. Hey, you grab him, Joe. I got him. Get the box. Leave that guy alone. I got him, Ben. I gotta get his hand out of it. Run, Joe. Get in the water. Run! elevator, 16 floors isn't very much, but I never shared an elevator with a live bomb. It seemed like hours between floors. I kept watching the bucket. The bomb was completely underwater. A small stream of bubbles was hissing to the surface. I waited. Main floor. I picked up the bucket and ran for the street. I missed the first step. I fell forward. The bucket spun out of my hand. I sprawled flat on the sidewalk. I waited for the explosion. Didn't go off, Friday. Yeah. I gave it a good chance, Lee. It was all there. Look, at least a dozen sticks of dynamite. Snyder, bring that over here. Here you are, Lieutenant. Thanks. Here's why it didn't go off. Yeah? Had it rigged for a hard trigger pull. Would have taken a good yank to set this one off. All right, Joe. I've been clumsy. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 15th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Vernon Carney was examined by five different psychiatrists appointed by the Superior Court and found to be mentally incompetent. He is now confined in the state mental institution for the criminally insane. Elwood Carney is now serving the balance of his sentence with no time off for good behavior. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all, Long Cigarettes has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, Sarah's Private Caper with comedian Sarah Berner on NBC. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to a robbery detail. A holdup has been committed in a neighboring city. A bystander is shot to death. Two others are wounded. The bandits are ruthless, well-armed. Your job, get them. 
If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 6th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Ed Walker. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from Calvary Cemetery. It was 11.45 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Joe, how'd the funeral go? Pretty good turnout. Sure, sorry I couldn't make it. Well, one of us had to be in court. Yeah. A lot of the boys out there, huh? Yeah. Martin had a lot of friends. He was a good cop. You see his wife? Yeah. Wife took it hard again. Pretty hard, yeah. Are you about ready for lunch? I better make up the logbook first now. We're a little behind. Yeah, all right. Hi, Stu. Ben, what's with you? Oh, same old thing. Say, what's the DR number on that job we handled yesterday? Hmm? The grocery store thing? You know, we showed those mug shots to the victims. You remember the DR number on it? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I got it here. Uh, 374332. 332, thanks. Mm hmm. My name's Frank Cheney. Just been paroled from Folsom. Can you tell me where I registered? Yeah. I'll get one of the men from the rehabilitation detail. He'll take care of it. Okay, thanks. Excuse me, Ben. No, oh, yeah. Bosberg. Johnny Bosberg? Yeah. Got a minute? Something for you here. I'll be right there. Did you contact the witnesses in this report here? Let me see. This one. What do you got, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah. I took Hello care of it. Hello, Mr. Dent. Want the registers next time? Hmm, okay. Excuse me, Romero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, you want to register? Yeah, my name's Frank Cheney. Okay. Address? 218 Belgrade. Belgrade. Where have you been? Folsom. Got out Saturday. Okay, what'd you fall for? Robbery, first degree. First degree. How much do you owe? Served 18 years. I'm on life parole. Life parole. Okay. Hey, Thaxter, you want to tell Rambo we're out for seven? Oh, wait a couple minutes, huh? You see the guy at the desk? The one with Bosberg? Yeah, he's an ex-con, why? Frank Cheney, 1931. Jack Taylor and I had him. First big one we ever drew. Is that so? Did you ever hear of him? Used to call him the gentleman bandit? Yeah, 1931, Claude. That's 18 years ago. Cheney was the biggest of them. Came from a wealthy family, too. Father's a millionaire. You sent him up, huh? Sent Quentin. Tried to break out with a partner. His partner killed a trustee. Cheney was sent to Folsom. From a millionaire family. That's a queer one. Yeah. Well, how about that lunch, fellas? Yeah, let's go. Seems like it could have been yesterday, 1931. We grow old right along with the thieves, huh? Where we go, Federal Cafe? Well, it's all right with me. 18 years. Yeah. Sure goes by in a hurry. I wonder if Cheney thinks so. As far as day-to-day -day routine goes, police work is pretty much like any other job. To the rookie detective just starting in, there's new things to see, new things to learn. But five or six years on the detail and the job gets pretty ordinary. You see a lot of dirt, a lot of trouble and tragedy, and after a while you begin to wonder what all the glamour's about and the excitement that's supposed to go along with the job. The fall months went by pretty slow. On November 3rd, we closed a case against a gang of drugstore hold-up men. In December, Ben's youngster fell off a fence and sprained his wrist. My Uncle George from Renton, Washington, visited my mother and me in January, stayed a couple of weeks. On January 28th, it rained. Ben and I checked into the office where we got a phone call from Lieutenant Mort Gear of the San Diego Police Department. He gave us additional information on a finance company holdup which had been pulled in San Diego the day before. In the robbery, one bystander had been shot and killed and another one wounded by the two bandits. They also shot a police officer three times through the stomach when he tried to stop him. 
Next day, Sergeants Ormsby and McGuire from San Diego arrived, and we helped them check the suspects through the stats office. A couple of bad ones, Joe. Both have guns, and they use them. One of them got away in a car, and the other one on foot. Is that right, McGuire? Yeah, a big one used the car. Yeah, size ought to help some. Let's see, 45 years old, height 6 foot 1 or 2 inches, weight 275 to 85 pounds. Anybody get a look at the car, Ormsby? Blue Ford sedan, 1940 or 41 model. That's all we got. Mm, it's a rough one. After all the shooting, the witnesses didn't know what they saw, all mixed up. Well, how about the other one, the guy who got away on foot? He's a WMA, about 50 years old, 5 feet 8, 9 inches, 145, 55 pounds. Where's glasses? Yeah, we got that on the teletype. Is that all? Uh, no, we traced from the Greyhound bus depot about 6 blocks from the holdup. Changed his clothes in the washroom there and left behind a coat and a gun. Yeah? The coat was kind of give parolees from state pen. Mm -hmm. Checked it through our crime lab. Same kind of suits are issued to all ex-cons. No make. Well, at least you know one of them's an ex-con. How about that gun you found? It's a murder weapon. Our ballistics men went over it, no prints. Tried to trace the serial number, no record. CII in Sacramento is trying to run it down. Well, we got any hunches? A few. We we're almost sure both of them had gone the route before. Pretty cool. Shot down three people, didn't bat an eye. How much did they take in the holder? 11,000. Hey, your stats office make a run those descriptions yet? Yeah, this morning. Or has got the list of possibilities. They're pulling the mud cast now. I'll be winding it up right now, don't you think? Yeah, let's check. Mm -hmm. This way, fellas. Yeah. Well, go ahead, McGuire. Oh, thanks. How's the wife, Ormsby? Oh, fine, Ben. She's expecting again. What are you going to do, raise an army? Four kids? That's not so bad. McGuire's wife wants six. How about that, Mac? You've got five now. No point in quitting when you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Frank? Yeah, Joe. You know Russ Ormsby and Tony McGuire, don't you? San Diego PD? Yeah, sure. Met him last trip. Hi. Hi, Hi Frank. Good Tony. to see you. Good. Just ready to call you. Got those mug shots together for you. Here, got them right here. Okay. There you are. This is next for suspect one. This is for number two. Okay, Frank. We'll check them out with the witnesses. There's one mug there. Here, let me show you. Here, this one. Yeah. Matches the description pretty close. Safe man betrayed, but he can go any route. Name's Weber. First name? Stanley. Mm -hmm. Call him Turk, I think. Nickname. Know anything about him? He's an ex con. Ormsby and McGuire drove back to San Diego to show the mugshots to the holdup witnesses and see if they could get an identification. Late the next afternoon, they called back to tell us that Stanley Turk Weber had definitely been identified from his mugshot by four of the five witnesses as one of the holdup men. His partner remained unidentified. We called Turk Weber's parole officer, got all the available information on the suspect, including his latest address, an apartment house on North Alameda. Weber wasn't there. We talked with the apartment house manager, and he told us that Turk hadn't been seen there since the day before the San Diego robbery and murder. We had a stakeout put on the apartment, and Ben and I went back to the office and had the record bureau pull Weber's package. On his mama sheet, Ben spotted a familiar name, Henry Garson, another ex-con, who was listed as one of Turk Weber's closest friends. Well, we got a hold of Garson's parole officer. He told us Garson had had his parole transferred to San Diego, where he had disappeared two weeks before he was wanted for violation of parole. We tried to check Weber through his relatives. We couldn't find any. But Henry Garson's report showed that he had a brother, Al, who ran a dry cleaning shop down in Seal Beach. He had no criminal record. The next morning, we drove down to see him. Yeah, Henry came around last July. It's the last time I saw him. I wanted to borrow my car. You got any idea where he might be now? No. Nope. You're his brother. I don't know where he is. That's the truth. I don't want to know where he is. Was anyone with him when he came to see you last? No. You know who his friends are? His friends? No. Would you look at these pictures, please? See if you can identify any of them. No, I just... These here. No. No. Ah. How about these? No. 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 No, no, look, can't, can't you talk to me later? It's not good for business having cops around a shop. Who would you yell for if a shop was held up, Mr. Carson? What's that got to do with it? Your brother's in trouble. We might stop him from getting in deeper. No, look away, now. Hello, Mrs. Runner. Good morning, Al. Can I help you? No, right. You go ahead and wait in the gentleman. No, no that's, that's all right. right. They're just waiting. They're just waiting. Can I help you? Yeah. My husband's so clean and fresh. Can you have five Tuesday? Tuesday, yeah, I'll drink. My plaid jacket being pressed. Right. Could you sort this little chair here? Where? Yeah, yeah, we take care of that. 
Tuesday, all right? There you go. Thanks, Miss Winter. All right, Dad. Bye. Bye, Miss Winter. Thanks. I don't like to hold you up, Garson. Just a few more questions. All right. Now, you said the last time your brother was here, he wanted to borrow your car. Is that right? That's right. Did you let him have it? I let him have nothing. How about the rescue family? Oh, can't you let us alone? If Henry's in trouble, let him take care of it. We've got troubles enough of our own. This is important, Garson. We've got to have your cooperation. Well, why me? You know, Henry's no good, I admit it. But he's still my brother. Yeah. You ask me to send him to jail? If he belongs there, yeah. Look, I don't want any trouble. Yeah, we'll be in. My mother lives in Santa Barbara. Just moved there. I got the address. Henry goes to see her every once in a while. When's the last time he saw her? Two weeks ago. I was there, too. And something else. It's sad. Henry had a gun. 11 a.m. Tuesday. Ben and I drove back to the office and put in a call to the Santa Barbara Police Department. We asked him to put a stake out on the home of Henry Garson's mother and to notify us the minute Garson was apprehended. We contacted San Diego and told him what we'd found out. After that, we doubled back on Turk Weber. From one of our informants, we heard that Weber and Garson had gone into some kind of a business together. For a bank roll, they'd succeeded in getting a loan from the Second National Bank out in Glendale. 1 p.m., we drove out and checked with the manager of the bank's loan department, Mr. Peabody. Here we are, officers. Stanley T. Weber, Henry Garson. Loan papers were signed over a month ago. What kind of a loan was it, Peabody? Business loan. Garson and Weber came in with another man. They talked to our manager, Mr. Ascot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. What business are they in? Trucking concern. They wanted the money to buy equipment, more trucks. How much money did they borrow? $4,500, usual terms. I guess you inquired into their background. Oh, yes, their whole financial background. Did you know that Garson and Weber are both ex-convicts? I beg your pardon? I said, did you know that both of them are ex-convicts? You sure you haven't made a mistake? Henry Garson, Stanley T. Weber? Yeah, that's right. What'd they offer for collateral? Well, they had some of their equipment, two trucks, and then, of course, there was the cosigner. Who was that? The name's right here on the loan papers. I see. Right here. Co-signer, Frank Cheney. Two thirty p.m. Ben and I checked back into the office and went down the hall to R and I. We pulled a package on Frank Bertram Cheney. White male American, five foot eight and a half inches, 152 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes. The record read like a dime novel. Almost twenty years before, Cheney had crashed into the headlines of Pacific Coast newspapers as the gentleman bandit. Maybe some of the news stories were exaggerated, but the record showed that he actually owned a yacht, three expensive cars, an apartment house. In spite of all this, he had decided to settle for a career of robbery and murder. At the age of 30, he was the most sought-after man on the Pacific coast. Finally, in 1931, after tracking him for a year and a half through more than a dozen armed robberies, Sergeants Thaxter and Taylor of the Los Angeles Police Department brought him in. He served 18 years at San Quentin in Folsom Penitentiaries, and then he won his parole at the age of 48. We checked his parole officer, and he had nothing to report against him. We checked back in at robbery detail and met with Captain Ed Walker. How about Cheney's friends, Weber and Garson? Nothing yet? Not a thing, Skipper. Stakeout is still on at Garson's mother's place in Santa Barbara. Weber's apartment's still covered. You called San Diego about this, the Cheney angle? Yeah, we briefed him. They got all the mug shots down there. Weber's definitely been tagged as one of the men on that finance company job. I figured Garson for the second man, but none of the witnesses have picked out his mugshot. You talked to Cheney's parole officer, huh? Yeah, I did. He gave us Cheney's last address. Same as the one on his ex-con registration, but he's moved. Didn't notify the officer. What does that leave you? Well, I talked to the manager at the apartment. He gave us a couple of addresses to run down. We better start getting on it, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's getting late. Keep in touch. I'll notify if anything breaks here. Right. In just a minute. Robbery, Walker. Who? Yeah, just a minute. You, Joe. Thank you. San Diego. Hey. Friday. McGuire, Joe. How you doing? Good. You got something? We had the holdup witnesses back in again this afternoon. Showed them more mug shots. Yeah? Picked out Weber's partner in the holdup. Yeah? Name's Frank Cheney. <laughs> are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Lee Silver, general assignment reporter on one of New York's greatest newspapers. You'll see his picture in leading magazines this week. 
And here is his actual signed statement. When you have to meet a news deadline, you work at a fast pace, smoke at a fast pace. That's why I smoke Fatima. They're extra mild. In my opinion, it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And more and more smokers are discovering this every day. Actual figures show Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor and aroma. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Tuesday, January 31st, 4 p.m. In addition to the San Diego teletype, we got out a local broadcast and an APB on Frank Cheney. By 4.30, Ben and I had checked out the first of two addresses where Cheney's former landlady told us that he might be staying was a rooming house out on West Washington. The owner told us that Cheney had stayed at his place for a few days, but that had been more than two months before. He had no idea where the suspect might be. We then drove to the second address. It was an apartment house on West Stanford near Slauson. manager's name was Mrs. Pritchard. Why, yes, I believe Mr. and Mrs. Cheney are home. They've been in all day. Which apartment is there in, ma'am? Number seven, straight down the hall on your right. Thank you. They uh, may be having dinner now. Are they expecting you? Be all right, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. How about the door? It's open. Come on. The apartment was deserted. We checked the bedroom and the kitchen. There were obvious signs of a fast getaway. On a card table in the living room, we found the remains of a quick dinner. Two places were set. One plate was almost clean, the other hardly touched. The coffee on the stove was still lukewarm. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout. Then we went back down the hall and talked to the manager again. Well, they moved in about a month ago, Sergeant. They looked like any other newly married couple. Did you notice if they had any visitors, Mrs. Pudgeon? Well, they might have, but I didn't notice. Did you notice anything odd about him at all? Mm, only that one thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Cheney always seemed to have plenty of money. Put down two months rent in advance. But he didn't seem to have a job. Yes, ma'am. Well, every morning he'd sleep late, but his wife was up at 8 o'clock to go to work. Where'd she work, you know? Well, a company called Thompson and some other name. Offices are down on South Hope. Uh, builders, I think. Homes and things. Mm -hmm. My phone. Would you excuse me? Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Hello? Oh, yes. What? Yes, two police officers. Miss Pritchard, no. Talk to you. Hello? Janie? Oh, yes, he hung up. An alert for Janie and his wife was broadcast, with special attention for the south end of the city. The wife's name and description was added to the APB. The next morning, Ben and I located her place of employment, Thompson and Kilkenny, a big construction company. The office manager told us that three days before, Mrs. Cheney had resigned her job by letter. She asked that her final paycheck be sent to her mother, who lived in Marysville, California. We contacted the Marysville Police Department immediately, and the home of Cheney's mother-in-law was placed under 24-hour surveillance. We now had more than a half a dozen stakeouts going. A week passed. Nothing. Cheney and his wife seemed to have dropped completely from sight. Wednesday, February 9th. We got a tip from the Santa Barbara police that Cheney's friend, Henry Garson, was in Los Angeles working in an auction house on Wilshire Boulevard. We ran it down. It looks like a high-class place. Well, they got a nice crowd, haven't they? Mm -hmm. you get a no, thanks. We'd like to see the manager, please. All right. Well, let me see. Oh, yes, over there by the claim desk. Uh, the man in the dark suit, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Willie? Yeah? Police officer, sir. We'd like to check on a man who's supposed to be one of your employees here. Oh, that's so? What's his name? Um, here's his picture. Can you identify? Why, yes. That's Johnson, the new clerk. You want to talk to him? Yes, sir. All right. Right this way. He's back in the storeroom. Some kind of trouble? We'd like to talk to him. Yes, all right. 
see. Oh, yes, there he is. Uh, Johnson. Oh, Johnson, would you come Come on, Ben. What are you running for? Johnson, come here. Out the back. Yeah. There he goes. He's heading up the street. Come on. Yeah. You got on that bus. All right, come on, let's double back to the car. Yeah. Hurry. Yeah. Did you see the bus? Yeah. Come on, move it. Yep. All right, hit the siren. All right, that did it. The driver's pulling over. Pull up behind the bus there, huh? Come on, let's go. You cover the back door, will you? Open your door. What's the matter? Police officers want to check your passengers. Open that rear door right yes, away. Yes, sir. All right, Garson, get off. I'm getting off. Coming at you, Joe. Getting off, copper. Make a hole. Drop it, Garson. He's got a gun. I said I'm getting off. All right, you, let's drop it. Come on. Good, Joe. You okay? Yeah. Let's get him off of here. Hey, what's it all about? He do something wrong? Yeah. He didn't get off when we asked him to. <laughs> Nine p.m. Wednesday, we drove Garson to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, where he was treated for minor cuts and bruises. Then we took him back to the office of the interrogation room. We called San Diego and notified them of the arrest. From ten o'clock that night until ten the next morning, Captain Walker, Ben, and I questioned Garson. He refused to admit that he even knew Frank Cheney or Kirk Weber. By noon, he was pretty tired. So were we. At 12.05, a call came through from San Diego. Uh, Friday, this is Russ Ormsby. Yeah, Russ. Fresh lead on Turk Weber. Uh, he's got a sister living in San Clemente. Yeah? And we've got our house staked out. Had a tip he's going to pay her a visit. When's that? This afternoon. 3.15 p.m. We got to the San Clemente turnoff, and a few minutes later, Ormsby and McGuire arrived from San Diego. We drove to the home of Weber's sister on South Orange Street and identified ourselves. She told us that Turk had been there that morning, but that he'd gone to the races at Del Mar for the afternoon. Did your brother say he was coming back? Said he might be back. He wasn't sure. Did he go to the racetrack alone? Yeah. Was he going to meet anyone there? I don't think so. He didn't mention it. You driving a car? No, he took the bus to the track. I see. Where would he most likely go if he doesn't come back here? I don't know. Maybe back to L.A., maybe San Diego. I don't know. Well, do you know if your brother Turk is going to meet Frank Cheney? How could he? Turk says Cheney's up north someplace with his wife. He told me that this morning. Where up north? He didn't know. Mm-hmm. You and McGuire want to stake out here, Ormsby? Ben and I will hit the track. Yeah, okay. Look, I can't have cops here if Turk comes back. They think I framed him. You'll get over it. You don't know Turk when he gets sore. He goes out of his head. He'll kill me. Why worry, miss? Huh? He'll have to kill us first. <laughs> p.m., Ben and I left Weber's sister's house and drove down to the racetrack at Del Mar. We got there just at the start of the seventh race. We had no idea whether the suspect was still there or not. We alerted the security police, gave them mug shots of Weber. Then we went to the public address booth in the clubhouse and talked to the man in charge. A few minutes later, the trap for Weber was set. Mr. Stanley T. Weber, please come to the public address booth. Emergency phone call. Mr. Stanley T. Weber, please come to the public address board. We waited. Ben stationed at a vantage point on one side of the booth, me on the other. Minutes passed. Weber didn't show. Ben caught my eye and shrugged his shoulders. Mr. Stanley T. Weber, please come to the public address board. Emergency telephone call. Mr. Stanley T. Weber, please come to the public address board. The announcer was barely finished when I saw Ben motioning. I looked and saw a large man heading up the cement ramp. When he got to the top, he turned to his right and headed straight for the public address booth. It was Turk Weber. Hold it right there, Weber. Uh, Police officers, get your hands up. What is this? You lousy cops, I'll have you busted for this. Save it, Weber, get your hands up. 
Who tipped you? What difference does it make? Stand still. You'll never get him. You'll never get him in 20 years. Never get who? You know who. Cheney. He's too smart for you. You'll never get him not in 20 All years. All right, we got you, Weber. Shake him, Ben. I'll shake you, copper. Watch it, Ben. Let go. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. All right, sir. That's it. You sure a big package. Yeah. What's that over there? Did that fall out of his pocket? Hmm. Looks like a tip sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Say? Blue Boy's Peerless Selection for Thursday. Price one dollar. Let me look at that a minute, can I? Yeah. Hmm? Best picks. You can't lose. This is your lucky day. What's it prove? He ought to get his dollar back. <laughs> just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 19th, trial was held in Superior Court, city and county of San Diego, state of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, Extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild, because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. After identifying Frank Cheney as the man who did the shooting in the San Diego holdup and murder, Stanley T. Weber was tried and convicted of participation in the robbery and received a sentence of life imprisonment. Henry Garson was cleared of any complicity in the holdup killing, but he was returned to prison for violation of parole and for several burglaries in San Diego and Los Angeles. Both men are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. Next week, Frank Cheney, the Gentleman Bandit, Part Two. <laughs> have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Next, Sarah's Private Caper with comedian Sarah Berner on NBC. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. Three persons are shot down in a $12,000 holdup. One of the bandits is apprehended, convicted, and sent to prison for life. The other one is still at large. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild to give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. 
That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 6th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Ed Walker. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from communications, and it was 11.35 a.m. when I got to room 27A, robbery division. Joe, how are you? Oh, hi, Dave. Message in the book for you. Came in a couple of minutes ago. Oh, thank you. Woman's voice. Wanted you to call as soon as you got in. Yeah, thank you, Dave. I'll get it now. Policewoman River there, please. Just a minute. River? Hold on, please. All right. Miss River? Dorothy? Joe Friday. Oh, yes, Joe. You get the message? Yeah. You worrying about your purse? I can't find it anywhere. Did I leave it in your car last night? Found it this morning. I can leave it at the desk here if you like. You can pick it up sometime today. Oh, that'll be swell, Joe. Thanks a lot. Sure, Dorothy. I had a wonderful time last night, Joe. I certainly enjoyed it. Yeah. Pretty good movie, huh? Hey, uh, Dorothy? Uh, Mother and I were talking this morning at breakfast. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like to come over to the house sometime for dinner? Ma, I'd like to meet you. Oh, well, sure, that'd be fine. I'd like to meet your mother. How about a week from this coming Monday? That's my day off. Is that okay? All right, a week from this Monday. The weather's good. Well, maybe we can have a barbecue out in the back. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Okay, see you later then. All right, Joe, bye. Bye. Joe? Hi. How'd it work out, Ben? It didn't. Another false alarm. Sure is a scorcher out today. Four months work and not one solid lead. Where are we going? I haven't got the answer. I've run down so many bum tips, I don't think I'd know the real thing if it hit me in the face. Romero, Joe? Yes, Skipper? Oh, McGuire and Mort Gear from San Diego just got here. You want to come in? Yeah, right away, Ed. All right. Oh, Ben. Sit down. Hope you two have more than we have. Saw on that report on the skipper's desk. Four months leg work. Cold. Nothing at all. Lots of phony tips, bum leads. We got three stakeouts going. His mug shots plastered all over town. No go, huh? I don't know. I think he's got the perfect face for a killer. You can hang his description on a million guys. Got nothing on him at all. Ben here just ran down the last lead we own. Yeah, false alarm. Nothing on the APB, huh? Got dust on it. Cold enough to bury. How long has it been since it happened? Back in January, wasn't it? Yeah, 27th. Stanley Finance Company, San Diego. It's all right there in the report, Ed. Yeah, I see. Hold up shooting, got 12,000. Suspects Frank Cheney, Turk Weber, Cheney did the shooting. That's what stops me. What's that? Took us a couple of weeks to grab Turk Weber and put him away. Here it's more than four months and Cheney's still on the loose. Doesn't add, he can't be that smart. Well, he's free. I can't think of a better testimonial. What about the other angles, Friday, besides those three stakeouts? We covered the town for Cheney. He had four months of it. Hotels, rooming houses, motor courts, bars, restaurants, the works. Must have a couple of thousand copies of his mugshot spread around. No response? Oh, get four or five calls a day on him. Been going on for weeks now. We check him out. Never the right man. What about his wife? She's still supposed to be with Cheney, isn't she? Mm, funny thing, we haven't had one report on her. Last time the two of them were supposed to have been seen together was five weeks ago. That was up in Stockton. Cheney's mother-in-law lives in Marysville, huh? They still have a stake out on her house? Yeah, no leads there either. How about it, Mort? Nothing to offer? About the same as up here. There is something we'd like to check on, though. Yeah. One of McGuire's informants was paroled two weeks ago. He served time with Cheney at Folsom. You have anything to say? Yeah. It's his idea Frank Cheney was the most hated man at Folsom. Most of the cons had given their right arm to cool him off. Mm-hmm. What made him so popular? Pretty much of a heel. Ran to the warden's office three times a week regular and formed on the other cons every chance he got. You figure some of them might want to even the score. Mm-hmm. If they know anything, I'm pretty sure they'll talk. Worth a try, isn't it? Their leads can't be any colder than what we got anyway. 
You gonna need any help, Mark? No, McGuire and I can handle the questioning. We'll go up to Folsom tomorrow. Okay. I don't think there's any argument. This thing needs a quick answer. Joe, you and Ben will have to push a lot harder and a lot faster. Cheney's robbed and killed before. Give him the chance he'll do it again. We've run down all the possible angles, Ed. We've checked every lead we could dig up. There's one you missed. Yeah. The right one. Find it. From the day Frank Cheney had been identified as the killer in the San Diego holdup murder four months before, all of us realized the danger of another killing as long as he was loose. After 18 years in prison, Cheney had a gun and he had his freedom again. We knew he wouldn't give him up easily. Thursday, June 8th, Lieutenant Mort Gear and Sergeant Tony McGuire returned from Folsom Prison. After talking with most of the convicts who knew Cheney well during his prison days, they had a list of more than 40 leads to run down. Ben and I took half of them. We started checking. It went kind of slow, and the results were thin. After running down the first dozen leads, we'd found out nothing about the suspect that we didn't already know. Monday, June 12th. We checked with a John Strezak, supposedly one of Cheney's close friends up at Folsom. He'd been paroled before Cheney, and he was now working at a large commercial engraving firm down in East Main. Yeah, I knew Cheney pretty well, Sergeant. Pretty well. Uh, just a minute, will you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that does it. Yeah, I know why you're here, Sergeant. I can't help you. You were pretty close to Cheney up at Folsom, weren't you, Strezak? Best friend? Everybody was his best friend. Everybody could do him some good. You haven't seen or heard from him since he got out, huh? Nope, I don't want to. I learned fast. How do you mean? He's a bum, Sergeant. Some people are born that way. Tried to talk me into a break once. I didn't buy. I knew he didn't write to the warden with it. Some people are born that way, bums. You think somebody might be hiding him out? Some of his pals. How about them? If he's got any pals, I don't know him. I can tell you this, they didn't come out of Folsom. Well, can you think of anything at all that might give us some kind of a lead on Cheney? I wish I could, believe me. Now, I better get back on the job. Shop foreman. He's no better than Cheney. Bum. All right, Strezak. Thanks a lot. I'd like to know if you hear anything. I'm going to leave you one of our cards here. Uh, yeah, okay, Sergeant. Hey, Strezak, what'd you go up for, anyhow? Just what I'm doing. Huh? Engraving. We kept at it. Checking out the leads one by one, the same slow, dull routine that we'd been on for four months. It ate up valuable time, but it was necessary. You never know what a lead's worth until you check it out. During the past months, from the least promising sources, we'd uncovered a half a dozen bits of information about the suspect, none of them conclusive, but they helped point the way. We found out Cheney's favorite sport was sailing. Yacht clubs up and down the coast were contacted and asked to watch for him. We learned where Cheney got his eyeglasses, contact lenses. We went to the optician, got the prescription for them, and had copies of it distributed to all optical firms in the area. They got a request for lenses which matched those in Cheney's eyeglasses or contact lenses they were to notify us. From a former college friend, we found out that the suspect was once treated for tuberculosis, and because of this, he drank only goat's milk. All the retailers in the area who sold goat's milk were contacted and alerted. We set up a system to check regularly all the mail received by relatives of both Cheney and his wife. Thursday, June 15th. Hi. San Diego called while you were out. Mort Gear. They come up with anything? Fair. One lead told him Cheney learned the printing trade while he was up at Folsom. Knew the business well enough to work at it. San Diego checking that out? They alerted the printer's union. We'll do the same up here. Mm -hmm. Picture and story on Cheney will be in the union newspaper next week. Yeah. Now, we dug up another bit on Cheney. We got it this morning. What's that? Well, instead of ordinary eyeglasses, Cheney's been known to wear contact lenses. You know, glass fits right over your eye. Uh-huh. Good chance he might be wearing them now. Kind of help change his appearance. We got the prescription for the lenses from Cheney's eye doctor. Got the information to all the optical firms in town. Good. Friday, man out here to see you. Oh, okay, thank you, Dave. All right, that's all. Better contact San Diego. Keep him posted. All right, Skipper. This gentleman here, Joe. This is Sergeant Friday. Yes, sir. How are you, Sergeant? You remember me, Vince Bertoli? Uh, you were in my place last month, the White House Grill. Place down on Alameda? Yeah, that's right. Block from Union Station. Both of you oh, came in. yeah. You had coffee and an omelet? You liked sure, the omelet? Sure, sure, yeah. What can we do for you, Bertoli? Well, remember you were talking to me? You said you were looking for somebody. You left some pictures in this card of yours here. Yeah, that's right. Well, I lost the pictures. I don't know where I lost them, but I kept your card. That's why I came to see you. Why? Well, as I say, I lost the pictures, but I still have an idea what they look like. Have you seen either one of those people, the man or the woman? Well, that's why I came to check with you. A week ago, one of my steady waitresses quit, and I hired this brunette with a hard luck story. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Trevor's stick of gum, licorice flavor? No, no. Nothing. Well, after a couple of days, I remembered that picture you gave me. And I thought she looked a little like it. That's why I kept an eye on her. Did you notice anything out of the ordinary? Mm, you bet. She never dates anybody. Not even me, and I'm the boss. <laughs> Not ugly, either. Yeah. She always claims she's got to get home. Never gives a reason. Says she lives alone. Well, where does she live? A couple of blocks from my place on North Jersey, I think. I checked the place where she does her shopping. They tell me she buys enough groceries for three people. Mm -hmm. She still insists that she's living by herself, though. Yeah, that's why I thought I'd better check with you. I lost the pictures, but I hung on to your card. Uh, will you take a look at this photograph, Batoli? Yeah. Sure, same one you gave me. Looks just like her, Mary Sloan. Who? Mary Sloan. That's her name, isn't it? You want to turn that picture over? Mrs. Frank Cheney. Thursday, 4 p.m. Ben and I drove down to the White House Grill and had a cup of coffee. We got a good look at the waitress whom the owner, Vince Bertoli, suspected of being Mrs. Cheney. We left and waited outside in the car until 5 o'clock when the suspect came out. We followed her to a grocery store and from there to a rundown apartment building on Greystone Alley just off Temple. We waited a few minutes and then we followed her in. The tab on one of the mailboxes read, Mary Sloan, apartment 16. We went up. Which one, Joe? Number 16. It's down this way. Come on. Mm -hmm. I guess we better try the door, huh? Who's there? Who is it? Police officers, open up. What do you want? Open the door. Anybody else in here? My brother. He's sick, sleeping in the next room. He can't be disturbed. Come on, Ben. You can't go in there. Honey, look out! Get out! Joe, the window. All right, get back inside here. Come on, you. Let me go! Let go of me! His arms, Ben. No. Grab it, will you? Yeah. Bridgewater. Yeah, you got clipped for nothing. Hmm? Not Cheney. We drove the man and the woman who identified herself as Mary Sloan back to the office where they are identified as fugitives from Miami, Florida. The man was wanted on charges of first-degree burglary. The woman was the accomplice. We turned the case over to Bunko Fugitive Detail. A little after 11 o'clock Friday morning, Ben got a tip that Cheney had been seen the night before at a small bar down near Fullerton. That's a Los Angeles suburb. He was supposed to be living in the area. We spent Friday, Saturday, and Sunday tracking it down. It went nowhere. On Monday, for the first time in three and a half weeks, we had some time off. Half a day. I picked up policewoman Dorothy River and drove her out to the house for lunch. We had a barbecue out in the backyard. Certainly a wonderful place you have here, Mrs. Friday. Beautiful garden. Oh, thank you. It's a lot of work keeping it up. Roses didn't do well at all this year. Aphis, you know. Much more spare ribs, Dorothy. The fire's just right now. Oh, no, thanks, Joe. I've had plenty. Care for another cup of coffee, Dorothy? All right, thank you. I'm glad you could come today, Dorothy. Joseph's been talking so much about you. Oh? You surprised me a little when I met you. How's that? How about some more ribs, Ma? Oh, no, thank you, Joseph. I don't think you look at all like a policewoman. Most of them are rough-looking, aren't they? Oh, no, I don't think so. They look like most women, nothing much out of the ordinary about them. Oh? Well, <laughs> times have certainly changed. We didn't have police women when I was a girl. Probably could have used them. Well, I don't know. I don't think we had so much crime then. Times were much different. You seem so young for such work, Dorothy. Please, woman. I'm 25, Mrs. Friday. Been with the department almost two years. Oh, yes, you're a young girl. Joseph's 31, you know. Yes, I know. Hey, Ma, how about letting me gather you the dishes up? Oh, no, no, that's all right, Joseph. You just sit there. Have your coffee. <laughs> I'm used to this. <laughs> Have to get used to housework when you're married. I'll bring out the It's a wonderful dinner, Joe. Your mother's very sweet. 
Yeah, real subtle, isn't she? Oh, motherly instinct. Somebody has to look after you. Oh. That's the phone, Dorothy. I better grab it. I'll be right back. Okay. I'll answer, Joseph. Never mind, Ma. Let me get it. Friday talking. This is Walker, Joe. Check back in right away. What do you got? Spring and West Temple, the Second National Bank. Yeah? Frank Cheney just held it up. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of registered nurse Shirley Gilman of Los Angeles, California. You'll see her picture in leading magazines this week. Now, her actual signed statement. When I go off duty, I appreciate a mild cigarette. Fatimas are extra mild. I can enjoy them more. I agree, it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And more and more smokers are discovering this every day. Actual figures show Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor and aroma. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Monday, June 19th, 3 p.m. I went back to the office, picked up Ben and Captain Walker, and the three of us drove to the scene of the robbery at the corner of Spring and West Temple, the Second National Bank. Ricketts and Thaxter from robbery detail were already there questioning the witnesses. We talked to the bank's vice president in charge at the time of the holdup, uh, Mr. Bronson. He had a welt on the right side of his head and was pretty badly shaken. He had his hand in one of his coat pockets and he walked straight over to me. It's the first thing he said. This is a holdup. You're positive of the identification, Mr. Bronson? I'm certain. This picture here, it's the man, all right. The others will tell you the same. Who's that, Mr. Bronson? The tellers. They all got a good look at him. No mistake. Well, what happened after Cheney approached you? He was very calm, very quiet. Uh -huh. He said, do exactly what I tell you. Call for help, and I'll kill you. He was calm all the way through it, just like it was an ordinary business with him. Did he have you get the money for him? No, he ordered me from the back of the front counter there, and we went from cage to cage. Each time, he had me say the same thing to the teller. This is a holdup. Give me all the currency you have. Don't call for help. Now, how many tellers did he have you collect from? Five. Mm -hmm. This line along here, windows one to five. Uh, my knees were shaking so hard I could barely walk. I kept wondering if one of the tellers might try to sound the alarm. Yes, sir. What happened after he got the money? He had me walk in front of him, down there to the side exit. Mm -hmm. That's when he hit me, I guess. Uh, side of my head, you can see here where they bandaged it. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. How much money did he get, do you know? Oh, no, not quite sure. More than 4000 I can't help but think how lucky I am. That man's a killer. I'm certain of it. Are you sure that we can't fix you up with a ride home? No, no. I'll be all right. Thank you. My wife's on the way down now. Uh, hey, can I see you fellas a minute? Yeah, thanks, sir. Uh, excuse us, will you, Bronson? Yes, yeah, certainly. How did up all the dope on the getaway car, Chaney, you? Yeah? At two this afternoon, he went to a used car lot up in Figueroa, about eight blocks from here, asked to be shown a late model Ford. Yeah, go ahead. The salesman took him for a demonstration ride. When he pulled up for an arterial, Chaney jabbed a gun at him and told him to get out. The salesman got out, Chaney drove off. And 15 minutes later, he walked in here and pulled the robbery. That's it. The bank tellers tabbed the same Ford as the getaway car. Broadcasted all points on the car, nothing yet. What time you got, Romero? Mm, ten minutes before. What time did the alert go out, Thaxter? 2.45. Everything covered? Yeah, Union Station, both airports, the bus depots, they're all alerted. Roadblocks set up on the highways. Since 2.45. Just about. Been changing somewhere in the city. Find him. Six p.m., the search went on. We called into the office and had them notify San Diego of the latest developments in the case. At 7 p.m., the weather started to cloud up. Still no sign of Cheney or the getaway car. At 8 o'clock, it started to rain. A few minutes past 10, a two-door Ford sedan was found abandoned on San Pedro Street near South Park. The license number matched that of Cheney's getaway car. The sedan was impounded and towed to a garage for fingerprinting. 
Ben called the office and an emergency detail from Metropolitan Division was sent out to help in a house-to-house canvas of the neighborhood where the car had been found. By 4.30 the next morning, we got nowhere, so we decided to give it up until later in the day. At 6.30 a.m., we had poached eggs and coffee at an all-night drive-in. 7 a.m., it was still raining. We checked back in at the office. I don't know. Seems like every time we have to work late, it's going to rain. You got any of those little white tablets in your locker? At the breakfast, gave me indigestion. Yeah, I think I got a few left. That reminds me, how'd the dinner come off yesterday? Two of them get along all right? Oh, yeah, all right. You know how it is. My, it, her usual few things to say. Oh? Uh-huh. Dorothy handled it pretty good. Good sense of humor. Yeah, nice looking girl. Sensible. I am. What do say, Earl? You doing any good? No, not much. Phone message in the book for you. You're supposed to call as soon as you get in. Hmm. Hempstead 4219. No name? No, you're supposed to call the number, that's all. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, how's the new house, Earl? Pretty good. Takes a lot of money. Got the forms in for the patio. I'm going to pour the cement this weekend. Mm-hmm. Got the place fenced off yet? Not yet, no. Most pickets cost money. Yeah. Fellas are telling me that you're doing all the work yourself, huh? Me and the brother-in-law, yeah. Cost a lot of money, a new house. Sounds good, Joe. Who was it? Frank Cheney's grandfather. Yeah? Says to come over right away. 7.30 a.m. It was still raining. Ben and I drove out to the older section of the Wilshire District to the Cheney Mansion. It represented one part of the suspect's life that we could never figure. As a child and later as a young man, Frank Cheney had had every advantage and comfort that a millionaire father could buy for him. Yet for some reason, he'd settled on a career of crime. 7.45 a.m., Ben and I were shown into the main hallway of the Cheney home by the butler. He recognized us from previous visits. He took our hats and coats and then led us up the staircase to the master bedroom at the far end of the second floor. We found Cheney's 82-year-old grandfather propped up in a four-poster bed. His face was gray and sunken. There was a nurse in a white starched uniform standing by. You can go, nurse. Go on. I'll be outside if you need me, Mr. Cheney. Yes, yes. You, um, have some information for us, Mr. Cheney? Of course. Hi, Carl. Sit down. Sit down. Thank you, sir. That hold-up yesterday, the bank robbery, I know all about it. Has Frank contacted you? That's like the police get right to the point. Has he contacted you, sir? Yes. Uh, hand me that glass of water, please. Oh, yeah. There. There you are. Uh, thank you. No, no, leave it on the table there. Oh, yes. When Frank got out of prison last year, he came to see me. I offered him one more chance. I told him if he decided to earn his way, he'd have all the help I could give him. He said he would. Yes, sir. I was a fool like everyone else. I believed him. Any idea where Frank is now? I gave him everything it was possible to give him. He wrecked the family, his father's life, my life. Everything he touched, he ruined. You know where he is now, sir? He telephoned me the day before yesterday. He was going away, Central America. Why didn't you notify us? He was going away. I thought it'd be better. We've had enough notoriety, newspaper stories. How was he going to get to South America, sir? Swedish ship. He's going to work his way. He called from San Pedro. He's staying in some hotel there. You don't know the name? Find him. Take him away. Bury him someplace. Okay, Joe. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Cheney. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Frank will have a gun. He'll try to use it. Yes, sir. Kill him. <laughs> 9 a.m., Ben and I went back to the office and put in a call to the Swedish vice consulate on South Spring Street. They told us that three days before, a man answering Cheney's description had signed on the Swedish motor ship Southern Cross as a member of the engine room crew. We picked up Sergeants Thaxter and Davis and drove down to San Pedro. The Southern Cross was still taking on cargo when we got there. We showed Cheney's mug shot to the first mate. You're the American. Cameron, that's him. He signed on this trip. Is he aboard the ship now? No, oh, he's right up there on deck. He was there. I guess he went below. What if you take us to him, please? All right. Lindgren? Yeah? Call over, Commander Leetenstone. 
All right, this way. The gangway, mind you. Better watch it, man. Yeah. Look forward. Through here. Mm -hmm. Maybe you better stay behind here, sir. We'll take him. What's that? Might be a little trouble here. Do you want to stay behind us? All right. You must stay in the engine room. Stay the head, then turn to your left. Down the companion bay. Right, thank you. Oh, come on, I'll watch your step here. Mm -hmm. Joe. I'm uh, it's on. Come on. Spotted it. All right, Cheney, hold it. He's making a break. Come on. He's going top side. Hustle. Come on up the ladder. Look out, Joe! Give it up, Cheney! He's going for the gangway. Down, Ben. Yeah. All right, stop him. Come on. Through the shoulder. Yeah. Bumped his head when he fell. Gotta get the cuffs on him. Yeah. Where'd everybody disappear to? I guess you didn't notice when we came aboard. Huh? Well, look topside. See? Red flag. Oh, yeah. Taking on fuel, huh? There's some of the cargo right over there. Oh. High explosives. <laughs> just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, city and county of San Diego, state of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to extra mild Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the king-size cigarette that is extra mild. Extra mild because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild, to give it a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> Frank Bertram Cheney was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He is now awaiting execution in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. This is NBC, Next. the national broadcasting company. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A woman is knifed to death in her home. The body bears the mark of inhuman attack. The killer escapes. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, 
You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, September 29th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Blaine Steed. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the interrogation room. It was 11.23 p.m. when they got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Lorraine. Hello, Joe. Would like to type this up for me? It's a dead body report. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Joe? How you doing? They bring Palmer in yet? He's in the interrogation room. Captain's with him. What's his story? He claims he had nothing to do with it. You contact any of the boys' relatives? Because he hasn't got any in town. It was just him and his mother. You called Juvenile Hall, didn't you? Yeah, they'll look after him for the time being. Pretty big shock for a kid. Yeah. Did you get anything out of him? Harry and I have been talking to him. Just starting to make sense. You want to lend a hand? Sure. We're going to the beach tomorrow, my mother and I. She had the day off and we were going to the beach. That's all I know. That's all she told me. Harry? Hi. You want to give it a try? Yeah. <laughs> all right, Robert. Come on, son. It's going to be all right now. We need your help, Robert. Think you could answer a few questions for us? How about a bite to eat, son? Can I get you something? No, I'm not hungry. I'm okay. That's the stuff. Well, here, take it. It's a clean handkerchief. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're the cop that drove me down here, aren't you? That's right. I'm not going back to the house. You won't have to, son. I'm never going back to that place. All right. Oh, it was off. Could you start from the beginning for us, Bob, and just take it easy? Tell us what you know. Okay. Think I could have a coat? I'll pick up a couple. Be right oh. back. All right, Harry. Thanks, Harry. Well, all I know is I left the house about half past seven. Mom gave me the money to go to a show. Was she alone in the house when you left? Yeah, that's right. We had dinner, and then I went to the show. You usually go to the show on school nights, son? No, but Mom asked me if I wanted to go. She gave me the money. Double feature. She told me to stay for both pictures. Mm-hmm. Did she usually tell you that? No, she always said to just stay for one picture. She didn't want me coming home so late. Was she expecting anybody to visit her, I mean, after you'd gone? She didn't say so. She just told me to stay for both pictures, that's all. What time did the movie let out? Oh, almost 11 o'clock pretty late, so I went straight home. Mom was in the bedroom. She was on the floor. There was this knife, this big knife. What'd you do then, son? I ran outside, hollered. Wallace's came over from next door. I went inside and looked, and then they called the cops. That knife you saw in the bedroom? There was blood on it, all over it. It was terrible. Did you ever see the knife before? Yeah. Yeah, Roy gave it to my mom last year. It's a bowler knife. Who is this Roy? Mom's boyfriend. One of them. He's in the Navy. Was he at your house tonight? I told you, it was just Mom and I. Roy had a fight with Mom about two weeks ago. He said he didn't like her having other boyfriends, and they had a fight. They argued, is that what you mean? Yeah. And once Roy slapped my mother. Mm-hmm. You want one of these, Joe? No, no, Thanks, thanks Harry. Okay. There's your coke, Remy. Oh, yeah. Son, did you know most of your mother's friends? Most of them, yeah. Can you think of any of them who might have wanted to hurt your mother? I don't know. Roy Palmer, maybe. He was mad at her. He's the only one I can think of. I I, I don't know. I don't want to think about it anymore. All right, son. We won't bother you anymore tonight. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Ben. Mm Mm-hmm. You want to follow through with Juvenile Hall, see if the boy's taken care of Okay, you're going to be in the interrogation room? Yeah, I got a few more questions for Roy Palmer. Right, check you later. Okay. Prime my back yet, Friday? No, not yet, Captain. Just talked with the Reynolds boy. Yeah? You can't believe anything that kid tells you. He's a liar. He hates me. You give him reason to hate you, Palmer? The kid's a liar, that's all. You were his mother's boyfriend. He says... Two weeks ago, you had a fight with her that you slapped her. All right, I slapped her. That don't make it murder. I wasn't near that house last night, and I didn't kill her. We found your knife in her bag. Huh? A bolo knife, bone handle. That's not mine. I gave it to her a year ago for a present. Didn't even know she still had it. 
Look, why do you have to pick on me? Because you had a motive and you haven't got an alibi. What about all those bums you used to run around with? Why don't you ask them for alibis? When we find them, we'll ask them. Do you know any of them, Palmer? The other men that she went out with? How'd I know? The only time she ran around was when I was on sea duty. And how'd you know she was running around? Friends of mine. I saw her out with these guys. I get it. Interrogation room, Friday. Lee Jones, Joe. Just got back from the Dixon house. Anything? Off to fast start. Leighton Prince checked the murder weapon, that knife. Dusted the handle. Yeah? Fingerprints, perfect set. <laughs> Captain Steed and I took the suspect, Roy Palmer, down the hall and had his fingerprints taken. At the same time, across the street in the crime lab, a set of fingerprints were lifted from the weapon which had taken the life of Mrs. Betty Dixon. The two sets of prints were checked and rechecked. They didn't match. Every object in the murder house was gone over for fingerprints and further evidence. Roy Palmer's fingerprints were on none of them. He was released pending further investigation. The only suspect in one of the most savage murders in the history of the city was free. The next morning, Captain Steed and I met with Chief of Detective Thad Brown. How about the dead woman's son? Did you talk to him again? Well, Romero's with him now. He's taking down a list of all the people that his mother knew, friends, neighbors, everybody. No luck yet with a set of fingerprints? No, we've got no record on them. Checking them through Washington, we ought to get a kickback pretty soon. A set of prints and a piece of envelope. That's the physical evidence, huh? Yeah. One of the top corners off an envelope. It had a postmark on it, um, Sonoma. Sonoma. Tie in with anything yet? No, not so far. Might turn up when we start checking the victim's friends. So you posted the body this corner, and I, as you saw this coroner's report. Yeah, mm-hmm. I did. I don't have to tell you, you're not after an ordinary killer. 23 knife wounds. Revenge motive, maybe. Yeah. The reaction of the dead woman's neighbors, that's what's got me stopped. No one heard a thing? Mitchell and Didion are still covering the neighborhood. I haven't found anyone yet who saw or heard anything unusual. Well, I can't buy it. A woman isn't just cut down like that without some kind of a commotion. Besides, the homes in that neighborhood are fairly close together. It shouldn't take much to make yourself heard from one house to the other. No sign of robbery or burglary? No, according to the boy, the house is intact. Nobody touched anything. Mm-hmm. It leaves you with the boyfriend angle. Lover's quarrel. We're stuck with it, yeah. Hi, Chief. Romero? Come in. How'd you make out? Better than I thought. The boy was over most of his shop this morning. Did he talk? Five pages of names and addresses. He gave me all of them. Well, how about that boyfriend angle? Oh, about half a dozen names. Seems the mother had quite a social life since the boy's father died. You confirmed the boy's story about going to the movies? Yeah, it checks out. Pretty nice kid, considering the environment he's been raised in. Well, how about those names, Ben? Any of them list Sonoma as their hometown? Mm, no, I don't think so. Let me check here. Okay. No. 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 Huh? No, none of them. All right, you better start digging into that list. Postmark may tie in later. Meantime, you still have that set of fingerprints. No chance for a mistake there. When you reach the right men, those prints will connect him with a killer. That makes it simple for you. Hmm? Prince will tell us who he is. You got only one answer to dig for. Yeah. Where he is. Thursday, September 30th, 11 a.m. We started checking the list of the murdered woman's friends through R&I for any possible criminal record. It's usually the case that a major crime rates headline space twice, when the crime is committed, when the criminal is apprehended. Between the two, more than often, there's a space of weeks and months, sometimes even years, in which the police officer goes through the monotonous, undramatic business of checking files, asking questions, sifting and sorting leads and evidence until he finally reaches the criminal. For a news story, it's pretty dull material, but it proves out the contention of most working detectives. You don't catch criminals with headlines. Monday, October 4th, we checked with a Miss Lucille Dana, a counter clerk at a little market out on Crenshaw. It's a terrible thing. I've been away on my vacation. Heard about it when I got home yesterday. You were pretty good friends with Betty Dixon. Is that right, Miss Dana? Yeah, pretty close. Excuse me a minute. I'll take care of this customer. Yeah, all right. Is everything, sir? Uh, No, two bags of them jelly beans, please. All right. Okay, that's all. Oh, that's 19. 87. 9. 87. This is not marked. Just a minute. Tommy? Yeah? Number two, corn beef. How much? Just a minute. 67. Thanks. Two seventeen. Out of five. Two 
17 to 20, 25, 50, three dollars, four, five. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just can't get over it, Sergeant. Poor Betty. We understand that you used to go out with the Dixon woman, Miss Dana. Do you know most of her close friends? Well, most of her men friends. We used to double date a lot together. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd take a look at this list of names that we have here. All right. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Now, does that about cover all her boyfriends, all that you knew of anyway? Yeah, I think so. Let's see, Tony Morris, Galbraith, Al O'Neill. You don't have Floyd down here. Who is that, Floyd who? I never did know what his last name was. He used to take both of us out, Betty and I. Seemed to like her quite a bit. When's the last time she was out with him, do you know? Oh, five or six months ago at least. Kind of strange. How do you mean? Floyd, jealous, you know. Hot temper. Said he was Spanish, but he had a light complexion. Oh, excuse me, please. Sure. Yes, sir? A uh, pack of that mint gum and some lighter flints, please. Yes, sir. Twenty-five. Thank you. All right. Could you describe this Floyd for us, Miss Dana? Well, he was kind of fresh and conceited in some ways. He was attractive. A lot of fun. How about his physical appearance, his weight and height? About six feet, I'd say. Nice build. 180 pounds, I guess. Mm-hmm. Dark hair, dark brown eyes, good dancing. How do you and Miss Dixon get along? Oh, I don't think he did. It. Floyd and Betty used to fight all the time, but she used to fight with Roy Palmer, too. I don't think Floyd did it. Is he in town now, do you know? No, I don't. As I say, last time I saw him was six months ago. Would you know if Mrs. Dixon saw him recently? She did. She didn't tell me. You have no idea, then, where we could get in touch with this Floyd? Well, no, I don't. He's from up north, originally. Is that so? Yeah, Sonoma. <laughs> Ben and I went back to the office and got off a teletype to the Sonoma Police Department along with a description of the suspect named Floyd. Then we checked with the 16-year-old son of the murdered woman. He remembered the man called Floyd, and essentially his description of the suspect checked out with that given us by his mother's friend, Lucille Dana. 3 p.m., we met with Lieutenant Harry Didion and Captain Steed. You want to fill him in, Didion? Finally got in touch with the dead woman's next-door neighbor. His name's Conroy. Get anything out of him? They seem to be the only ones who heard anything the night of the murder. What'd they have to say? see. Yeah, they saw Mrs. Dixon's son, Robert, leave the house about 7.30 the night of the murder. And nothing till 8.30. Yeah. They heard loud pounding in the back door of the Dixon home. The door finally opened. They heard an angry woman's voice invite the person in. A man? Yeah. Any description? Not much. She was tall. Good build. Not much, Jack. Go on. Neighbors said it was quiet then for about an hour. And they heard a woman crying. Said it sounded like Mrs. Dixon. They make out any of the conversation? I got it right here, yeah. About 9.30, they heard Mrs. Dixon a lot of loud talking. She said, why don't you kill me then, Floyd? Put me out of my misery. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, they said it was quiet between 9.30 and 10. And they heard something that sounded like the thud of a body falling on the floor, a piece of furniture overturned. No screams for help. Funny, but the neighbors say no. The only other thing they heard was Mrs. Dixon. Here's a quote. She said, do a good job, finish me off. None of the neighbors thought of calling the police. Well, they told me they didn't want to get mixed up in a family fight, none of their business. She had quite a few men visitors. That's all of it, huh? No, one more thing. I guess this is what made the neighbors think everything was all right. About 10, 15, they heard a man's voice, couldn't make out any words. Then they heard Mrs. Dixon say, please kiss me goodbye. Mm -hmm. A few minutes after that, they heard someone leave by the back door. They see him? Not very good. I think it was the same man they saw go in. Pretty tall, good build. That's it. Where does it leave us? Pretty weird. How by that? Oh, I don't know. She was supposed to be a sane woman. She'd have to be pretty drunk to ask a man to kill her. A man would have to be pretty drunk to take her up on it. Why the killer used that bolo knife on the victim? That piece of envelope we found by the body. Yeah, it was postmark Sonoma. There's a state mental hospital up there. Just a hunch. Maybe we're dealing with a maniac. 4 p.m. Monday. R and I could give us nothing because of the meager description. Ben and I checked out of the office and went over to the state building to the Department of State Institutions. First, we checked the name Floyd through the files, using it as a last name, then as a first name. We failed to connect. 
Either the names didn't fit the description of the suspect or they were elderly men still confined to the institution at Sonoma. We checked through the files using Floyd as a middle name. We came up with two recent parolees from Sonoma. Both matched the description almost perfectly. Both had the middle name of Floyd. We checked out the first one, Charles Floyd Johansson. We found out that he'd been returned to Sonoma almost a month before. The second parolee still had his freedom. We took a set of his fingerprints back to the office and had them checked out with a set of prints found on the murder weapon. How's it shape up, Joy? Richard Floyd Coleman. That the right name? Yeah. Can he make? He's your killer. You are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of skating star Helen Davidson of the 1951 Ice Capades. This is her actual signed statement. Recently, on tour with the Ice Capades, I've noticed more and more people smoking Fatima. You know why? If you like king-size cigarettes, you're bound to prefer the one that's extra mild. I know I do. And I agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. More and more smokers are discovering this every day. Actual figures show Extra Mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Extra Mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor. You will agree. It's wise to smoke Extra Mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke Extra Mild Fatima. The best of all long cigarettes. Monday, October 4th, 7 p.m. We got on an APB and a radiogram on Richard Floyd Coleman. We checked DMV for possible auto ownership. From his record, we found that he had been confined twice to the state mental hospital at Sonoma. The first time for a period of two years, the second time for 14 months. Hospital files showed us that on both occasions he had been committed by his older sister, Evelyn Coleman, his only living relative. Her address was listed as 5640 Upper Terrace, an apartment court in the East Wilshire District. We drove out to question her. In one of her apartment windows was a hand-lettered sign, Seamstress, Dresses Made to Order, Evelyn Marie Coleman. She turned out to be a tall, quiet girl in her 30s, gray eyes, brown hair. She worked on the sewing machine while we talked with her. I'm sorry to be so rude, Sergeant, but I have to have this blouse ready by two this afternoon. This towel is coming to call for it. That's perfectly all right, Miss Coleman. Exactly. What was it you wanted to know? It's about your brother, Richard. Oh. Anything wrong? No, we're just checking. That's all. We'd like to talk to him. Oh, what about? Routine check. We understand he spent some time up at Sonoma. Mm, yes, he did. Richard's had a hard time of it. Doctors don't seem to know the trouble. Poor Richard. He's so mixed up. You're his only living relative? Yes, I am. Folks died when we were both young. Practically raised Richard myself. Have you seen your brother lately, Miss Coleman? No, not lately. Why? Do you have any idea where we might contact him? Well, no, I don't. You see, he travels around the state a good deal. Oh, is he working? No. Oh, but he writes from time to time. Oh, what was it you wanted to see him about, Sergeant? It was just routine questioning. We like to talk to him. Oh. Where was he when you last heard from him, Miss Coleman? Well, couldn't you tell me what you want to see him about? We just like to question him, that's all. Well, what about? You can tell me. Is your brother in the city now? Oh, I don't know. I, I just got back. I, I haven't heard from him in two weeks. Almost three weeks. Does he usually stay here when he's in town? Well, sometimes, yes. Is Floyd in some kind of trouble? Is that the name he usually goes by, Floyd? Well, most of his friends call him Floyd. Why? You think he might be staying with one of his friends here in the city? He might be. I don't know. Uh, look, Sergeant... If Floyd's in trouble, you can tell me. I I've seen him through lots of trouble before. Not this kind, miss. Women? Oh. I wish there was something I could do. Where was he when you last heard from him? He was in Santa Barbara. He wrote me. Uh, please, Sergeant, why do you have to see Floyd? Excuse me. Yeah, sure. Hello? Oh, yes, Miss Tyler. Uh-huh. Well, maybe just a few minutes late. Would 2.30 be all right? Oh, fine. Thank you. All right, Miss Tyler. Bye. I'll have to hurry. This is Tyler's blouse. Sure, you go right ahead. I really don't make much of a dressmaker, but I'm saving up. I'm going to buy a place in the valley farther out. 
be fine for Floyd and me. Be awfully good for him. Floyd has to get away from the excitement. He's awfully nervous. Sorry, Miss Coleman. Yes, Sergeant. Are those your brother's suitcases in the alcove back there? Yes, they are. They've been there for a month. I keep his odds and ends for him. I'm sure he hasn't been here in the past month. Oh, yes, I'm sure. Please, Sergeant, why don't you tell me the truth? I've been through this before. There's trouble with Floyd. What is it this time? It's pretty bad. Well, what is it? We want to ask him about a murder. Oh, no, he wouldn't do that. You... You sure it was Floyd? We'd like to talk to him. Floyd. Floyd. It didn't have to happen. I was going to buy a place in the valley. Floyd would have liked it there. I was going to take care of him out in the valley. Do you have any idea where we could find him, Miss Coleman? No, I don't. I don't know where he is. Santa Barbara, that's the last I heard. I've been worried about him. If he was in the city, would he come here to stay, ma'am? Well, he did before, yes, but I don't know about now. Does he have a car? No, not that I know of. No, I I, I don't know what he's living on. He doesn't have any money. Who was the woman? Uh, Mrs. Dixon. Seems to know your brother pretty well. Oh, boy. You better grab that, Ben. Yeah, all right. Hello. Yes. Yes, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Mrs. Tyler, she'll pick up her blouse tomorrow. Ben and I left Evelyn Coleman's place and went back to the office. A stakeout was placed on her apartment. Two days went by. Nothing happened. Despite the fact that the suspect's sister had promised to cooperate fully with us in locating her brother... A team of men was assigned to follow her wherever she went as insurance against any possible slip-up. As far as we were concerned, no precaution was out of reason. A maniac was on the loose in the city, the same maniac who had murdered the Dixon woman. He'd done it once, and if the urge was there, he'd do it again. We sweated out the next three days. On the afternoon of the sixth day, we got an urgent call from one of the parole officers in the state institutions department, a Miss Gertrude Vaughn. Ben and I went over and checked with her. Call came in about 20 minutes ago, Sergeant. Man's voice. What do you have to say? He wanted to talk to me about the Betty Dixon case. Seemed nervous. You're saying you know anything about it? I didn't want to frighten him off asking too many questions. But I got the idea he had something he wanted to get off his mind. Well, did he mention anything specific? I mean, names, places, anything like that? No, but I got the impression he knew quite a bit about the case. Mm, what else? He promised he'd be here by 4 o'clock. Said he'd be ready to talk. Mm-hmm. Well, it's 2.45 now. All right, Ben. Okay. Pull up a chair. We waited. 3.15, 3.30, 3.45. No sign of the anonymous caller. 4 p.m., still no sign. We waited. At 4.30, the office door opened and a tall, thin girl with brown hair came in and walked straight toward the desk of parole officer Gertrude Vaughn. We saw Miss Vaughn motion the girl across the room toward us. It was Evelyn Coleman. Sergeant. Miss Coleman? How are you? I know where Floyd is. I'll take you to him. 4.35 p.m. Ben and I left the state building with Evelyn Coleman, got in our car, and drove north across the city, according to her directions, until we got on Highway 66. We continued driving north out of the city. Evelyn Coleman sat quiet in the back seat, looking at her hands folded in her lap. Except for directions, she said nothing. Approximately three miles out of the city, she directed us off onto a county highway. We drove east for a few miles, and then we turned north onto an unpaved road lined with eucalyptus trees. We'd gone a little less than a mile when she directed us to pull up. We can walk the rest of the way. Okay. It's not far. All right. All right. This way. Your brother been out here all this time? He didn't tell me. He called this morning. Supposed to get himself up. What happened? I don't know. He's worse now, I think. I could hardly understand him on the phone. It doesn't make sense. Is he alone now? He was when I left him. We go across this field here. Okay. Yeah. Is your brother armed? No. That it over there? Yeah. Shacked by the trees. You'll see he's treated right. Yes, ma'am. We'll see to it.
Evelyn? Heavy? I brought them in, Floyd. They'll take you back. I'm Richard Floyd Coleman. I want to tell you I killed Betty Dixon. All right, Ben. Yeah. I wanted to marry her. She didn't want it. She dared me to kill her. I grabbed the knife. We can talk about it later, huh? She was lying on the floor. She said, kiss me goodbye. I held on to her. She seemed to go to sleep. We have to go, Floyd. You tell him, Evie, I loved her. You tell him that. Yeah, I will. She dared me to kill her. She said I didn't have the nerve. She asked me to. Yeah, all right, come on. Try to tell him that at the hospital. Yeah. I'm not crazy. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 4th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. To prove a suspect's guilt or innocence is in tonight's case, the working detective spends many a long hour with the man in question. In the interrogation room, the crime lab, with his friends, his enemies, gets to know his man well. And so with a cigarette. If you're a long cigarette smoker like I am, get to know Fatima. Live with it a while. Pack after pack, they're extra mild. Get to know the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. <laughs> Richard Floyd Coleman was examined by six psychiatrists appointed by the court and was found to be criminally insane. He was committed to the state mental hospital at Mendocino for an indefinite period of time. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Sarah Burner is delightful in Sarah's Private Caper, next on NBC. to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to narcotics detail. A large hospital in your city is held up. $10,000 in high-grade narcotics is stolen. The bandits escape. Your job, get them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, October 23rd. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of narcotics detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. It was 7.16 a.m. when we got to St. Christopher's Hospital, the pharmacy. How you do? Yes? Police officer, sister. We'd like to see Sister Mary Benedict. 
I'm she. Mother Superior sent us down to see you, sister. We're investigating the narcotics robbery. Oh, yes, there have been quite a few policemen here in the past hour. I believe it was the fingerprint men who just left. Just a minute, I have their card. Yes, they were from Leighton Fingerprint Division. Stahl and the boy from Leighton Prince. Yes, that's right. Sergeant Harlan Stahl. Well, sister, we're the investigating officers assigned to the case. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. Are you a lieutenant? No, I'm a sergeant. I wonder if you could start right from the beginning for us. Just tell us what you know about the robbery. Well, after mass, I went to breakfast, and then I came downstairs here to the pharmacy to open up. You keep the pharmacy locked overnight? Oh, yes, always. We always assign an intern on night duty. He has the key in case any medicines are needed during the night. He's authorized to issue what may be needed upon the doctor's request. Well, who else has a key to the pharmacy, sister? Well, there are just three keys. Mother Superior keeps one at her desk, and we have one for the intern on duty, and I have one. All right. You want to go on? When I got down here this morning, I started to unlock the door and found it ajar. There were no lights on. I snapped on the wall switch. That one. Mm-hmm. That's when I saw young Jimmy Lyons. That's the intern? Yes, he was unconscious on the floor. I could see his head had been cut. He was bleeding profusely. What'd you do then? I called Mother Superior, and she came right down. Dr. Spencer was summoned. He came in and started administering aid to intern Lyons there on the floor. Is that when you found out the narcotics were missing? No, not just at that moment. Both Mother Superior and myself were quite worried about young Lyons' condition. It was really Mother Superior who first noticed the narcotics safe had been tampered with. Your stories don't exactly jibe there, sister. How do you mean? Mother Superior gives you credit for first noticing the theft. Oh, my, no. She's very charitable, but she's the first one who pointed to the safe. She's very observant. I understand. Go ahead, please. Upon checking the safe, we found that someone had taken our entire store of narcotics. Everything. Is that the safe over there? Yes, that's the narcotic safe. Don't touch that, Mr. Friday. No? No, never. Nothing is to be touched until the police have completed their investigation. Clues. Well, we're the police, sister. Then do you have all the clues you need? Well, I wouldn't know, but the men from Leighton Fingerprints have dusted everything here, so it's all right to touch things now. That was Mr. Harlan Stahl and his men? Yes, that's right. Oh, I didn't know. We understand you have the inventory list. Yes, I have it on my desk. Here. Thank you. We keep a running inventory, so that's the exact amount that's missing. Yes, ma'am. Cocaine and morphine. No bird's eye, Joe. Big haul, huh? Looks like about 10,000 worth. I'd like to have a copy of this inventory, sister. Would you take the carbon? I like to keep the originals for my monthly files. I'll be fine. Outside of this intern, Lyons, nobody saw whoever it was. No. Mother Superior and I have interrogated everyone. We made a thorough investigation on our own. I took notes. That's so? Yes, that's the way Father Brown does it. Father Brown? Oh, yes, he's an expert detective. Brown. You wouldn't mean Thad Brown? No, Father Brown. Father Brown. You people have your own detectives now? Oh, my, no. He's not a regular detective. He's more like Mother Superior and myself. Is that right? Yes, he's in England. Solves some really difficult cases. Here, I'll show you. See, right here? The Triple Cross, another exciting Father Brown mystery by G.K. Chesterton. Oh. Yes, I have all but one of the Father Brown books. Well, the superior has it. I, I get it after she finishes. Mm-hmm. What's the condition of the intern? He's resting comfortably. Dr. Spencer says he'll be all right. Had to take nine stitches in his scalp. We'd like to talk to him. I'm sure that'll be all right. I don't have to tell you we all think this is a terrible thing. Yes, sister, it is. All those narcotics. Whoever took them will distribute them, won't they? Well, that's our guess, sister. The stuff will be sold to addicts. What makes a dope addict? How do they get started? Why do they do it? I don't know, sister. I give you a lot of reasons. None of them good. None of them good. And for a few moments of what? Tonight they have it and tomorrow they have nothing. That's about the size of it, sister. The stars are setting and the caravan starts for the dawn of nothing. The Bible? No. Omar Khayyam. Before we 
we left St. Christopher's Hospital, we talked with intern James Lyons. Since he was slugged from behind, he failed to see his assailant. He could tell us nothing. The entire hospital staff was screened thoroughly. They could add nothing to what we already knew. Between 6 and 7 o'clock that morning, $10,000 worth of high-grade prescription narcotics had been stolen. Somewhere in the city of Los Angeles was the answer. As in all narcotics cases, speed is the prime factor. Whoever held those narcotics wouldn't waste any time diluting or cutting it and making it ready for quick sale. Our job was to stop them. Five minutes past 8 a.m., we checked in with Sergeant Harlan Stahl at Latent Fingerprints Detail. Not much help, is it? That's all you got, huh? Yeah, the safe was clean, not a print on it. No prints anywhere in the room. Slugged the intern from behind, took his keys, uh, tore a belt loop off his trousers, opened the safe and waltzed out. Couldn't have been cleaner. Yeah. You didn't get anything on your end, huh? Nothing. Mm. Gentlemen? Captain? I picked one up. Who is he? Junker by the name of Babe Kellogg. He's really seeing seeing Steve, but he's coming out of it. Let's go talk to him. Check you later, Stone. Yeah. What's the story on Wallace and Hunt picked him up. Downtown L.A. He was sitting in a parked car at 4th and Broadway. Thought at first he was a 390, but they couldn't raise him. He's down this way. What else? Well, Wallace figured he must be geed up, so they rolled up his sleeve to look for the spike marks. They found him. Find anything on him? Yeah, there were two vials of M on the seat behind him, beside him. Prescription stuff. You got that list of serial numbers from the hospital? Yeah, right here. All right, let's go in. Wallace? Yeah, Captain. Friday's got a list of the serial numbers on that hospital heist. Hop down and check him against the vials you found in his car. Yeah, here you are, Walter. Thanks, Joe. How you feeling, babe? All right. Kellogg, this is Friday and Romero, Central Division. I see him. You want to tell us about it? Nothing to tell. Living high, aren't you? I'm unusual. It's not the way I get it. You're scoring good. Prescription stuff. Birthday present from a friend. Who is it? I want to keep his friendship. Who's your connection, babe? I don't know. You know that morphine we picked out of your car is hot. Is it all of it? Hospital pharmacy was knocked over this morning. If the numbers on those vials of yours match up, you're in a real jam. No numbers on them. You might as well tell us where you got it. I'm not going to be a Fagin for you. Nobody's asking to be a Fagin, Kellogg. That's high-powered stuff. If we don't get anybody else, it can go hard for you. I'm not going to bite the hand that feeds me. You want to stand it alone on this one, not the idea? I didn't say that. Well, one of us isn't going to go along and hold your hand. How about it? Who's your connection? All right, it isn't going to be a long wait, Kellogg. As soon as Walters gets back with those serial numbers, you can play hero all afternoon. That'll be on the 12th floor of the county jail, babe. You won't have to wait long there, either. The minute you put one foot in that courtroom, the judge will throw you, throw everything he's got at you. Two bottles of drugstore stuff? Robbery, Kellogg. $10,000. Well, this is good, but two bottles ain't worth that much. Well, you only show a part of it. Maybe you got the rest of it at your plant. You got my plant. 1931 Essex. Four-wheel brakes. Your car's being checked out. You didn't find any more, did you? No. I couldn't be that lucky. You feel pretty good now, but you'll get a yen on you won't help me, you never do. When's the last time you helped us? Your memory's worse than mine. I helped you. I helped you guys a lot. Don't you remember the Frank Smith plant? No. 1933, Friday night last. I led you right to Smitty's plant. Smitty didn't have no geezer like he found on me. He was a big man. We turned up four kites on him. Not for us, you didn't. Sure I did. Right here in Kansas City. I'd done you a big favor that night. Friday night last. A different town and a different night, babe. You're kidding. In the St. Louis? Seeing Steve. Yeah. Don't kid me along. This is Kansas City. Uh, how is the St. Louis? You're in Los Angeles, babe. Los Angeles, California. You're kidding. Clenard wouldn't do that to me. Who's Clenard? 11th in Baltimore. Hangs out down at the Continental Hotel. That's in Kansas City? Yeah. Marty Clenard. Tough cop. He said to make a hat for me. He didn't want me in KC. He gave me a floater out of town. That's why I came here to St. Louis. You're in Los Angeles, babe. You got it? Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. You told me. Want to step outside a minute? Yeah. Stay with him, Romero. All right. That's it. Checks out, huh? Somebody cut through the serial number stamps on the vials, but you can still make them out. The two vials of morphine we found in Kellogg's car were from the hospital pharmacy. Thanks, Wallace. Let's try it again, Friday. Right. All right, babe. 
Wade. Now let's cut out the jokes. Those two vials you had came from the hospital, the numbers check out. No numbers on those vials. How do you know? You probably didn't even look at them. Oh, yeah, I looked. No numbers on them. We found them, all right. I don't see how you could read them. I couldn't. Why not? Somebody scratched them off. Who, babe? You wouldn't know. Try us. How much heat do I have to stand if I take it along? Plenty. There was an intern slugged on that job. Hurt pretty bad. They're going to tag you for assault, too. I never hurt anybody in my life. How do we know? I just told you. We don't know you didn't pull this job. We haven't got any proof. Uh, once more, what's the count? Goes like this, babe. First degree robbery, five years to life. Assault with a deadly weapon, one to ten. Violation of the State Narcotics Act, one to fifteen. You can add. They'll lose you up there. You can get a real yen on by that time. There's no buzzing up at Q. I can't go that route. Where'd you get the stuff? I'd rather be a Fagin than spend 50 years at the joint. You convinced us. Where'd you get it? Anybody turned Fagin before they spent 50 years at Q. No, I can't go that route. Where'd you get it, babe? From some joy popper. Who? I gave him 700 bucks. Clean me. Who? Come to me, passing himself off as a croaker. I can spot a guy's been hitting speedballs a mile away. I knew he wasn't any croaker. What was his name? He was scoring good somewhere. Oh, that's Cecil and Mary. Now I know where he got it. Give us his name, babe. He's a bit clear in pictures, Leonard Castle. Where is he? You're in my Arizona, on location. How could he be on location when you bought that stuff from him this morning? Half the plane this morning, he was on his way. Leonard Castle, picture actor, that right? You got it. Run it down. 10 a.m., we checked the name Leonard Castle through R&I. We found nothing. We looked in the phone book and got the number. Garfield, 3711, Central Casting. Central Casting. Los Angeles Police Department calling. Yes, sir. Do you have a Leonard Castle registered with you? One moment. Yes, we do. wonder if you could tell me if he's working. Oh, just a minute. I have his card right here. Yes, he's working. He's doing crime report for Schumann and Kester, independent production. They're shooting over at Sound Stages Incorporated. You working today? Yes, he is. You're sure that company's not on location? No, we have no location showing for that picture. Well, could you give me his call, please? Surely. He had a uh, 9 o'clock call today, stage 3. Did you wish to see Mr. Castle? Yeah. You shouldn't have any trouble locating him over there. We'll find him. <laughs> listening to Dragnet, actual case histories taken from official police files. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to these case histories taken from the file marked Fatima. On this card, reporter Lee Silver's statement. I need an extra mild cigarette. No other long cigarette I've tried is as mild as Fatima. Here is nurse Shirley Gilman's statement. When I go off duty, I appreciate a mild cigarette. Fatimas are extra mild. I can enjoy them more. On this card, the statement by drama critic Richard Watts, Jr. Anyone can tell Fatima contains the finest tobaccos. It's extra mild and has a much better flavor. All agree, it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And that's what more and more smokers are discovering every day. Yes, actual figures show Extra Mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Extra Mild Fatima yourself. You'll agree. It's wise to smoke Extra Mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke Extra Mild Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. a.m. Central Casting gave us Leonard Castle's home address, and Detectives Long and Hunt went on immediate stakeout. Ben and I drove out to Sound Stages Incorporated and checked in at the reception desk. We showed them our identification. We were issued a pass to Sound Stage 3. This is Stage 1. Stage 3 ought to be down there. Yeah. Not a very big lot. No, it's pretty small. Watch the truck, Ben. Think Kellogg knew what he's talking about? We'll know in a couple of minutes. Not very usual. Joy Popper pulling a job like that. They all start somewhere. Huh. That's a good way to get around a movie lot. Bicycle. Better than walking. Sure a thick fog, isn't it? Yeah, we don't have them often, but when we get them, they're a real pea super. 
Oh, here we are. Mm, you better hold it, Ben. Red light. They're shooting in there. Oh, yeah, I didn't see it. Well, stage five, you know? Couldn't tell you. No, oh, thanks. All clear. Let's go in. Hey, uh, fella. Yeah. I wonder if you can tell us where we could find Leonard Castle. Sure. Rosie, call Len Castle, will you? This fellow's on the scene. Okay. Leonard Castle. Leonard Castle. Guess we can wait over here by the phone, huh? He'll be right here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Rosie, you call me? These gentlemen want to see you. Thanks, Rosie. You want to see me? Your name, Leonard Castle? Yeah, that's right. Police officers. Yeah? Is there some place where we can talk? We're... Is this all right? I got to stick close. I might be in the next shot. All right. You know a fellow by the name of Babe Kellogg? No. He says he knows you. No, I never heard of him. You sure? Put us on a bell, George. Hold the work. Quiet down. Quiet. Have to hold it a minute. They're lining up a shot. Lefty, move that fruit about a foot and a half to your right. That's it. Hold it right there. Make it a little hotter. Couple of turns. Whoa, whoa, that's got it. Baxter, give me an inky dink right here, camera left. Harry, Hello. when Fred Conrad crosses over the table, can you help me out a little? Can you bring this one down about two points on the dimmer? It's done. Don, you get that? Uh, already, Miller. Mr. Conrad? Yes, sir. Take it real easy. Remember, you don't know your sergeant's got a clue until he comes to you with it. All right. You're anticipating a little bit, okay? Mm-hmm. Let's try it. Bob, watch that mic shadow. We're getting it on that wall. Am I out now? No, too much. You come in a little. That's fine. You're clear. All ready? All ready. We can try one. Turn them over. Rolling. Speed. Action. All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right down. Look what I found this time. Piece of that broken window, huh? That's right. It's plastered with fingerprints. Yeah? We got our man. Cut. Save him. Let's hold it quiet, folks. You never heard of Babe Kellogg, huh? That's right. Where were you at six at left this morning, Cass? In bed. We got men out your place checking. What's it all about? Between six and seven o'clock this morning, somebody robbed the pharmacy at St. Christopher's Hospital. They slugged the intern, made off with over $10,000 worth of narcotics. Yeah? If we find you were in bed between six and seven, you're clear. Oh, I was. Anybody to back up that alibi? The line lady, I guess you'd know. What time she'd generally get up? Oh, I don't know. Why? She couldn't very well back you up. She was still asleep. Well, she's usually up early. thought you said you didn't know what time she got up. Well, I mean, I don't usually know. But you knew this morning? No. And you don't know Babe Kellogg? Simmer down, everybody. Let's have it quiet. Light them off. What do you read on that junior, Harry? Nine plus. It'll make it a little hotter. A little hotter, Jack. That's it. Whoa. Ten plus, Steve. That's it. How about it, Steve? Anything. Turn them over. Rolling. Spade. Action. All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. Look what I found, Jack. Piece of broken window, huh? That's right. It's plastic with prints. Yeah? We got our man. Cut. Jake, you said plastered with oh. prints. Oh. The line reads plastered with fingerprints. You gotta say the whole word. They'll never know what you mean in Vancouver. Come here, I'll talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Hold the work. Keep it quiet. That's Miller. He's a tough director, but he's a good one. How long have you been doing this kind of work, Castle? Oh, six, seven years. What pictures you been in? Oh, I don't think you'd have noticed. They're mostly small parts. What kind of parts you got in this picture? I play a cop. What would you like to do? In this picture? No, I mean, what's your ambition? You gonna stay in pictures? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to get a few bigger parts if I could. It's pretty tough to try and sell yourself to producer if he can't see you on film. Money's pretty good, though, isn't it? Oh, it all depends. It's a different deal on each picture you do. Mm -hmm. You have an agent? No. no. I did have. Wasn't doing anything for me, so I let him go. I'm not represented now. Pretty hard to build any kind of a name without an agent, isn't it? It all depends. If you can keep up a good front, nice car, that's all that counts in this town. You really believe that, do you? I don't you? Well, I don't know much about it. I'm not an actor. You said you didn't know Babe Kellogg at all, didn't you? No, I don't know. You said you saw your landlady at 6 o'clock this morning. No, I didn't say that. Well, there's Theodore Milton, the director. Would you like to meet him? What time did you see your landlady this morning? Oh, Mr. Milton. Yeah, Castle. When are you going to get to me, Millie? You need me in the shop? No, still on the same thing. We'll get to you till after lunch. Yeah. You can stay with your friend. Okay. What time does it break for lunch, Castle? Oh, 
This company usually breaks around 12.30. Hmm, it's only 11.15. Maybe we can go outside and talk. The director said he didn't need you. Why, you never want to believe the director. It's always the first assistant. We could check with him, couldn't we? Oh, I don't like to do that. I hate to ask any favors. Said he wasn't going to use you till after lunch. Well, it isn't a good policy to bother the first assistant. Well, it's probably better in here anyway. I didn't see any place to sit down outside. Unless you have a car in the lot. Do you have a car? No, I don't. But you told us you had a car. No, I, I didn't tell you that, did I? Well, you said something about keeping up a good front, nice car. Isn't that what you said? Oh. Oh, sure, I have a car. I, I don't know what I was thinking about. Yeah, I have a car. Mm-hmm. I thought you said you had a car. Well, I tell you, this picture act will drive you crazy. I don't know what I'm saying after that. Uh... Maybe you made a mistake about Babe Kellogg. Do you know him? No, I'm sure about that. I don't know any Babe Carson. Kellogg. You're Kellogg, you know. I, I, I don't know him. Would you mind showing us your wallet? Well, what for? You want to see my identification? Can we see the wallet, please? All right. Yeah. No, you hold it. Would you open it up? Okay. Quiet, please. All right, Chief. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Roy? Big. All right. Nice and easy now. Fingerprints, Jake. Right. Action. All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. Look what I found. Huh? Piece of broken window, huh? That's right. It's plastic with fingerprints. Yeah? We got our man. Cut. Same. No talking. Let's see how much money you got in your wallet, Castle. No, you hold it. Just count it for us. Oh, there it is. What about the rest of it in there? Hmm? All right, I didn't see it. All right, count it. Just a few hundred here. Count it. All right. Let's see. Well, I can see four fifties right there on top. That's two hundred, isn't it? Yeah. It's three hundred. Four fifty. Yeah, go on. I didn't know I had this much. That's two hundred and fifty more. That makes seven hundred, doesn't it? It's more than I thought I had. There's two more tens and a five there. That's seven hundred and twenty-five dollars, Castle. Yeah. Doing pretty well on this picture, aren't you? It's not all picture money. All right, you can put your wallet away. Thanks. If you didn't make this money on the picture, where'd you get it? Play little cards last night. Play pretty late. Yeah, pretty late. Aren't you tired this morning? No. Not even when you got up at six. Did I say I got up at six? Now, listen, Castle. You don't know what you said, but one thing's sure you're lying to us. You know Babe Kellogg, and you owe him well enough to sell him two vials of high-grade morphine. Oh, you're wrong about that. All right, then you set us straight. Kellogg says he paid you $700 for this stuff. You got over $700 in your wallet. That's more than you need for lunch money. Now, this could be a coincidence. You set us straight. Well, you're wrong. Where'd you get the money? Turn up. Rowan? Steve. Action. All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. Piece of broken window, huh? That's right. That's plastic with fingerprints. Yeah. We got our man. Cut. All right, more for Where'd you get the money, Castle? I told you I played cards. It won't do. Got the keys to your car? I can't leave. We'll get you excused. We want to look at your car. No, no, don't do that. All right, then. Do you know Babe Kellogg? I, I don't know. Turn him. Rolling? Babe. Action. All right, Chief. As soon as I get all the clues, I'll be right in. Piece of broken window, huh? That's right. That's plastic with fingerprints. Yeah? We got our man. Cut. Print it. All it for Lily. Do you know Babe Kellogg? Yes. Yes, I know him. I know him. You robbed that hospital this morning. I needed it. I needed the money. I had to have it. I, I owed money. They were going to take my car. I, I was broke. What else could I do? I was sick once. I stayed at St. Christopher's. I knew where they kept the drugs. I knew if I could get them, I could make some fast money. I didn't mean to hit the kid. I, I couldn't let him see me. He didn't have to be there, did he? He didn't have to be there. I, I sold old Babe the stuff and the rest is in the car under the seat. I, I needed the money. I, I, I was broke. I was broke. Better get him out of here, Ben. Mm -hmm. Come on, Castle. That was a great reading. My name's Milton. I'm directing this picture. You the boy's agent? No, sir. Never heard him read better. Funny thing, though. No? Yeah? In front of the camera, he goes to the dogs. The story you've just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent.
On January 28th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 91, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. The working detective in reaching the solution of a crime depends on the combined efforts of many minds and many hands. The crime lab, state and federal peace officers, and you, the citizen. And so with Fatima. The combined efforts of many go into their blending and manufacture. Skilled hands, working with the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, make Fatima extra mild. Best of all long cigarettes. If you're a long cigarette smoker like I am, try Fatima. Every pack is extra mild. Smoke Fatima. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Thursday, August 24th, that's two weeks from tonight, Dragnet will be heard one hour earlier at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Leonard Francis Castle was tried and convicted of first-degree robbery and violating the State Narcotics Act. He received sentences as prescribed by law. Alfred Babe Kellogg was convicted of violating the State Narcotics Act. Both men are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Sarah Berner is delightful in Sarah's Private Caper, next on NBC. NBC. 